Section 1 of Seven Roman Statesmen of the Later Republic. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Seven Roman Statesmen of the Later Republic by Charles Oman. Chapter 1 The Later Days of the Roman Republic there was a time not so very long ago when the taunt was true that history was written as if it were a mere string of anecdotal biographies of great men but for the last forty years the pendulum has been swinging so much in the other direction that it has become necessary to enforce the lesson that the biographies of great men are after all a most important part of history it is well to have conceptions of the streams of tendency and the typical developments of every age but the blessed word evolution will not account for everything and it is absurd to neglect the influence of the great personalities roman history in particular has been so much treated of in late years as a mere example of constitutional growth and degeneration or as a bundle of interesting administrative and legal details that it seems not out of place to recall that other aspect of it which was more familiar to elder generations and to look at it for a moment from the personal and biographical point of view with plutarch before us as well as mommsen and marquardt's staatsrecht and staatsverwaltung this is all the more rational because in the last century of the roman republic we find ourselves in a time of dominating personalities in rome's earlier days this was conspicuously not the case and her history was as has been truly said the history of great achievements done by men who were themselves not great but from the gracchi onward we come to a period in which individuals make and mar the course of the times when the doings of a sulla and a caesar or even of a marius and a pompey form the main determining element in the history of the day from the end of the second punic war down to the time of the gracchi roman history is very monotonous and uninteresting to the reader it is little more than the record of the haphazard building up of an empire by the unintentional and unsystematic conquest of various disconnected districts round the mediterranean the wars are uninteresting because they are waged by men who are little more than names to us the commander be he a flamininus or a mummius disappears from the historical stage when his consulship is over and is lost to view once more in the ranks of an impersonal senate even the younger scipio africanus who has to serve as a hero in these times for want of a better soon palls upon us he stays in our mind only as a vague impersonation of civic virtue and somewhat cold-blooded moderation after b c one thirty three all is different at last we have living interesting individual men to deal with the names of tiberius gracchus or sulla or caesar are not remembered merely as connected with files of laws or lists of battles at the same time both the internal and the external history of rome becomes of absorbing interest externally the question arises whether the sporadic and ill-compacted empire built up in the last hundred years shall endure or whether it shall be swept away by the brute force of the cimbri and teutons or carved in two by mithridates looking at the growing imbecility of roman generals in that day and the growing deterioration of roman armies it is not too much to say that but for the intervention of two great personalities the roman empire might have been swept away if marius had not appeared a few more generals like Malleus and Caepio would have let the Cimbri and Teutons into central Italy, and the exploits of Alaric in A.D. 410 might have been perpetuated by his remote ancestors. Similarly, but for Sulla, the nearer east might perchance have passed back seven hundred years before the appointed time into the hands of Oriental rulers and have shared the fate which overtook Hellenistic Babylon and Bactria, by losing its touch with western civilization under a dynasty almost as thinly veneered with greek culture as the parthian arsacidae or the bactrian siths 
Internally, the problems of Roman history during this period are quite as interesting. While the imperial city was fighting abroad to maintain her existence and her suzerainty over the whole Mediterranean basin, she was being torn at home by a great constitutional struggle which pierced to the very roots of her being. This was the problem of determining with whom should reside, for the future, sovereignty in the technical sense of the word, that is, the actual supreme voice in the administration and law-making of the city and the empire. For the last two centuries there had existed a practical compromise between the theoretical omnipotence of the public assembly and the actual conduct of affairs by the Senate. This compromise was no longer possible because Rome had developed from a city-state into an imperial state. Neither the Comitia nor the Senate was really competent to rule the new empire which they had acquired. If there was anything more preposterous than the theory of the optimates, I mean that the government of the Roman world should be conducted by a small ring of narrow-minded noble families, it was certainly the opposite theory of the Democrats, that the mixed multitude of paupers and aliens into which the Comitia was fast degenerating should supersede the senatorial oligarchy as administrators of the empire. Complicated with this great constitutional question as to where sovereignty should reside at Rome were a number of social and economic questions arising from the fact that the new commercial conditions of the Mediterranean world which followed from the Roman conquests were bringing about the ruin of the old farmer class which had for so many centuries formed the backbone of the state. The details of the sporadic and never-ending wars in Spain, Macedonia, and the Hellenic East, which cover the period B.C. 200 to 140, hide the unwritten history of the most important changes in the social and economic conditions of Italy. In B.C. 200, Rome was still in the main a city-state of the old type, though she had already begun to acquire important transmarine domains. She was still a self-supporting agricultural community, feeding herself on home-grown corn. Moreover, she might still be described as a narrow-minded, purely Italian town, little affected as yet, either in blood or in thought, by external influences. The elder Cato, with all his hard practical common sense, his stolidity, his passion for the life of the farm, and his contempt for the foreigner, was the typical Roman of that generation. By the last years of his old age, he had seen a new world grow up, and complained that he was living in a city which he no longer understood. For by B.C. 140, Rome was transformed. She was indubitably an imperial state, though she tried to shirk as long as possible the responsibilities of empire. Her population was no longer mainly a race of farmers dwelling on their own narrow acres. It was rapidly becoming divorced from the soil and degenerating into a city-bred proletariat fed from abroad. Above all, Rome had to a large extent become cosmopolitan, having absorbed much Greek or rather Greco-Asiatic culture and philosophy, and still more of Hellenistic luxury and demoralization. The very blood of the people was getting largely diluted with a foreign strain, owing to the wholesale manumission of slaves. While Rome had been transformed, her constitution remained perfectly unchanged, and the rude administrative machinery which had sufficed to manage a small community of farmers living close around the walls of the city was being applied with a rigid and stupid formalism to the government of a widely extended empire. Down to the Second Punic War, Rome had not acquired any provinces that tried very seriously her power to govern. Sicily and Sardinia were close at hand, in ready and constant communication with the city. They were actually visible from the headlands of Italy, merely broken off fragments of the peninsula. An order could without much difficulty reach them in a few days. The Senate and people could make their will felt by governors and generals in districts so close to themselves. The serious trial of the old municipal system of government as applicable to the administration of distant dependencies 
came after the acquisition of the Carthaginian dominions in Spain at the end of the Second Punic War. Separated from Italy by the still unsubdued coastland of southern Gaul, Spain could only be reached by a long sea voyage, which the Roman never loved and which he rigidly eschewed at certain seasons of the year. The proconsuls in Spain got from the first a free hand, such as no previous Roman governor had possessed. It was a long time before any other provinces were added to the overseas empire of the Senate and people, but at last they came. Macedonia and Africa, both in 146, Asia in 133. It was the acquisition of these distant possessions that broke down the ancient power of the Senate to control the doings of the provincial magistrates. It was impossible to maintain a constant supervision over a governor at Goddess or Thessalonica or Ephesus, or to get at him within any reasonable space of time. He had to be left very much to his own inspirations. It was but natural that the more ambitious proconsuls came to take advantage of this fact, and began to make or break treaties, or enter into wars, and to make conquests at their good pleasure. The Senate was sometimes provoked into disowning and annulling their doings, but not very often. When it did, the reason was not always creditable, as witnessed the case of Mancinus at Numantia. Roughly, then, it may be said that by the third quarter of the second century before Christ, Rome had acquired an empire, but refused to take up any of the responsibilities of empire. The Senate still wished to control everything, but they could no more do so efficiently, owing to the mere difficulties of geographical distance, than in the 18th century the East India Company directors could control Clive or Warren Hastings. The proconsuls, on the other hand, could govern, but each only for his short year of office, and the work of each successor generally and often deliberately undid the work of his predecessor. The responsibilities of empire of which we have made mention were in the main threefold. The first was to provide good government within the provinces. This the Roman Republic notoriously failed to secure. The constitution imposed on each conquered region by the senatorial commission, which drew up the Lex Provinciae, after its annexation, was often wisely designed and reasonable, but when once it was formulated there was no proper machinery for modifying it in accordance with the necessities of the time, or even foreseeing that the proconsul did not violate its spirit by arbitrary tampering with the edictum trolliticium, the supplementary code which he could issue and vary at his own pleasure. All through the second century the control of the Senate was growing weaker, and it seemed that the wish, as well as the power, to check misgovernment was disappearing. The natural result was that the type of proconsul steadily deteriorated, as the probability of impunity for abuse of authority grew greater. Expedients, like the establishment of the special court de repetundis, for the repression of financial maladministration was practically useless. To be effective, it would have required an active public prosecutor ready to investigate every returning magistrate's record and a bench of judges absolutely beyond the breadth of suspicion. But Roman usage entrusted all prosecutions to private initiative, and the court which tried the accused was so much swayed by personal and party bias that from the first there were scandals in its working. When a condemnation did occur, it was generally whispered that the convicted magistrate was suffering for some old political escapade at home, rather than for mere maladministration abroad. The second of the responsibilities of empire which Rome seemed unable to discharge was the duty of keeping the police of the high seas and suppressing piracy. This task had in earlier centuries been to some extent discharged by the old naval powers, Carthage in the west, Macedon and Egypt in the east. Rome had now destroyed Carthage and Macedon, and the Ptolemies had sunk into hopeless imbecility and decay. The Romans would not keep up a permanent national fleet, both because it was expensive and because they themselves disliked the sea. Hence, the Mediterranean swarmed with pirates in a way that had never before been seen. 
the poorer and wilder maritime races took to piracy en masse and almost strangled commerce the balearic islanders swept the western seas the unsubdued dalmatians the adriatic and cretans the aegean the pamphylians and cilicians the most numerous and reckless of all these bands had almost taken possession of the waters of the levant their pirate squadrons went out a hundred vessels strong levied blackmail on whole regions and often made descents on cities within the boundaries of the roman empire the senate only resented their outrages by fits and starts if they grew too insolent a squadron was sometimes sent against them but it was seldom composed of vessels equipped and manned from italy the ordinary method was to requisition a fleet from the maritime allies of the state who rendered unwilling and inefficient service hence it came to pass that though many roman expeditions had been sent against the pirates and several commanders had celebrated triumphs over them the evil was not removed and the mediterranean did not become really safe for imperial commerce till the great naval campaign of pompey in b c sixty seven the third great responsibility which the romans assumed when they annexed great and remote provinces was that of protecting the civilized world from the outer barbarian the conquests of spain and macedonia made them the neighbours of scores of wild tribes whom the carthaginians in the one and the kings of the house of antigonus in the other peninsula had been wont to drive back and to keep in check the roman their heir by right of conquest discharged this duty very spasmodically and inefficiently the main reason for this was the deep-rooted dislike of distant and prolonged foreign service among the inhabitants of italy the people had comprehended fifty years before the need for universal conscription and long service in such crises as the second punic war they could not see things in the same light when there was a call for troops to keep back paeonian or illyrian raids on upper macedon or lusitanian raids in baetica they grumbled and rioted every time that a new legion had to be raised this made the senate chary of calling out conscripts or keeping them long on foreign service but finally the crisis always grew so dangerous that the hated levy had at last to be raised nothing can better illustrate the dislike of the roman populace for the lingering and bloody wars of spain than the fact that twice in the middle years of the century in one fifty one and in one thirty eight b c tribunes actually arrested and imprisoned consuls who persisted in enforcing the conscription when public opinion was averse to a new spanish campaign yet the condition of the roman borders in the iberian peninsula was undoubtedly such that these levies were necessary the celti iberian and lusitanian tribes were so warlike and turbulent that the frontier could never stand still raids had to be punished by retaliatory expeditions the tribe that had been chastised would not remain quiet till it had been actually annexed and so the process went on for beyond each marauding clan lay another and a fiercer robber tribe the whole peninsula was like the afridi and waziri frontier of northwestern india at the present day and by advancing their boundary marks the romans only changed the names of their enemies there was no finality till the atlantic was reached and the last galician and catabrian mountaineers maintained their ferocious independence till the days of julius caesar and augustus in the balkan peninsula the state of affairs was much the same under the late republic though the tribali and scordisci and paeonians were not such formidable foes as the spaniards macedon was never really free from northern inroads till the days of the empire and in the east when annexations had once begun in asia similar troubles first with galatians and isaurians and later with the formidable horse bowmen of parthia came pouring in upon the perplexed senatorial oligarchy which tried to govern an empire without an imperial outfit of army navy and civil service the roman world in short was badly governed and badly defended the provinces were steadily decreasing in wealth and resources from the moment that they were annexed 
and since italy and rome herself were as we shall see tending to internal decay though certain individual romans and italians were drawing huge profits from the newly acquired empire the whole mediterranean world seemed doomed to retrogression and collapse it is possible that the republic might have been demolished if there had arisen against it any really formidable and well-equipped enemy but the outer world was singularly destitute of strong men at this period jugurtha and mithridates in spite of all the trouble that they gave were very third-rate personalities and the one truly dangerous foe that marched against rome during the last century of the republic the cimbri and teutons represented mere brute force unguided by brains and strategy at the last moment when they had actually passed the alps they were annihilated by a general who possessed the art of improvising and handling a great army it is curious to speculate what might have happened if not marius but some imbecile optimate of the type of his predecessors malleus and caepio had been in command at aquae sextiae or on the raudian plain but europe escaped the premature coming of the dark ages and the black cloud of barbarism from the north having passed away the men of the later republic were left free to work out their own problems in their own unhappy way in sedition conspiracy civil war and proscription till the coming of that great personality who showed the way a bad way at the best out of the hopeless deadlock into which rome had fallen but ere julius caesar appeared there were not one but many romans who saw well enough that the roman world was out of joint and tried each in his more or less feudal fashion to set it right with some of these statesmen it is our task to deal their successive biographies show well enough the course of the whole history of the later republic there is no gap between man and man sulla as a boy may have witnessed the violent end of gaius gracchus julius caesar as a boy did certainly witness and well-nigh suffer in the proscriptions of sulla the seven lives between them completely cover the last century of rome's ancien regime end of section one Section two of Seven Roman Statesmen of the Later Republic by Charles Oman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter two Tiberius Gracchus, Part one. By the third quarter of the second century before Christ, the contradiction between the new conditions of Roman life and the old forms of Roman government had grown so glaring that even the conservative roman mind saw that the present state of things could not endure much longer the two problems which had forced themselves to the front needed solution what was to be done to adapt the constitution to the new needs of empire was the senate or the public assembly to rule the world and by what machinery and secondly how was the state to deal with the unfortunate fact that the new commercial conditions of the mediterranean countries brought about by the roman conquests were beginning to ruin italian agriculture and to thin out the farmers who formed the backbone of the old roman race a single man was fated to bring forward both these questions to formulate them in the most contentious shapes possible to confuse their issues in the most inextricable fashion and to leave a heritage of strife behind him for the next three generations of romans tiberius gracchus is one of the most striking instances in history of the amount of evil that can be brought about by a thoroughly honest and well-meaning man who is so entirely convinced of the righteousness of his own intentions and the wisdom of his own measures that he is driven to regard any one who strives to hinder him as not only foolish but morally wicked the type of exalted doctrinaire who exclaims that any constitutional check that hinders his plans must be swept away without further inquiry that every political opponent is a bad man who must be crushed has been known in many lands 
and many ages from ancient greece down to the france of the revolution but in rome such a figure was an exception the stolid conservatism the reverence for mos maiorum the dislike for abstract political speculation which marked the race were against the development of such a frame of mind the reformers of the past had been content to work slowly to introduce changes by adding small rags and patches to the constitution or by inventing transparent legal fictions which gained the practical point while leaving the theory of the law that they were attacking apparently untouched the earnest doctrinaire all in a hurry and perfectly regardless of ancestral landmarks was as incomprehensible as he was distasteful to the average roman mind it is well to remember the delightful comment of the elder cato who having been induced in his old age to read some of plato's political dialogues gravely remarked that this socrates seems to have been a prating seditious fellow who suffered rightly enough for having tried to undermine the ancient customs of the state and to teach young men to hold opinions at variance with the laws tiberius gracchus was one of those unfortunate persons who are from their earliest years held up as models and serve to point the moral and adorn the tale for their young contemporaries till they are led on to entertain the strongest views as to their own impeccability and infallibility the cluster of stories which plutarch gives us to illustrate the youth of the gracchi are almost enough in themselves to explain tiberius's after career he was born with every advantage of rank and wealth he had quick intelligence and a handsome face but he was cursed with a mother a very superior woman said every voice in rome who was always reminding him that he was the grandson of scipio the elder and asking how long am i to be called the daughter of africanus and not the mother of the gracchi all the domestic circle marked him off from early youth as one from whom something great was expected his very tutor made him his moral touchstone if tiberius said that a thing was right observed this good man right of course it must be when he grew up the world conspired to do him honour he was made an augur far below the usual age the most respected member of the senate chancing to lie next him at a dinner party offered him his daughter's hand in marriage without waiting to be asked when appius came home that night he called out to his wife as soon as he was inside the door that he had betrothed their daughter why in such a hurry asked the lady unless indeed you chance to have got tiberius gracchus for her clearly public opinion among the matrons of rome who were blessed with marriageable daughters looked upon the young man as the most eligible parti in the city tiberius saw his first military service in africa during the third punic war he was taken out under the best possible auspices as one of the aide-de-camp of his brother-in-law the younger scipio africanus the general's kinsman was offered and took every opportunity for distinction he returned with the decoration of a mural crown and the esteem as we are told of the whole army when he first obtained a magistracy and went to spain as quaestor to the consul mancinus chance gave him an utterly unexpected opportunity of saving a roman army from destruction b c one thirty seven the numantines having defeated and surrounded the consul offered to treat for a definitive peace not with mancinus but with gracchus the reason being that the young quaestor's father had enjoyed a great name for good faith and justice among the spaniards tiberius drew up an equitable treaty which was sworn to by both sides and the army was allowed to depart it was no fault of his if the senate afterwards refused to ratify the agreement and sent mancinus in chains to numantia he was only remembered as the saviour of the lives of the defeated legions and all the ignominy of the defeat was laid upon the council if tiberius had been merely fortunate and virtuous he might have gone through life with honour and success have gained his consulship celebrated his triumph 
and have been buried in peace in the tomb of his ancestors. Unhappily for himself and for Rome, he had enough brains to see that the times were out of joint, enough heart to feel for the misfortunes of his countrymen, enough conscience to refuse to leave things alone and take the easy path to success that lay before him, and enough self-confidence to think that he was foreordained by the gods to set all to rights. Such was the genius of the first of Rome's many self-constituted saviors of society. The particular evil which had struck the eye of Tiberius and which started him upon his crusade was the terrible and rapid decline in the numbers of the free agricultural population which had been setting in for the last thirty years. He had at first no constitutional reforms in his head but merely economic ones. Passing through Etruria on his way to Spain, as we are told, he saw no one working in the fields but slaves. Tillage seemed to be dying out, and the free farmer to have disappeared. The sight shocked him, and he pondered deeply over it during the leisure hours of his Spanish campaign. He learnt by inquiry that the same thing was to be seen in many other parts of Italy. Doubtless the discontented conscripts whom he had to command told him all the woes of the poor freeholder in the days when farming had ceased to pay. At any rate, when he settled down once more in Rome, he imagined that he had probed to the bottom the existing distress and its causes, and that he had hit upon the necessary remedies. The evils from which Italy, or rather Roman Italy, was suffering in B.C. 134 were much the same as those through which rural England has been passing during the last twenty years, the phenomenon that is vaguely called agricultural depression. It was marked by a permanent decrease in the selling value of corn, a widespread turning of arable land into pasture, so that tillage seemed almost to have ceased in certain districts, and a slow but sure shrinkage in the number of the free farming population who lived by the land. It is usual for historians to trace the decline of Italian agriculture to various causes which began to operate as far back as the Second Punic War, to the ravages of Hannibal, the awful drain of life during his continuance in the peninsula, and after his departure to the tribute of blood levied for the never-ending and disastrous Spanish campaigns. On the whole, too much is made of these causes. If farming is really paying, it suffers less than might be expected from a protracted war, unless indeed that war is waged within the countryside itself. Hannibal had departed seventy years before, and in a healthy state of agriculture the traces of his sojourn would long have disappeared. The Spanish and other wars of the next generation waged far away would not have sufficed to ruin rural Italy. As a matter of fact, the drain of life did not, for two generations after Zama, even affect the natural increase of population. The number of land-holding Roman citizens fit to bear arms went rapidly up from the end of the Punic Wars down to B.C. 159. Attaining its maximum in that year, it began very slowly but steadily to decrease. In 159 there were 338,000 assidui, in 154 there were 324,000, in 147 322,000. If Hannibal did not succeed in permanently bringing down the number of Roman freeholders, we shall not be persuaded that Viriatus and the Numantines succeeded in doing so. It was really economic changes in a time of comparative peace that were doing the mischief. Otherwise, the Roman farmer, like the British farmer in the golden days of the struggle with Napoleon, might have prayed for a bloody war and a wet harvest as the things most likely to send up wheat to 120 shillings the quarter. Again, it is often said that the free farming class was beginning to decline because of the growth in Italy of great landed estates, the Latifundia, worked by chain gangs of eastern slaves, of which we hear so many complaints. 
we are assured that the freeholders decayed because of the perverse wickedness of the great capitalists who insisted on buying out their smaller neighbours or on ousting them by means of litigation or even by that rougher sort of process which ahab of old applied to naboth all this we are told they did in order that they might supplant the freeholder by their gangs of asiatic slaves any theory based on the hypothesis that rich men are gratuitously and perversely wicked has found eager acceptance in certain quarters ever since history began when the land is suffering from poverty and depression it is always popular to lay the blame on the backs of tangible and obvious individuals rather than to search for obscure economic causes to us it seems that the growth of the latifundia and the slave gangs was the effect and not the cause of the decay of the free population in italy of b c one fifty five to one thirty five the fact simply was that under the stress of foreign competition corn growing was ceasing to pay in many parts of the peninsula there is a point at which the freeholder even if he be as frugal as the old roman farmer and even if he lives mainly by the consumption of his own produce will refuse to stop any longer on the soil more especially when the alternative is not emigration to the far west but removal to the capital with all its urban pleasures its cheap food and its opportunities of living without the back-breaking toil of plough and mattock those who wish to persuade us that the latifundia drove out the freeholder have always neglected to explain one well-known economic fact cultivation by slave labor is notoriously wasteful and dear the yeoman and his family working for themselves will get much more out of a farm than will a gang of slaves the compulsory laborer even under the lash always succeeds in putting in much less rapid willing and thorough work than the freeman why then should the capitalist be so eager to buy out the farmer if immediately on purchase the productive value of the purchased land went down surely he would have found better use for his money the truth seems to be rather that the yeoman was beginning about the year b c one sixty to find that his farm no longer paid and was eager to get rid of it he sold it to the capitalist at a ruinous sacrifice since he was simply anxious to move on at any price if the buyer threw several farms together and worked them by cheap slaves in a ruthless way he might make a profit for a time slave labor on the roman system had just one advantage that the slave was the only unit in the population he had no wife or children to keep and every pair of hands represented only one mouth moreover he had no standard of comfort whatever he had to live as his master chose herded together in dungeon dormitories half clothed and half starved and sold or left to die the moment that he showed signs of wear and tear the dispossessed yeoman had at any rate lived on a higher scale than this he had wife and family to keep and however frugal his fare and garb they were at least better than those of the slave the farm if bought at a sufficiently low figure might be able to pay the capitalist long after it had ceased to pay the freeholder but it was only exceptionally that the new acquirers of the yeoman's homesteads tried to keep the land under tillage it was much more common to throw many small holdings into a vast ranch or sheep farm worked by a few slave herdsmen cattle and sheep kept on a large scale could pay long after corn had become a hopeless failure for while the roman market was flooded with foreign wheat there was no such competition in the matter of livestock ancient merchant ships were not large swift or commodious enough for the transport of beasts on an extensive scale hence the italian cattle breeder need not fear provincial or foreign competition in the local market beef and mutton hides and wool might still be grown at a profit long after barley and wheat had been given up hence came the rise of the great ranches of southern italy which figure in so many descriptions that italian agriculture was flagging in the middle years of the second century 
even in quarters where the capitalist did not intervene is quite clear cato in his younger days had practised farming for profit in his old age he had to confess that it had become more interesting than lucrative he kept up his farms by way of amusement but put his spare capital into the purchase of house property factories woods and baths when rome had once become acknowledged as the capital of the mediterranean world merchandise of all kinds had begun to come to her market on a scale that had been unknown in the third century and of the imports that were poured in from abroad corn was one of the most prominent the city was only a few miles from the sea and nothing was simpler than to deliver this easily packed commodity at ostia or even to send it up the tiber to the very doors of the urban granaries there were many countries where wheat could be grown at a far cheaper rate than in central italy but it was not merely with the speculative importer from spain africa or egypt that the farmers of the latin and etruscan campagna had now to compete simple free trade was not their only bane they had also to face the state as a rival seller the tithe corn of sicily from the civitates decumani who paid their tribute in kind instead of in money was annually shot upon the roman market and the state had to get rid of it at what price it could experience shows that a government which sells always receives less than the ruling rate for the commodity of which it is trying to get rid the sicilian corn was purchased by the rich grain dealers of rome at a quotation which enabled them to put it upon the market at an absurdly low figure the senate and the urban populace did not care there was a vague notion abroad that if the corn did go cheap it was roman citizens who bought it and roman citizens ought to get as much as possible of the profits of empire out of the praedia populi romani indeed the city mob were already clamouring for distributions of grain when any excuse adequate or inadequate could be found it is scarcely necessary to point out the effect on the agricultural classes of central italy of the appearance of such huge masses of cheap corn in the great central market of the capital mere foreign competitions would have been very bad for them but the interference of the state as a seller made things hopeless it is true that the roman farmer grew corn for his own consumption no less than for the purpose of selling it in the local market this fact tended to make the working of the economic crisis slower but the permanent fall in prices descended like a deadly blight on all the regions which had been wont to supply the city it is necessary to remember however that it was not all italy which was affected the economic crisis mainly touched those regions which in older days had been the home farm of the roman people the latin and south etruscan lands but it was felt also in apulia and lucania where the majority of the soil was in roman hands owing to the confiscations that had followed the hannibalic war and northern etruria seems also to have suffered it was a district which even in early days had been in the hands of great landowners who worked their farms with serfs and now the serfs were being replaced by foreign slaves on the other hand we must bear in mind that there were many parts of italy where the agricultural depression does not seem to have been so much felt forty years later the social war reveals to us the existence of a numerous free agricultural population all over the mountain regions of the apennines somnium picanium the martian territory and the rest the po valley in the north too was so fertile that it could compete in its own markets with any foreign seller this region seems to have remained in a satisfactory economic condition long after depopulation began farther south roughly speaking we may say that the economic crisis affected the land immediately round rome and certain other regions which were mainly in roman hands the italian allies as yet suffered comparatively little if they were sufficiently remote from the suzerain city in a region of mountains and bad roads they suffered not at all for the fatal foreign corn could not creep among them on mule-back over the passes 
so as to compete with the local produce. In many states, the old economic conditions of the third century continued to prevail even down to the social war. Rome's policy unconsciously helped them to survive. She jealously kept the Italians isolated and excluded them from the profits of the empire, with the result that they remained torpid but well preserved in their remote valleys. Under the stress of the competition of cheap foreign corn, the rural population of the regions round Rome had to displace itself much in the same way as the rural population of 19th century England. Nowadays, such folks take refuge in emigration to America or Australia, or still more frequently drift citywards and are absorbed into the industrial classes. These ways of escape were not so obvious to the Roman of the second century. The idea that the citizen might permanently remove himself from Italy and settle down on the better soil in Spain or Africa, the America and Australia of the ancient world, had not yet become familiar. It seemed abnormal and unpatriotic to a race who still cherished the notion formulated in the statement omnis peregratio sordida est et inhonesta. Unlike the Greek, the Roman was not content to go abroad forever. The first great transmarine colony, as we shall see, perished of sheer superstition and traditionary dislike for a settlement outside the sacred soil of the peninsula. Nor could the industrial remedy be fully utilized, owing to the inveterate prejudice against citizens taking to handicrafts, the special portion of the slave and freedman, according to Roman ideas. The ruined farmers drifted to Rome to live on the cheap corn, the doles of patrons, the frequent largesses of the state, and the distributions of candidates for magistracies. These migrants by themselves would have been enough to form the basis for a dangerous mob, but in Rome they mingled with and were demoralized by a far worse element, the great mass of manumitted slaves. The freedmen of the city were precisely the least promising section of the governing people. The slaves who made themselves acceptable to their masters and won their freedom were the clever, subtle Greeks and Syrians who had served in the households of the nobility, not the barbarian field hands whom their owners never saw or regarded. There was a serious danger that Rome might become a Levantine city some day, though she was still far from the generation when men could truly say that in Tiberem de Fluxit Orantes. For agricultural depressions such as there existed in Italy, when Tiberius Gracchus first took to politics, there is only one certain remedy. If the citizens will neither emigrate nor turn themselves from agriculture to handicrafts, and if it is absolutely necessary that the farming class should be kept up, there must be protection. The foreign corn must at all costs be kept out, so that the yeoman may make a margin of profit and stay by his land. Here lay the one chance for preserving the old balance of classes in the Roman state, but unfortunately for those who had the interests of the farmer at heart, the constitution of Rome rested on a public assembly of citizens massed in the campus Martius. On any ordinary day of meeting, the assembly was entirely composed of the urban populace. It would require some very great matter to induce the farmers of the Campania to trudge in many miles in order to exercise the franchise. The more distant voters in remoter corners of Italy were practically out of touch with politics altogether. Accordingly, the statesman who wished to carry his law before the Comitia had normally to face only the plebs urbana. On rare occasions the outvoters might alter the composition of the assembly, but the everyday audience of the orator would consist only of the citizens who dwelt on the spot. How was it possible to propose protection to such a body? They had come to Rome precisely in order to enjoy the cheap loaf, and they were already clamoring to have it larger and yet cheaper. They would have laughed to scorn any proposal to impose a heavy tax on their corn for the benefit of the rural voters. High patriotic appeals would have had little effect on them. 
already thirty years back the elder cato declaiming in vain against a proposal for an unnecessary distribution of corn had exclaimed in his wrath citizens i perceive that it is a difficult task to argue with the belly because it has no ears the city mob would never vote for the dear loaf the hopeless side of the agrarian problem then in ancient rome was that all legislation to support the farming class must be useless without protection and protection could not be got we do not hear even of an attempt to bring it into the sphere of practical politics tiberius gracchus was a perfectly honest and genuine enthusiast who believed that he had a mission the rehabilitation of italian agriculture and that he was quite competent to carry it out it might be that his mission would lead him into trouble and he was prepared to face the fact he had had enough schooling in political philosophy from his numerous greek friends to have freed his mind from the traditional roman horror of violent constitutional change no doubt all the tags of aristotle's school on exreon apocotain and gais anadasmos were familiar to him it may not be out of place to remember that his tutor blasius ultimately died an anarchist fighting at the head of a band of revolted slaves yet in spite of his studies in comparative politics and greek philosophy tiberius by a strange contradiction remained so much a roman legalist that he held that what had once been made lawful must be morally justifiable and that if the comitia passed a law there could be no appeal to equity or common sense against it tiberius saw italian agriculture languishing the countryside occupied more and more every year by the huge estates of the capitalists while in the city was accumulating the idle half-starved mass of paupers who had once been roman freeholders his problem was how to get the people back to the land the end was laudable the means which he adopted were astounding all over italy there were large tracts of territory which were legally and theoretically the property of the state ever since the republic became a conquering power it had been wont to confiscate part of the soil of vanquished enemies sometimes this land was divided up into small farms for roman citizens who engaged to settle thereon sometimes a colony was planted on it sometimes it was sold but very often the state did not cede it in full property to any new owner but simply proclaimed that any citizen who chose might squat upon it as a tenant at will on condition of paying a rent if it was arable he was supposed to give the state a tithe if it was open pasture he was to pay a small capitation fee scriptura for every head of cattle turned out upon it there existed a nominal check upon the accumulation of too much of this public land in the hands of single individuals for the old licinian laws had provided that no one should hold more than five hundred ugera of tillage or turn out more than one hundred oxen or five hundred sheep upon the pasture but by the second century this ancient regulation was deliberately ignored indeed it had not been well observed even at the time of its enactment and of late was only occasionally raked up by legalists like cato the elder in the fourth century and even in the third the tendency of the roman state had been to divide up the larger part of conquered land viratim or to put colonies upon it but from b c two fifty onwards the amount of new soil placed at the disposal of the republic had been so enormous that it was not possible to find settlers ready to occupy it a larger and larger proportion after each conquest had to be thrown open to the licensed squatter this was more especially the case with the vast tracts that were confiscated in southern italy from the states that adhered too long to hannibal these had been the last of the distributions since b c two ten they had ceased no new italian land being available once and again there had been some talk of the inconvenience caused by the want of fresh soil and the celebrated Lilius had thought for a moment of proposing a resumption by the state of part of the broad acres of the squatters but he dropped the project after discovering its practical difficulties and gained thereby his nickname of sapiens the simple idea of tiberius gracchus was 
that the state should resume possession of all this land held by tenants at will possessores was their legal name and possessio their tenure and distributed up among the lately dispossessed farmers who were sitting idle in the streets of rome he announced that as a matter of grace and not of right he should propose that the present occupiers might be allowed the terms granted by the licinian rogations each that is should be allowed to select and retain five hundred ugera out of the land that he was holding he might also this was a new provision set aside two hundred and fifty acres more for each of two sons the small estate thus created should be granted to the old occupier as private property but the rest must be at once surrendered to the state in the first draft of the law which tiberius drew up there would seem also to have been a clause providing for some compensation for unexhausted improvements on the surrendered land such we may suppose as houses or farm buildings erected by the outgoing tenant it was practically certain that the senate would refuse its sanction to any such bill but for that hindrance the reformer cared not he intended to carry it through the comitia in spite of the fathers with this apparently as his sole programme he stood for the tribunate in b c one thirty four was easily elected and entered into office in the succeeding year the first announcement of his intention roused an opposition that he cannot but have foreseen though he displayed considerable indignation at it the eviction of all the possessores from the public land was not such a simple matter as it looked when an estate had been occupied by the same family for many generations without any reminder on the part of the landlord that they may one morning be requested to depart ties both practical and sentimental grow up between the tenant and the soil which it is idle for the lawyer to disregard of the public land held by possessio some had been granted out as far back as the samnite and pyrrhic wars and none had been distributed at a later date than hannibal's expulsion from italy it had been held therefore by the tenants for terms ranging from seventy to two hundred years without any interference on the part of the state they had naturally expected that the system would endure and had behaved as if they had a perpetual lease instead of a precarious license to squat the moment therefore that the bill was brought forward tiberius found that he had roused a hornet's nest about his ears there was probably hardly a senator or knight in rome who did not hold some of his land by the mere tenure of possessio and the fact that the tenure was precarious had through the state's own fault been completely forgotten it was not merely the financial loss that angered the squatters but the sentimental grievance on the lands from which they were to be evicted lay as they complained their old family villas and the tombs of their ancestors they did not want compensation for disturbance nothing could make up to them for the loss of such things moreover the legal difficulties that would be raised were unending some had borrowed money on the security of such lands were the creditors to lose the sum advanced others had charged upon them the dowries of their wives or the portions of their daughters many had bought soil held by possessio at its full market value under the impression confirmed by the practice of two hundred years that it was to all intents and purposes held under a perpetual lease some occupying estates of this kind alongside of others held in full freehold had pulled down the boundaries between them and inextricably confused the holdings in short the proposal of tiberius to leave the possessori some remnants of their old acres and to grant them a certain compensation for unexhausted improvements failed as was natural to content them how could it when they were to be evicted from the main part of their land entirely in opposition to their own desire very reasonably from their own point of view they resolved to fight till the last gasp and to fight in the old constitutional roman fashion by finding one of the tribunes who sympathized with them and inducing him to put his veto on his colleague's proposed agrarian law now the tribunicial veto had by this epoch of the republic's history grown to be a mere nuisance and an anachronism yet it was so much tied up in men's memories with the ancient constitutional triumphs of the early centuries that it was regarded much as the modern englishman regards trial by jury or habeas corpus to touch it seemed profane 
yet its employment had grown casual and spasmodic. It was no longer used, as had been originally intended, for the protection of the plebeian from the patrician. Indeed, patrician and plebeian were now inextricably confused in blood, and most of the staunchest oligarchs and reactionaries of the last century before Christ were of plebeian name and race. Of late, the tribunate and the veto had been utilized in the most irregular and haphazard way, quite as often by the Senate against the Democrats as by the Democrats against the Senate. Sometimes it was used for purely personal ends by any vain or eccentric or ambitious person who had succeeded in obtaining the office. The quaintest tales may be collected by those curious in the subject concerning the use of the veto in these latter days, but on the whole the Constitution had been saved by a rough system of give and take from the ever possible deadlock which the veto might bring about. The powers of the office had never been pressed to their logical extreme, though it was always possible that an obstinate man might bring matters to a crisis. At this particular moment, in B.C. 133, Rome was blessed not with one, but with two obstinate tribunes who held diametrically opposite views. At the earliest opportunity, therefore, after his election to office, Tiberius brought forward his bill. Its most important clauses we have already noticed, but we must add that the confiscated land was to be cut up into farms of thirty ugera each, inalienable by the allottees, and charged with a small rent payable to the state. The former provision was intended to prevent applications by speculators, who might intend not to farm, but to sell at a profit. The latter was to keep before the eyes of the new settlers the fact that they were not freeholders but tenants of the state. A permanent court of three commissioners, Trium Viri Agris Dandis Assignandis, was to be created not only to distribute land but to sit as judges in all cases where there was a dispute as to what was and what was not state domain, or as to the fraction which the old tenant desired to retain, or as to any other point arising out of the law. Both Plutarch and Apian have preserved scraps of the great speech with which Gracchus introduced his bill. They enable us to gauge perfectly the honest but emotional and high-strung temperament of the orator. The wild beasts of Italy, he cried, have their holes and dens to retire to, but the brave men who spill their blood in her cause have nothing left when they come back from the wars but light and air. Without hearth or home they wander like beggars from place to place with their wives and children. A Roman general does but mock his army when he exhorts his soldiers to fight for their ancestral sepulchres and their domestic gods. For in these days how many are there of the rank and file who possess an altar that their forefathers reared, or a sepulchre in which their ashes rest? They fight and die merely to increase the wealth and luxury of the rich. They are called the masters of the world, while none of them has a foot of ground of his own. Having thus painted the miseries of the present state of things, he began to explain his remedy for them. It was absolutely necessary that Rome should keep up the class from which her legions were drawn. Land must be found for these landless men, and land was available. Was it not most just to distribute the public property among the public? Had the slaves, who now tilled the estate of the possessores, more claims to consideration than citizens? Was not a soldier more valuable to the state than a man who could not fight? a Roman than a barbarian? Accordingly, it was his duty to call upon the rich men who now held the public land to take into consideration the dangerous state into which the Republic was drifting and to yield up their holdings of their own accord as a free gift, if need be, to men who could rear children for the future benefit of Rome. They must be patriotic enough to subordinate their own profit to the good of the state, surely it would be sufficient compensation that each of them was guaranteed the perpetual possession without payment of five hundred ugera for himself and half as much for each of his sons the speech as all our authorities agree was moving and eloquent enough it roused to enthusiasm the needy crowd of dispossessed farmers who had never before heard their own case put so strongly they fully believed that their ruin had come 
not from economic causes but from the greed of the rich they thought that if started again with the state's aid and protection they might yet live off the land the purely urban multitude was moved with the emotional fervour of the harangue and had no objection to confiscatory measures directed against its old enemies the governing classes clearly tiberius would not lack supporters and the angry capitalists soon saw that they would have to fight to the death if they wished to retain the broad lands which they had so long regarded as their own accordingly they had got their instrument ready a tribune was at hand prepared to veto the law he was named m octavius all agreed that he was a perfectly honest and upright man he had been a personal friend of gracchus but was a thorough conservative and what no doubt did much to settle his politics a considerable holder of land in possessio when by the order of tiberius the clerk began to recite the preamble of the agrarian law octavius rose and bade him desist tiberius from the first showed signs of temper he turned on his colleague we are told and used harsh and insulting words to him then he postponed the introduction of the bill to the next legal day of meeting begging his friends to see that they came down in full force to the adjourned debate end of section two section three of seven roman statesmen of the later republic by charles oman this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami tiberius gracchus part two a vast crowd appeared on the appointed day enough as the reformer hoped to overawe his recalcitrant colleague but when the clerk again began to recite the preamble octavius again interposed his veto then followed a violent scene while the tribunes exchanged hard words and the mob raged and shouted a most unhappy inspiration then came upon the reformer honestly unable to understand that his colleague could have any but selfish reasons for his obstinacy he suddenly made a most offensive proposal to him you are he said a considerable holder of public land i will pay you the full value of it out of my own pocket if you will withdraw your veto naturally octavius was deeply hurt and put aside at once the insulting offer his colleague had taken the very course which made it a point of honour for him to persist in opposition to the very last again there was a deadlock the condition of affairs raised wild anger in the breast of tiberius he was still convinced that only bad motives could lead men to oppose a law in which as he considered lay the sole hope of salvation for the roman state accordingly he resolved that these enemies of the people should be chastised he redrafted his bill striking out the compensation clauses and simply evicting the possessores as a punishment for their opposition moreover he resolved to show that if his adversaries could use the powers of the tribune so could he he determined to make all state business impossible till his bill should have a hearing using an undoubted constitutional right but one which no man but a doctrinaire and a passion would have employed at such an early stage of the proceedings he forbade all other magistrates to exercise their functions till the agrarian law should have been discussed he sealed up the state treasury in the temple of saturn to prevent any payments being made from it he gave notice to the praetors that they must close the law courts and that if they allowed a case to be tried they should be punished by a heavy fine in a short time every department of government was in confusion public servants could not draw their pay contractors could not continue their works every litigant found his lawsuit hung up the confusion and anarchy caused was out of all proportion to the gravity of the provocation which tiberius had received the main result of it was to estrange from the reformer's cause the greater part of his more moderate partisans 
there were men who thought that the law was desirable if the possessores could be paid off and induced to depart without too much friction but it was obviously iniquitous to abolish the compensation clauses merely because opposition had been offered and to put a stop to all public business was mischievous and wrong-headed in the extreme tiberius however was wrought up to such a pitch of exasperation that he utterly refused to press his scheme in a slower and less desperate fashion he brought forward the new and harsher form of the bill and laid it before the comitia at the first opportunity again octavius interposed his veto rioting followed and it is said that a gang of the clients and hangers-on of the possessores made a dash for the balloting urns and tried to break up the comitia in order to prevent the reformer from proceeding they were routed however and the meeting continued two friends of gracchus a manlius and a fulvius both consulars are then said to have suggested to him that before going further he might ask the senate to plead with his colleague to allow the bill a fair hearing the proposal if made in good faith was not a very wise one considering that most senators were holders on a greater or lesser scale of public land possibly as mommsen suggests the more moderate men wished at all costs to give gracchus time to get cool and to allow him a chance of discussing his bill in a less electric atmosphere than that of the comitia it argues an honest simplicity on the part of the reformer that he accepted the suggestion and hurried off to the senate house clearly he thought that his proposals must seem so reasonable to every good citizen that the senate would take sides in his favour even against the private interest of the majority of its members he was soon undeceived there was much debate but nothing was done when he broached his request he was met with insulting replies from prominent squatters and finally the senate refused to interfere with a tribune who was only exercising his undoubted constitutional privilege convinced now that he would get nothing by quiet means and that all the upper classes were leagued against him tiberius rushed into mere violence and illegality at the next meeting of the comitia he made one more appeal to octavius taking him by the hand and imploring him not to stand between the people and their will when the expected negative was given to his impassioned appeal tiberius suddenly produced a new and startling proposal two colleagues of equal power he said when they differ on a capital point cannot work together they must always be engaged in hostilities and the public weal must suffer it would be better that one should be removed accordingly he invited octavius to take the sense of the meeting on their differences with the understanding that the tribune found to be in a minority should abdicate from his office and withdraw the notion was unprecedented and unconstitutional indeed looking over the assembly all clamorous for the agrarian law and new farms octavius must have considered it a mockery as well as a solecism of course he refused to have anything to do with such a scheme tiberius told him to look out for the worst and dismissed the comitia for that day on the following morning he put before the tribes a very simple issue could the magistrate who opposed the will of the people be the people's true representative if he was setting himself up in opposition to them ought he not to be removed of course the argument was as illogical as it was unconstitutional for the will of the people in the mouth of gracchus meant merely the snap vote of some particular assembly of the twenty thousand or thirty thousand citizens who chanced to be in the compass martius that day there is an end of all government if magistrates can be made and unmade by the whim of any mob that gets together on a day of excitement according to the roman constitution the idea of deposing a tribune was unthinkable once elected he represented the majesty of the people and could not be touched to harm him was sacrilege voluntary resignation or death were the only ways in which his place could become vacant 
to remove him by a vote of the tribes before his time was out was as impossible as let us say it would be for a mass meeting of the electors of westminster to declare their member of parliament deposed and then to fill up his place nevertheless when the adjourned assembly met tiberius put before them the motion that octavius should be deposed from office his colleagues simply observed that the whole proceeding was impossible and illegal but the voice of the multitude was with the reformer seventeen tribes one after another gave their votes for the proposal before the eighteenth had come up and an actual majority had been registered the number of tribes was thirty-five at this period tiberius gave octavius a last chance telling him that if his veto were withdrawn the vote should proceed no further but the optimate was neither to be intimidated nor to be coaxed he maintained his obdurate attitude until the voting was over then when told to depart because he had been deposed and was no longer a tribune he clung to the rostra vociferating that the whole proceedings were null and void a statement which was undoubtedly true if there remained any force in the roman constitution completely losing control of his temper tiberius had him dragged off the platform and thrust away the mob below got him down and nearly pulled him to pieces he barely escaped with his life and a faithful retainer who tried to protect him had his eyes torn out after this scandalous scene in which he had narrowly escaped the guilt of causing his colleague's death tiberius proceeded to hold an illegal election meeting and filled up the place of octavius in the tribunicial college with an obscure client of his own one quintus mummius there was now nothing to prevent the passing of the agrarian law which was produced for the third time and carried in its revised form with the compensation clauses left out we have already given its details it only remains to add that when the three commissioners agristandus assignandus had to be appointed tiberius showed a great want of political wisdom he named himself his younger brother gaius a youth of twenty and his father-in-law appius claudius he aimed merely at securing stringent efficiency in action and did not see how invidious it was to assign the grave and unpleasant work of confiscation to a mere family party there would have been a serious financial difficulty in starting the commission on its work if it had not been for an unforeseen chance even if the domain lands were successfully torn from the possessores and handed over to the would-be colonists how would the latter be fitted out for their experiment thousands of cottages must be built for them tens of thousands of yokes of oxen purchased hundreds of thousands of agricultural implements procured how tiberius had originally proposed to find the very large sums of money necessary for this purpose we are not told the raising of the funds would certainly have involved him in a bitter conflict with the senate who always made finance their special province but fortune intervened just at this moment there died attalus the third the last king of pergamus he was an eccentric and tyrannical prince who divided his time between the study of the fine arts and the extermination of his relatives when he died suddenly of sunstroke it was found that he had left his whole kingdom as a legacy to the roman republic those who knew him averred that he had often pondered over the most effective way of making his subjects unhappy and had concluded that he could devise no better manner of doing so than this there was an enormous accumulation of ready money in the coffers of attalus tiberius resolved to seize upon it for his own purposes accordingly he brought forward a bill by which the pergamene treasures were voted away to purchase ploughs and oxen and to build barns and cottages for the new settlers it mattered little that many districts of asia broke out into rebellion rather than accept the roman domination the inland was in arms under a certain aristonicus the son it was said of the daughter of an itinerant harper who claimed to be a natural son of the father of attalus the third 
but the capital, the coast cities, and most important of all, the treasure, were safely made over to the Senate and people. It was this ample stock which made it possible for Tiberius to set the land commission seriously to work. It is clear that before the end of his year of office a vast amount of land had been seized and distributed, but for one more important thing Tiberius made no provision. Evidently he had no conception of the need of it. This was to secure that when the land was distributed and stocked and furnished with its barns and cottages, it should prove a paying concern. Yet one would have thought that even a rash experimenter might have reflected that if the older race of farmers, with all the accumulated experience of ages spent on the same soil, could not make both ends meet, it was decidedly unlikely that their successors, city-bred men, or at least men who had taken refuge in the city and lived there for some time estranged from rural pursuits, would be able to accomplish the feat. But it is clear that the fact that agricultural depression had its roots not in the wickedness of the rich, but in obscure economic changes, had never entered the reformer's head. Of the friction that must have accompanied the confiscations, our authorities tell us little. We only know that there was an immense number of complicated lawsuits, and that the bitterness of feeling among the expropriated possessores grew more bitter as the year rolled on. If they had raged at the threat of eviction, it was but natural that they should grow absolutely desperate as man after man they were actually expelled from their holdings. There is no reason to doubt the truth of the statement that plots were made to assassinate Tiberius. He himself certainly believed it, and when one of his friends died of an obscure distemper, he accused his enemies of having poisoned him and made an inflammatory harangue at his funeral in which he declared that he was obliged to place his life under the protection of the people. Such a guarantee was not of much effective use, and Tiberius went about with the uncomfortable persuasion that he was a marked man. Bitter hatred followed him wherever he appeared. He had ruined too many prominent men to be able ever to live again in quiet. Angry senators insulted him in the streets, and asked him inconvenient constitutional questions on public occasions. No story was too silly or malignant to be told against him. One ridiculous optimate solemnly declared that he had got from Pergamus among the royal treasures a crown and a purple robe, which he intended to use when he should proclaim himself king of Rome. The most threatening symptom, however, for Tiberius was that several resolute enemies announced that they intended to impeach him for maestas, for unconstitutional conduct amounting to high treason, the day that his office came to an end because he had diminished the majesty of the Roman people by deposing a sacrosanct tribune from office. Tiberius, knowing that he was technically guilty, had no wish to face such a trial, he made an elaborate apologia for all that he had done in a speech which shows strong traces of his studies in the field of Greek political philosophy. The person of a tribune, he said, is no doubt sacred and inviolable, because he is the representative of the sovereign people, but if he manifestly opposes their interests and tyrannizes over them, by refusing to allow them the liberty to vote on any project which they have at heart, he surely deprives himself by his own act of his sacrosanct character. If we were to find a tribune trying to pull down the temple on the capital or to set fire to the arsenal, we should lay restraining hands on him in spite of his inviolability. And in a similar fashion, he who was doing his best to diminish the majesty of the Roman people must be stripped of the power to do so. Is it not shocking to think that the people should not have the right of deposing one who is using his privileges against those who gave them to him? The kings of old held the most awful of magistracies, yet Tarquin was expelled. Can anything be more holy and venerable than the Vestal Virgins who keep the perpetual flame? Yet if one of them breaks her vows, she is buried alive. 
so too a tribune who injures the sovereign people can no longer be sacred and inviolable because of the investiture which the people gave him he has destroyed the power in which alone his strength lay all this and much more to the same effect was eloquent and persuasive enough but clearly it was not law nor was it even common sense the whole argument rests on the assumption that a minority has no right to resist by the constitutional means which are at its disposal it assumes that the verdict of the comitia on some chance day of meeting is the same thing as the will of the roman people it also presupposes that what the people desire is necessarily for its own best interests from such views any amount of intolerant trampling on minorities might be logically justified if anything more is needful to make the reformer's position absurd it is that the body which he idealized into the roman people was really the shifting urban multitude which his adversaries called the mob misera et sordida plebecula to use the words of a later politician the time for the election of the tribunes for b c one thirty two was now drawing near and it was suggested to gracchus that if he wished to preserve himself from prosecution for high treason and if he desired to be sure that his land commission should go on with its work the best thing that he could do would be to stand again for the tribunate and to retain both his sacrosanct position and his power of dealing as a magistrate with the public assembly by resolving to offer himself as a candidate for a second term of office tiberius changed his whole political position he had started as an enthusiast who had only one single measure at heart and merely desired to carry it through the settlement of the agrarian question had seemed to him to be the one really pressing need of the roman state when his great bill had passed he might logically have sung his nunc dimittis and retired into private life to live down the hatred of the governing classes by proving that at least he had been wholly disinterested in all his actions but by asking for a second term of office tiberius made himself into a permanent party leader he saw this himself and justified his position by putting forth a regular political program in the reforms which he announced that he intended to carry out in b c one thirty two we see foreshadowed the whole democratic platform of the next fifty years the planks of it included number one the relaxation of the terms of military service number two the granting of a right of appeal from all law courts to the sovereign people assembled in the comitia number three the abolition of the monopoly which the senators had hitherto enjoyed of supplying all the jurors in the courts number four if valius is to be trusted the introduction of a bill for extending the franchise to latin and italian allies how far this last proposal was to go is unfortunately unknown indeed we have only a very meagre outline of the whole set of schemes it would probably be doing tiberius an injustice to suspect that the whole of this program was drawn up in order to provide him with an excuse for asking for a renewal of his tribunate he considered that his opponents had behaved so badly that he was in duty bound to continue the campaign against them that had commenced with the agrarian law he had gathered round himself a knot of partisans who looked upon him as their responsible leader and would highly resent his retirement from public life we may suspect also that the discovery of his own power to sway the multitude by his fervid eloquence had somewhat intoxicated him and that he was not unwilling to accept the post of friend of the people to accuse him of mere ambition and love of authority would be unfair though he was busily engaged in breaking up the old constitution of rome he does not seem to have been aware of the fact by legislating on such important matters as the agrarian law and the appropriation of the pergamene treasuries by mere plebiscites without the approval and consent of the senate he had practically ended the time-honoured compromise under which roman politics had been conducted for the last two hundred years if the state machine could be worked by an irresponsible tribune dealing directly with the sovereign people the senate became a useless wheel in the engine 
but it seems probable that all these facts passed completely over the reformer's head he was under the impression that he was no revolutionary but merely a good citizen carrying out his obvious duty the news that tiberius was canvassing for a second tenure of office brought the more or less suppressed wrath of his enemies to boiling point they had supposed that they would be rid of him as legislator at the end of the year and they had hoped to do their best to get him tried for maestas when he was once more a private citizen the prospect of a second year of democratic agitation appalled them accordingly they bent all their efforts to the end of frustrating his election owing to the season of the year it was certain that very few rural voters would be present they would not leave the vintage even to support their best friend the matter would lie as usual in the hands of the urban populace and the enemies of gracchus were not without hopes that a combination of influence intimidation and bribery might secure them a majority in that very unsatisfactory body of voters but when the reformer devoted himself for many days to a desperate personal canvass it soon became evident that his popularity was too great and that his triumph was more than probable as a last resort his foes resolved to raise a constitutional question on a disputed point of election law when among immense excitement the poll began the first two tribes gave their suffrages for gracchus it was so customary for the remaining tribes to follow the lead of those who had the prerogative of the first vote that the return of the reformer seemed secure but then the objection was made that it was not legal for the same person to hold a tribunate for two years in succession this was a doubtful point of constitutional law so much so that a few years later the democratic party took the trouble to pass a bill formally affirming its legality but in b c one thirty three the question was still to be debated there were many precedents for re-election the case of licinius the author of the old agrarian law of b c three sixty seven was especially apposite as the people had returned him for ten successive years before he finally got his scheme carried out on the other hand there was an old law dating from the generation after licinius b c three forty two which discouraged re-election it had not been invariably observed but it was still on the statute book moreover there was a constitutional theory that the practice was to be deprecated because it prevented a magistrate from being made responsible for the acts of his year of office a person who was perpetually re-elected could never be called to account this theory was still worth defending if the optimates wished for a fight when the point was brought up the partisans of tiberius raised loud cries of dissent and such a tumult arose that the presiding tribune one rubrius grew scared and refused to proceed then mummius the successor of the deposed octavius tried to take over the charge of the meeting declaring that he saw no difficulty and was prepared to go on with the election but other tribunes intervened declaring that either rubrius must carry out his day's work or else there must be a fresh casting of lots for the selection of a fresh president while the magistrates wrangled the people grew more and more turbulent and when the meeting had degenerated into a riot it had finally to be adjourned this unexpected hitch in the proceedings struck dismay into the heart of tiberius he thought that he was lost if he should fail to secure his re-election considering the fierce spirit which his enemies were displaying clothing himself in black and leading his little son by the hand he went round the forum appealing to the multitude to save their friend from imminent peril of death his indignant partisans closed around him vowing that he should be preserved at all costs and for the next few days he went about with a sort of bodyguard armed with staves and bearing torches after nightfall this mob was a splendid mark for the satire and invective of the optimates had there ever been before they asked a citizen of rome who could not stir without a huge gang of bravos at his heels what could such assemblies mean if greek precedents went for anything the friend of the people who declared his life in danger and went about with an organized band of satellites behind him would some day blossom out into a tyrant seize the capital 
and massacre the Senate. We may be perfectly certain that Tiberius had no thought of emulating Sipolis or Pisistratus, but it must be confessed that his actions bore a most singular resemblance to theirs. Even those who sympathized with his ends were scared at his reckless proceedings, for in this last crisis of his life he showed a complete lack of coolness and self-restraint. On the night before the adjourned election meeting he collected a great crowd of his adherents, many of whom encamped before his house and slept in the street. He harangued them, told them that violence would probably be used against them, and added that in that case they must meet force by force. He arranged that his partisans should mass themselves in the front of the place of assembly before the capital and keep off their opponents by their serried ranks. Appian adds that he agreed to give them a signal if he considered himself in danger by raising his hand to his head as a token that his life was at stake. If they saw the sign, they must prepare to fight. All this was a deliberate provocation of civil war to endeavor to pack a meeting and to come down prepared for violence means rioting and not politics it was quite enough to give an excuse to men much less angry and unscrupulous than the opponents of gracchus on the eventful day the tribune set out accompanied by a mass of his supporters we are told that all the omens were very dismal that morning the sacred chickens had refused to eat Tiberius stumbled on his own doorstep and cut his foot. Crows scuffling on the roof dislodged a tile which fell almost on his head. His satellites muttered that ill luck was in the air, but his old tutor, the philosopher Blasius, cried out that the son of Gracchus and the grandson of Scipio, the protector of the people of Rome, would never be held back by any omen from going forth to help that people in the day of their need, and the cortege forced its way through the crowded streets toward the capital. At first it seemed as if the reformer were about to carry all before him. His faithful tool Mummius had obtained the presidency for the day, and began to call over the roll of the tribes. There was a solid mass of Democrats at the front, who received Gracchus with the loudest acclamations, and formed round him a sort of battle array, when he took his place with his colleagues. But presently it was seen that there was also a hostile element present. The possessores had sent down their clients and retainers, and scuffling and quarrelling began at half a dozen points till all was clamour and disorder and the voices of the tribunes could not any longer be heard. At this moment Tiberius descried a friend of his, a senator named Fulvius Flaccus making frantic signs and beckonings to him over the head of the crowd from a point of vantage onto which he had climbed. Flaccus, one of the few really warm partisans of reform in the Senate, had news for his leader. When he had been with difficulty thrust to the front, he gasped that danger was imminent, for the possessories were trying to induce the Senate to declare Tiberius a public enemy and since they could not move the consul to action, were threatening to arm their friends and servants and to sally out into the streets to murder him. Without waiting to see whether or no the report was exaggerated or the enemy really at hand, Tiberius gave the signal for hostilities by making the preconcerted sign of raising his hand to his head. In an instant all was in confusion. His friends girt up their gowns, broke up the fast case of the lictors and any other woodwork they could find to make bludgeons, gathered in a compact mass, and drove the partisans of the possessores out of the field with bruises and broken heads. The other tribunes fled, the priests hastened to shut up the temples, and peaceable citizens ran home to get out of the trouble, spreading various absurd rumors as they fled. While all this was in progress, the Senate had been sitting in the Temple of Fides, receiving from time to time more or less accurate accounts of what was going on before the capital. The news that Flaccus had carried to the assembly seems to have been somewhat highly colored, for though the possessores had been denouncing Tiberius in the bitterest terms, they had not succeeded in moving the consul Scaevola to take any action against him, nor had the Senate shown any willingness to pass a decree of outlawry. There were still many moderate men in it, who
who shrank from the responsibility of commencing civil strife. The debate in the Senate was only brought to a head when the clamor of the multitude who were fleeing from the scene of riot was heard. Inquiries made of the fugitives elicited the wildest statements. Some said that Gracchus was deposing all the other tribunes from office as he had once deposed Octavius, and others cried that he was appointing himself without election tribune for the ensuing year. The most absurd version was that when he had been seen raising his hand to his head, he was asking for the kingly crown. The opponents of Gracchus were already wrought up to such a pitch of wrath by the financial ruin that he had brought upon them, that they readily believed or professed to believe even the wildest of these rumors. Their spokesman, Publius Cornelius Scipio Nasica, a consular who had been a great holder of domain land, leapt to his feet and once more adjured Scaevola to take up arms against the tyrant. But the imperturbable magistrate merely announced that if Gracchus was persuading or forcing the people into irregular courses, he should take care to annul his proceedings, but that he would not be the first to have recourse to violence, nor would he ever put any citizen to death without a trial. Then Nausicaa cried aloud that since the consul refused to defend his country, he adjured all who wished to save Rome and her laws to follow him to the capital. So saying, he girt up his toga and cast the purple border of it over his head that all might see his rank. He rushed into the street, followed by many scores of the younger senators who were joined outside by a crowd of their clients and attendants. They soon made their way to the capital, where they found Gracchus haranguing his partisans. The multitudes were thinning out after the election proceedings had come to an end, and it is said that the reformer had now no more than three thousand or four thousand men around him. Without any attempt at parley, Nasica charged at the Democrats with his followers streaming in a wedge behind him, the senators at their head. Neither side was armed, save with staves and broken chairs and benches. Quite contrary to what might have been expected, the optimates cleft through the mob of Gracchus's partisans without much difficulty. It is said that many instinctively gave way before the rush of furious senators out of inbred reverence for the purple stripe. This much is certain, that belaboring their opponents with their improvised weapons, Nausicaa and his followers cleared the capital, driving the Democrats before them and casting some over the cliffs of the ascent. The fray was very bloody, for the assailants knocked on the head every man that fell, Nearly three hundred persons were killed, not one, it is recorded, by an edged weapon, but all by sticks and stones. Among the victims was Gracchus himself, who had been thrown down near the door of the Capitoline temple in front of the statues of the ancient Roman kings. He had stumbled over a corpse, and as he strove to rise, a senator named Publius Satureus beat out his brains with a footstool. Thus miserably perished a young man of excellent intentions and perfect honesty, who thought himself destined to be the regenerator of Rome, and merely succeeded in launching the state upon a hundred years of bitter civil strife. No man is fit for a party leader who combines an emotional temperament, an impatience of opposition, and a complete inability to look at contested questions from his opponent's point of view as well as his own. It is probable that Tiberius was attempting an impossible task. Without the introduction of protection, agriculture was doomed in central Italy, and protection could not be got because it was against the interests of the urban multitude. But the agrarian question had to be fought out, and the contest, if waged with the usual gravity and self-restraint of ancient Roman politics, need not have ended in confiscation without compensation on the one side, or riot and massacre on the other. For the course that events took, Gracchus himself must bear the responsibility. His enemies were greedy and narrow-minded, but he himself was harsh, reckless, and provocative beyond measure. When, in a moment of pique, he struck out the compensation clauses from his bill, he challenged the possessores to a fight to the death. Morally speaking, there can be no doubt that they were entitled to some sort of amends for being evicted without warning from estates 
which they and their fathers had occupied for several generations. Having ruined many men of mark and impoverished many more, Tiberius had secured for himself an enmity that was bound to end either in his death or exile, or in his being compelled to seize autocratic power. His means were even worse than his ends. No statesman has a right to pull down the constitution about the ears of the people the moment that he finds himself checked in his designs. However bad a constitution may be, the man who upsets it before he has arranged for anything to be put in its place is a criminal and an anarchist if he knows what he is doing, a mischievous madman if he does not. It would seem from the general bent of the reformer's character that it is to the latter class that he must be consigned. He had many private virtues, but so had Robespierre. A man may be eloquent, incorruptible, and thoroughly convinced of his own good intentions, but if he is sufficiently reckless, vain, and otolatrous, he may blossom out into the worst sort of tyrant, the philosophic doctrinaire. Looking at the emotional and impatient character of Tiberius, it is quite possible to conceive that if that scuffle on the capital had had another result, he might ultimately have become that which his enemies declared that he wished to be, the tyrant of Rome. End of section 3《Section Three》。《Section Four of Seven Roman Statesmen of the Later Republic by Charles Oman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter Three, Gaius Gracchus, Part One. In studying the career of Tiberius Gracchus, we were investigating a very simple phenomenon. The great tribune was aiming at nothing more than the redress of social and economic ills, and had no thought of reconstructing the Roman constitution. When the provisions of that constitution stood in his way, he recklessly overrode them, but when they chanced to suit his purpose, he utilized their most tiresome and absurd formalities to the utmost limit. It was characteristic of the short-sighted Tiberius to press the tribunicial authority to its most exaggerated extension one month by shutting up the law courts and the treasury, while in the next he struck at the very roots of that authority and taught men to despise it by illegally deposing a tribune by the vote of the Comitia. Whether such conduct was likely to strengthen the position of future tribunes, he does not seem for one moment to have reflected. But as a substitute for the old constitution which he was so ruthlessly breaking up, Tiberius had nothing to put forward. When we examine his program, the list of reforms that he intended to bring forward in his second tribunate, we find that it does not include any scheme for rearranging the machinery of the state, but only certain proposals to change points of detail, such as the composition of juries, the conditions of military service, and perhaps the limits of the franchise. There was no attempt to settle the great problems of sovereignty and imperial administration, which were the really pressing questions of the day apparently he was prepared to entrust the unwieldy public assembly with the details of the governance of the empire for which it was even more unfitted than was the oligarchic senate but in spite of tiberius's short-sightedness the after-effects of his career were such as to make constitutional changes likely and even necessary he had broken up for ever the tacit agreement between senate and people by which alone the clumsy machinery of the Roman administration could be kept working. He had shown that the Comitia, if galvanized into activity by a reckless and restless tribune, was capable of reasserting its old theoretical powers and of passing laws in defiance of the Senate, and in opposition to the Senate's dearest interests. No state can contain two sovereigns, and it had now to be settled which was really supreme at Rome the senate according to the practice of the last two centuries or the people as theory required it was only necessary that a capable leader should again come forward to put himself at the head of the democratic party and then the struggle for sovereignty must force itself to the front 
as the main problem of the day. Leaders of a sort were not long wanting, but at first they were mere noisy agitators who only stirred the surface of things. Gaius Papirius Carbo and Marcus Fulvius Flaccus, the immediate successors of the elder Gracchus, were not men of mark or ability. Their doings had little practical importance. Carbo tried to pass a declaratory law to the effect that tribunes might legally be re-elected year after year, B.C. 131. He failed, fell away from his democratic beliefs, and relapsed, for reasons obscure but probably discreditable, into the ranks of the optimates. A few years later, however, the bill was passed by other hands. Flaccus, who was a genuine enthusiast but fickle of purpose and lacking in perseverance, began to meddle with another and a much more important question, the enfranchisement of the Italian allies. He brought in a bill for this very just and wise purpose, saw it blocked by the tribunicial veto, and then instead of persevering with it, suddenly left Rome and plunged into a series of campaigns in southern Gaul, B.C. 125. The Senate deliberately threw the chance of military glory in his way by assigning him the Gallic province. He could not resist the opportunity and disappeared from home politics for two years. The only practical result of his agitation was the rebellion of one isolated Italian city, Fregoli, which was crushed with ease by the praetor Apimius, B.C. 125 to 124. Ten years passed away from the death of Tiberius, and then there arose a man who knew his own mind, who accurately gauged the problems of the time, and saw that not only the social and economic difficulties of Rome, but also the question of sovereignty must be faced if the Democratic Party was to triumph. Gaius Gracchus was nine years younger than his brother Tiberius, and had been too young to aid him in his schemes, though not too young to be appointed one of the famous triumvirs of the Land Commission, that family party which had given so much offence to the Optimates. When the powers of the Commission were gradually whittled away and its judicial duties assigned to the consuls, who simply refused to discharge them, Gaius sank for a moment into obscurity. But it was not for long. Like every other young Roman of good family and active spirit, he put himself in the regular political career and sued for the quaestorship as the first step in the cursus honorum. Once started, he was bound to go far. Gaius was not a mere enthusiast and humanitarian like his brother. He was a clever, many sided, wary man who saw all the dangers of the task he was going to take in hand and faced them under the stimulus of ambition and revenge, rather than from benevolence and patriotism. We shall see that all his career was colored by these motives, a fact which accounts for the many deliberately immoral measures that are to be found in his legislation. For some years after his brother's death, he took no very prominent part in public affairs, yet he did not keep himself so secluded and obscure as Plutarch makes out. We know, for example, that he made an oration in favor of Carbo's bill concerning re-election of the tribunate, and that he spoke against the detestable law of Junius Pennus, B.C. 126, which expelled Italian residents from Rome. Gaius took the quaestorship in the year of the law of Pennus and was sent to serve in Sardinia under the proconsul Aurelius Orestes, he was kept in that unhealthy and uninteresting land for two years, as his office was prolonged for a second term, owing to the jealousy of the Senate, who were glad to keep away from the capital one who bore the dreaded name of Gracchus. Thus, as it chanced, Gaius was absent from Italy during the franchise agitation of Fulvius Flaccus and the revolt of Fregoli. This fact did not prevent the Optimates from accusing him of having had a guilty knowledge of the intentions of the rebel city. He won golden opinions for his efficient financial administration in Sardinia, as well as for his personal integrity. He was the only quaestor, as he himself said, who went out with a full purse and came back with an empty one. After returning from Sardinia in B.C. 124, Gaius stood for the tribunate for the ensuing year, 
and obtained the office without much trouble, so popular was his name among the multitude. The only effect of a bitter opposition to him started by the Optimates was that he was returned fourth on the list instead of at the head of the poll. When once launched on the sea of domestic politics, Gaius atoned by his unceasing activity for the long delay that he had made before plunging into the troubled waters. He was the most restless and eager of men. Beside him, we are told, his brother Tiberius had always appeared mild, moderate, and conciliatory. These are hardly the epithets that we should apply to the author of the confiscation of the domain land and the deposer of Octavius, but the comparison enables us to understand the terrible vehemence of his younger brother. Gaius had no moments of rest or quiet after he had once put himself forward as the friend of the people. His activity was militant and aggressive, his eloquence bitter and vituperative. He was always working himself up into the fine fury that ends in hysterics. We are told that he was aware of the fact and that when he came down to the Comitia to speak, he stationed a discreet retainer with a pitch-pipe behind him whose duty was to give a warning note whenever the oration was tending to become a screech. Unfortunately, like the Archbishop of Granada in Lesage's story, he did not invariably accept the criticism of his underling. He was always on the edge of overemphasis. First of all Romans, as we read, he strode from one end of the rostra to another while speaking, and cast his toga from off his shoulders by the vehemence of his action. His enemies compared him to Cleon, the blustering demagogue of ancient Athens. It is strange that a man of such a high-strung nature should have kept back from politics so long. His own explanation of the abstention was that he felt that he was well-nigh the last of his race, save himself and his young son. The male line of the Gracchi had died out, though his father, the consul, had left behind him no less than twelve children. Cicero used to tell the story that Gaius had sworn, after his brother's disastrous end, to hold aloof from the political life, but that his resolution was broken down by a vision. He thought, as he slept, that Tiberius stood before him and cried, why this long lingering Gaius? There is no alternative. The fates have decreed the same career for each of us, to spend our lives and meet our deaths in vindicating the rights of the Roman people. Dreams are often the reflection of the subjects on which the mind has been perpetually brooding in the waking hours, and the tale well expresses the blending of motives in the mind of Gaius. He felt that it was his duty to avenge his brother, and he was deeply stirred by seeing the Democratic Party mute and helpless for lack of a leader and a program, when he felt that he could so easily supply both these wants. Ambition and revenge were probably at the bottom of his resolve to a greater measure than he himself was aware. Whatever was the spark that kindled this eager and susceptible temperament into a flame, there can be no doubt that from the moment of his election to the tribunate, Gaius displayed the restless energy of a fanatic. He took in hand no less a scheme than the absorption into his own hands of the whole administration, foreign and domestic, of the Roman Empire. His plan was to overrule the Senate by the simple device of keeping perpetual possession of the tribunate, a thing which was now perfectly legal, owing to the law which had been passed since his brother's death. As tribune, he would bring in an unending series of laws and decrees, dealing directly with all the departments of state, so that the Senate should have no right to meddle with anything. If the sovereign people claimed and used its power to settle every detail of the governance of the empire, there would be no room for senatorial interference. Momsen has maintained that this scheme was a deliberate anticipation of the monarchy of the Caesars, and that Gaius, by proposing to hold perpetual office as the sole guide and arbiter of those at whose fiat the assembly should pass laws, was practically intending to make himself tyrant of Rome. This, however, is unfair to Gracchus, it would be more true to say that he aimed at occupying at Rome 
somewhat the same position that Pericles had once held at Athens. The Athenian had been Stratagos year after year, and had guided for half a lifetime the votes of the Ecclesia. Yet no one save comic poets called him a tyrant. He was prostates ton daemon, as the Greeks phrased it. But that is a very different thing from holding a tyranny. What Gaius Gracchus craved was much the same position, but he had not the calm wisdom of Pericles, and a man of his vehement and reckless temper was certain ere long to fall out with his supporters and wreck his career. We have said that there was a strong element of revenge among the motives which stirred up Gracchus to put himself at the head of the Democratic Party. His first two laws display it very clearly. One of them was a declaratory bill which reenacted the old constitutional principle that any magistrate who in his year of office had put to death or banished Roman citizens without a trial should be called to account before the Comitia. This measure was aimed at the consul Propilius, who, though he had not been concerned in the riot where Tiberius met his end, had subsequently seized and executed many of the reformers' partisans. The ex-magistrate recognized the intent of the law and was perfectly conscious of the flagrant illegality of what he had done ten years before and of the probability of his conviction for high treason. He fled out of Italy into exile without waiting to be indicted. His fate was well deserved, for the conduct of his party had been abominable. After the death of Tiberius, further executions had not been required, and if they had been there was no excuse for not proceeding according to proper forms of trial. But the second law of Gaius was by no means so righteous. It was aimed at the perfectly respectable and blameless tribune Octavius, who had opposed Tiberius on the question of the agrarian law and had been deposed by him in such an illegal fashion. The bill now brought forward was to the effect that any magistrate whom the Roman people had removed from office for any cause was to be for the future incapable of holding office again. This was a mere persecution, for Octavius had done nothing more than exercise a right which he undoubtedly possessed in a conscientious, if somewhat obstinate, fashion. All our authorities agree that there was no ground for believing that he had been actuated by spite or corrupt motives. It would appear that Gaius found that public opinion was not with him when he attacked Octavius, or that he grew ashamed on second thoughts of this vindictive measure. At any rate, he dropped the bill announcing that he did so in deference to the wishes of his mother Cornelia, at which, as we are told, the people showed themselves perfectly satisfied. The other legislative proposals of the first tribunate of Gaius Gracchus are of very various kinds, covering all sorts of different spheres of imperial and domestic administration. They plainly show that the vehement young tribune thought nothing too small or too great to be dealt with by the assembly, under his own superintendence as prime minister of the people. It is unfortunate that the historians on whom we have to rely for information do not enable us to make out the exact sequence in which the various laws were passed. We have to deal with them in classes rather than in strict order of time. In some ways the most important of all was a bill which, in spite of all that the advocates of Gaius can allege, appears to have been simply and solely intended to commend him to the populace as the true friend who had once and for all filled their stomachs. He proposed a lex frumentaria, which provided that corn, the tithe corn of the Sicilian cities, stored in the granaries of the state, should be sold to any citizen who applied for it at six and one-third asses per modius. Each man was allowed to buy five modii a month. In order to prevent swindling and speculation, the buyer had to visit the granary himself and receive the corn in person. Thus the bill profited the urban mob alone, since they were the only citizens who lived near enough to the fount of supply to be able to turn it to account. Now six and a third asses per modius was, as it would appear, a rate which represented about one-half the normal price of corn in the Roman market during an average year. The measure was equivalent, therefore, to the free gift of half his daily loaf to every urban voter. The proletariat thought the bill a most admirable one, 
and its author was hailed wherever he appeared as the true friend of the people. He had appealed to them in a manner which even the simplest could understand, and their gratitude reminds us of the famous cry of the Portuguese army when it saluted its commander with the shout, Long live Marshal Beresford, who takes care of our bellies. The voters of the Sabura were blameless. They knew no better when they aided their leader to carry through his most unhappy bill. But Gaius must bear a very heavy burden of reproach for this miserable bid for popularity. Not only had he devised the surest means of demoralizing the urban multitude, but he had also dealt the last death blow to Italian agriculture. More than any other single man, he was responsible for the growth of that mass of paupers asking for nothing but panem et circenses, which in a few generations was to represent the sovereign people of Rome. When once the indigent multitude had begun to expect food from the state at an artificial price, it was not likely that they would stop clamoring till they got it for nothing. The demagogues who pandered to them by continually increasing the dole were the legitimate offspring of Gaius Gracchus. The case against him is made even worse by the fact that at the same moment when he began to distribute the tithe corn at half price, he also made a great parade of reenacting his brother's agrarian law. He declared that the restoration of the old yeoman class was as dear to his heart as it had been to that of Tiberius. He restored the full powers of the land commission for the distribution of what remained of the public domains, and commenced once more to plant out farmers on small allotments. This was sheer economic lunacy, for how could farming pay in central Italy if the state entered the field as a competitor against the local agriculturalist and swamped the Roman market with corn sold at half price? If Gaius really supposed that it was any use to send forth new farmers at the moment when he was underbidding them by the institution of the corn dole, he must have been an idiot. If he set the land commission to work with a full knowledge that all its efforts must be futile, he must have been a deliberate impostor. Knowing the cleverness of the man, we are forced to conclude that the latter alternative is the nearer to the truth. He probably reenacted his brother's law for purely political reasons, not because he thought that it would have any good effect, but because it looked well in the democratic program. His real scheme for relieving the economic pressure was of quite a different kind. He intended to dispatch the ruined Italian farmers overseas to form new colonies in the provinces, where their efforts would not be sterilized by the unnatural condition of the local Roman market. This was the true way of relieving the distress of the yeoman class. They could not hold their own in Italy without protection, which it was certain that Gaius's friends in the urban multitude would never grant them. But on the fertile soil of Africa, they might do well enough. Accordingly, Gaius set his colleague the tribune Rubrius to introduce a bill for the founding of a colony on a very large scale. There were to be allotments for no less than 6,000 citizens on the deserted site of ancient Carthage. If the settlers failed to maintain themselves as agriculturalists, they would have a good second chance of succeeding as traders, for it was inevitable that some great town must grow up again at a point of the Mediterranean so central and so well suited for maritime traffic. So far, Gaius was right. Within two centuries, the restored Carthage was to be one of the greatest cities of the empire, but it was not to call Agracchus its founder. Other colonies were to be planted in Italy itself. The places chosen were Tarentum and Capua. These new settlements can never have been intended to live on agriculture. They were clearly designed to become what each of them had been in the past, great urban centers of trade. The old Capua and Tarentum had not died natural deaths. The one had come to a violent end because it had, in the hour of danger, deserted Rome during the Hannibalic War. The other, though not quite so harshly treated in a political sense, had been practically ruined by its protracted sieges and the forcible diversion of its commerce to the rival port of Brundisium. Now Capua was an open village without even a legal existence, and Tarentum a decayed fishing haven. 
but Gaius thought that there was an opening for a great market town in the midst of the Campanian plain, and for a flourishing port on the Ionian Sea. If strengthened by a draft of Roman citizens, the cities might rise again, if only from the mere convenience of their sites. For the colonial schemes of Gaius, both in Italy and in Africa, we have nothing but praise. He had hit upon the true method of relieving the misery of the proletariat, and if he had been enabled to carry out his designs, there would have been an opening provided for every citizen who was willing to work and disliked the miserable life of the dole-fed pauper. There are other laws to be placed to his credit which show that when his mind was not warped by revenge or ambition, he was a true statesman of the first rank. One was destined to complete the road system of Italy, which had grown up very much at haphazard and still left many regions practically isolated from the main arteries of communication. Admiring biographers describe to us the excellence of his roads, drawn in a straight line through the country, wonderfully built, with a bed of binding gravel below and a paved chaussee above. When a ravine was met, it was filled up with rubble. When a watercourse, it was spanned by a bridge. Leveled and brought to a perfect parallel, the high road represented a regular and even elegant prospect for mile after mile. There were pillars of stone to mark the distances and directions, and horse blocks at convenient spots to enable the traveller to mount with ease. Another law that was obviously beneficial, and had been long called for, was one for relieving the rank and file of the army from the burden of providing themselves with clothing. In the old days, when the citizen soldier spent a few months in the field, at no great distance from his home, and was disbanded at the coming of winter, the custom had been natural and reasonable. But to expect a conscript sent for six years to Spain, to keep himself clothed from his modest pay was absurd. Not only was this boon secured to the soldiery, but other laws of Gracchus mitigated the severity of conscription, securing that no man should be forced to serve before he had attained the legal age, and reducing the number of years for which he could be kept on continuous service. Less happily inspired was another bill, which seems to have given the soldiers at the wars the right to appeal against any sentence of death passed by their general. Such a provision would certainly prove detrimental to discipline. There are occasions when it is absolutely necessary that the commander should be able to punish mutiny or cowardice on the spot by the extreme penalty, and to allow an appeal against him is preposterous. As a matter of fact, the law was not always observed, there are cases known long after this time in which military executions took place on the largest scale. Crassus in the Servile War once decimated a whole cohort for gross cowardice in the field. But the most important of all the legislative enactments of Gaius Gracchus were those by which he set to work to modify the Constitution by cutting down the powers of the Senate. His chief device for this purpose was to raise up a new corporation in the state with interests which should be so different from those of the Senate that it might be trusted to act as a check on that body. It was in the equestrian order that he found the materials for this counterpoise. In early days the equites were simply the cavalry of the Roman army. Every man with the equestrian census had to serve as a horse soldier, whether he were senator, landholder, or capitalist. But by B.C. 123, the Equites had become a very anomalous body. They had practically ceased to have a military organization. The last occasion on which we hear of them taking the field as a separate corps was in the siege of Numantia. The Roman Burgess cavalry had been entirely superseded by squadrons raised from among the allies. Nor did the Equites any longer number senators in their ranks. Since B.C. 129, no senator could be a knight. The body now consisted of those men of wealth who had not been called up to sit in the Senate. It was heterogeneous, containing two very different classes of members. The more reputable half of it comprised the larger landowners of non-senatorial rank throughout Roman Italy. The other half was composed of the great capitalists, merchants, and contractors of the city. The urban and the rural knights had few common privileges or functions. The only occasions when they had occasion to meet was when the censor 
called them up to his quinquennial review or when the equestrian centuries had to give their votes in the Comitia Cantoriata. They had very little cohesion or esprit de corps. Gaius resolved to make this wealthy but ill-compacted class into a corporation with common honorary rights and practical advantages. The part of it with which he had mainly to deal was the capitalist class in the city, for just as the urban proletariat, being always on the spot, came to style itself the Roman people, so the speculators and contractors of the capital came to speak of themselves as if they were the whole equestrian body. The most important of the laws by which Gracchus designed to sow discord between the Senate and the Equites was that by which the control of the law courts was transferred from the one to the other body. Hitherto senators alone were placed upon the album Uticum and allowed to serve as jurymen. The results had been discreditable of late years, and in particular the provincials complained that a senatorial jury would never convict a defaulting governor for embezzlement and oppression. There had been a particularly bad case of the sort just before Gaius received the tribunate. Manlius Aquilius, governor of Asia, had been acquitted in spite of the fact that the provincials proved against him a number of scandalous acts of misgovernment. His acquittal had been secured by wholesale bribery, and the decision had been so iniquitous that the reputation of senatorial juries had sunk to a very low ebb. It was easy, therefore, to attack them on high moral grounds, and Gaius's talent for vituperative eloquence had free scope. His line of argument may be guessed from a fragment of one of his speeches against the Senate which has survived. No senator troubles himself about public affairs for nothing, he observed, and in the case before us, an arbitration concerning territories in Asia Minor, the honorable gentlemen may be divided into three classes. Those who voted I have been bribed by one claimant, those who voted no by the other, and those who did not vote at all by both. And these last are the most cunning of all, for they have persuaded each party that they abstained in his interest, saying that if they had voted at all they must have done so for the other side. The senatorial juries had undoubtedly been most unsatisfactory, but the equestrian juries which Gaius substituted for them were even worse. There is no reason to believe that the tribune was unaware of this fact, for in reference to this law he is recorded to have remarked that he had cast daggers into the forum with which the two orders should lacerate each other. Clearly his purpose was to brew mischief for the benefit of the Senate rather than to secure any advantage for the citizens or the provincials. To put the control of the law courts into the hands of the urban knights, for the rural knights did not count, had the worst possible effect. The typical equus was a good deal more of a money-lender, speculator, and financial agent than of a mere merchant. His interests were as much opposed to those of the provincials as they were to those of the Senate. His main wish was to exploit the empire for the benefit of his own class. It is difficult to construct any parallel for modern times which can bring home to the reader the exact meaning of the surrender of justice into the hands of the equites. Some faint adumbration of the results may be realized by imagining what might happen in England if all juries had to be chosen exclusively from members of the stock exchange. Whenever any financial question might be in dispute, there would be a tendency, even in honest men, to decide in favor of their own class interests. The Roman publicanus was little influenced either by delicacy or by regard for public opinion. The result of giving him judicial omnipotence was merely that he abused it for his own interest, rather more than his senatorial predecessors had done. The equite, says Appian, soon adopted the senator's system of bribery, and no sooner had they experienced the pleasures of unlimited gains than they proceeded to strive after them far more shamelessly than had ever been done before. They used to set up suborned accusers against the senators. They not merely tyrannized over them in the law courts, but openly insulted them. The old grievance had been that bad provincial governors escaped punishment for their misdeeds, owing to the misplaced tenderness of their friends on the jury. 
the new grievance was that any one who did not play into the hands of the equites and grant them whatever they asked was prosecuted and condemned however blameless his conduct might have been it took some years for the system of blackmailing to reach its perfection but what it grew to may be judged from the case of rutilius rufus this virtuous administrator had set himself to protect the provincials of Asia from the extortions of the publicani. He came home bringing with him the blessings of the whole land, but on his return the financiers had him accused of all things in the world of embezzlement and extortion. He was promptly condemned, though he brought representatives of every class of the provincials to bear witness that he was the best friend they had ever known and retired to live in honoured exile among the very people whom he was supposed to have oppressed. End of section 4section five of seven roman statesmen of the later republic by charles omen this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami chapter three gaius gracchus part two doubtless gaius did not foresee the full harvest of scandals which was destined to spring up from his treatment of the law courts but he must have known that he was putting power into the hands of a class that could not be trusted for the results therefore he must take the responsibility meanwhile he obtained the immediate profit that he desired the equites supported the tribune when votes were required and received from him in return whatever they wished how harmful to the state were these things which they wished may be seen from the case of the asiatic taxes since their annexation in b c one thirty three or rather since their rescue from the hands of the rebel aristonicus in b c one twenty nine the cities of asia had been paying to rome a fixed tribute of moderate amount but the knights loved the system of tax farming and suggested to gaius that it might be introduced into this wealthiest of all the provinces he consented and by his law de provincia asia cancoribus locanda instituted a most detestable form of it not only was the tithe system imposed on asia and the administration of it farmed out but it was ordained that the bidding for the tithes should take place before the censors at rome not at pergamus or ephesus and that the whole revenue of the province should be contracted for en bloc the object of this strange arrangement was that provincial competition for the contracts might be excluded firstly by the fact that the auction was held in italy and secondly by the enormous capital required for only a syndicate of roman millionaires could afford to contemplate the tremendous sums that had to be dealt with when the land revenues of the whole of the two hundred cities of asia were handled in a single contract by means of gaius's law the old kingdom of pergamus the last region of the hellenic east which had preserved its prosperity was reduced in a single generation to a deplorable state of misery the best commentary on the new system of government is that when in the year b c eighty eight a foreign enemy entered asia the whole countryside rose like one man in his favour and massacred in a single day the eighty thousand roman traders officials and tax collectors who dwelt among them the great tribune was re-elected for a second term of office without any difficulty and his work in b c one twenty two was a continuation of that of the previous twelve months several of the laws of which we have already spoken only came to full fruition in the latter year gaius was now thoroughly well established in power as the people's prime minister he was commencing to add a whole bundle of standing offices to his main title of tribune being triumvir on the agrarian board chief commissioner of roads and official superintendent of the new colonies that were to be founded plutarch speaking in a somewhat exaggerated strain asserts that he was occupying a quasi-royal position that he had monarchicae tis iscus but he forgets to point out that he was destitute of one most important element of power he had no regular armed force at his back only the fickle bands of the urban multitude 
the Roman constitution, as time was to show, could only be overthrown by an imperator with legions at his heels. The orator, who had but his ready tongue and his chance mob of partisans, was really unequal to the task of upsetting the old regime. But meanwhile his power and activity were very terrifying to the Senate. Those who most feared the man were struck with his amazing industry and the faculty with which he dispatched the most diverse kinds of business. He lived in the centre of a sort of court, frequented equally by foreign ambassadors, architects, engineers, military men, and philosophers. He had business with all these classes, receiving them all with urbanity, and surprised them all by his interest in and mastery of their various provinces of knowledge. It was easy for his enemies to say that there was a royal court already established in Rome, with nothing wanting save the diadem. During his second tribunate, Gaius was engaged both in completing his legislation in behalf of the Equites and in developing his great colonial schemes, especially that for the establishment of the new city that was to be called Junonia on the site of Carthage. But he was also launching out on to the development of another item of the democratic program. He wished to carry out that liberal extension of the citizenship to the Italian allies, which had been growing more and more of a necessity during the last fifty years. Tiberius Gracchus, if we may trust Velius, had broached the idea in B.C. 133. Fulvius Flaccus had certainly brought it to the front in B.C. 125, with no result save the unfortunate revolt of Fregelli but Gaius had much more favourable opportunities than either his brother or Flaccus, for he had secured a much more complete control over the Comitia than either of them had ever possessed. The project was one which was eminently deserving of support. In former days the Roman people had been fairly generous with the franchise. Not only had all the Latin and Etruscan districts around the city been granted the full citizenship, one after another, but there were ways provided in which individual members of allied states further afield might become incorporated in the body of Roman burgesses. But this wise liberality had gradually gone out of fashion. Just as Roman citizenship grew more and more valuable, owing to the ever-increasing profits of empire, it became more and more difficult to obtain. No new territory in Latium or Etruria had been taken into the state boundaries since B.C. 188, and it was growing much harder for the individual citizen of an allied community to slip into the Burgess body. The fact was that the Romans in ancient days, when fighting for existence, had been eager to strengthen themselves by multiplying their numbers. Now that they had acquired an empire, they were less eager to share their advantages with others. The knowledge that discontent at their niggardliness was ever growing more lively among the Italian states had not yet begun to alarm the ordinary Roman, whether optimate or democrat. The city rabble were just as unconcerned about it as the most purblind reactionary in the Senate. Gaius Gracchus, therefore, had to convert his own party to the policy of liberal treatment for the Allies. It was true that his brother may have advocated their cause, and that others among the leaders of the party, notably the energetic but unstable Fulvius Flaccus, were convinced of its righteousness. But the weapon with which Gaius had to win his victories was the urban multitude, the one constant element in the composition of the Comitia. He thought that he could carry it with him, even when he was advocating measures which were not directly and obviously profitable to itself. Indeed, he imagined that he had bought it forever, belly and soul, by the gift of the corn dole. He was so far right that a great portion of the populace was ready to stick to him through thick and thin, and to vote for whatever bill he might choose to bring forward. Unfortunately for himself and for Rome, he was to discover that the whole body was not so loyal, and that men who could be bribed once to vote for the democratic side might be influenced on another occasion by equally corrupt inducements held out by the enemy. Gaius was always styling the urban multitude the people. He was destined to find that it might be truer to call them the rabble. 
the very moderate and statesmanlike form in which gaius proposed to deal with the franchise question was to bestow the full citizenship on the latins and the rights hitherto held by the latins on the remainder of the italian allies the latins now represented not the old thirty cities of the latin league which had long been taken into the roman state but the numerous colonies with latin rights that is the jus canubii and jus cumercii which were scattered all over italy they only wanted the power to vote in the comitia to make them full citizens the practical as opposed to the political advantages of the status were already in their possession on the other hand the main body of the italian allies were to receive the commercial and civil privileges hitherto confined to the latins but were not to be introduced into the tribes or permitted to swamp the public assembly by their enormous numbers no doubt gaius contemplated the arrival of the day when they too might become romans but he had no wish to hurry matters and intended to bring about the complete romanization of italy by gradual emancipation only after a longer or shorter training as latins would the multitudes of central and southern italy be permitted to obtain the full franchise all this was prudent moderate and far-sighted but unfortunately there was little in the scheme to rouse enthusiasm among the more sordid members of the democratic party the mass of demoralized urban voters who formed the habitual majority in ordinary meetings of the comitia in their ignorant selfishness they looked upon the matter from a very narrow point of view the individual roman citizen they thought would suffer if the number of his equals were increased there would be more hands among which the bribes of the would-be consul and praetor and the public distribution of money and food made by the state would have to be divided the consul fanius though he had been elected by the assistance of gracchus himself led the opposition he put the question in a nutshell when he asked the multitude whether they had reflected that by passing such a bill they would soon have the latins elbowing them out of their places in the comitia crowding them out of the circus and theatre and eating up their corn this sordid and cynical appeal went to the heart of the plebeians and the majority of them soon showed that they were ready to refuse support in this matter to the leader who vainly believed that he had purchased their perpetual allegiance while the franchise question was still in an early stage a new figure appeared upon the scene to the great perplexity of gracchus this was a certain marcus livius drusus a tribune of whom little had hitherto been known he did not attempt to resist gaius by the method of mere stolid opposition which octavius had used ten years before against the reformer's elder brother his plan was one which had often been tried in greek politics the counter demagogue had been a well-known figure at athens though he was as yet unfamiliar at rome drusus professed to be even more devoted to the people than his colleague and to be ready to go yet farther in the paths of innovation only on two questions that of the founding of colonies beyond the sea and that of granting the franchise to the italians did he profess to differ from him of both these measures he disapproved but he had his own substitutes ready both for propitiating his allies and for providing land for the would-be colonists with the object then of showing that he was a truer and more liberal friend of the people than gaius himself livius drusus announced his intention of bringing forward a whole series of popular measures perhaps the most prominent of these was a huge scheme for colonization inside italy instead of choosing only two places with particularly favorable sites as gracchus had done he announced that he would establish no less than twelve colonies in the peninsula each of them to hold no less than three thousand citizens the scheme was wholly impractical for these were to be agricultural and not trading centers and agriculture as we have already seen was ruined beyond redemption but the populace had not yet grasped the fact and the plan seemed to them far more attractive than anything that gaius had proposed equally popular and equally futile was another bill which was to turn all the farms which had already been distributed by the land commissions into the private property of their occupiers tiberius gracchus had made a great point of imposing a rent upon them 
in order to remind the farmers that they were the tenants of the state and not full freeholders. He had also prohibited them from selling their land, for he had feared that they would be prone to dispose of their holdings at the first bad season if they were given the chance, so that the latifundia would in a short time be reconstituted. It is probable that ten years of unprofitable farming had already disgusted great numbers of the settlers of B.C. 133 and 132, that they were now wishing to throw up the holdings for which they had once clamored so loudly. At any rate, there is no doubt that Drusus's proposal to make the land alienable and to abolish the modest rent imposed by Tiberius acquired a certain cheap popularity. There were other bills brought forward at the same time, of which we have no accurate details. One was intended to propitiate the Allies for being refused the franchise. It provided that Latin soldiers should no longer be liable to the punishment of scourging by Roman officers, and probably their status in other ways was to be brought nearer to that of their comrades who possessed the full citizenship. In proposing each of his laws, Drusus took great care to point out to the people that he was acting with the full consent and approbation of the Senate. He wished to produce the impression that popular legislation could be procured from other sources than the Democratic Party and succeeded in his aim. The majority of the urban multitude were too stupid to see that when the competition was ended by the removal or death of Gracchus, their noble friends would relapse into their former state of apathy as to the needs of the people. It has been suggested by some historians that Drusus was not a deliberate charlatan playing a part, but a real though misguided enthusiast, who was unconsciously made the tool of the Senate. It has been pointed out that several of the laws which he proposed in B.C. 122 were reintroduced a generation later by his son, who was a genuine Democrat of the most enthusiastic sort, and it is suggested that the elder Drusus believed in his own panacea and passed it on as a sacred secret to his son and heir. But on the whole it is safer to believe the Roman historians when they tell us that the colleague of Gracchus was well aware of what he was doing and had no more worthy aim than to undermine his rival's position by outbidding him in the market of popular favor. The waning power of Gaius over the multitude was shown most clearly by the fate of his bill for the enfranchisement of the Latins. When it was brought forward, Drusus announced that he should veto it. There was no explosion of popular wrath, for the fact was that the majority of the multitude were apathetic on the point, or even held that the good things of empire had better be distributed among a few than among many Roman citizens. Gaius saw no opportunity of assailing his colleague. He made no attempt to demolish him, as his brother of old had demolished Octavius. Public feeling would have been against him if he had tried. Instead of starting a furious agitation on behalf of the Italians, as his friend and colleague Fulvius Flaccus proposed, he went off to Africa to superintend the foundation of his new colony of Junonia. Thus the Democratic Party in the city was left in the temporary charge of Flaccus. This was unfortunate, for the ex-consul was a man equally devoid of tact and of prudence, and prone to plunge into profitless violence when freed from the restraints imposed by his more statesmanlike friend. Gaius probably supposed that nothing would commend him more surely to the people than the sight of the new Carthaginian colony inaugurated with all possible pomp and splendor, and flourishing from the first, as it was bound to do if only it obtained a fair start. He marked out the site on an even larger scale than the Rubrian law had named, and made a great parade of assembling colonists from all over Italy, apparently permitting Latins as well as Romans to send in their names. All the proper ceremonies were carried out, the flag was planted, the furrow driven round an enormous space of ground, and the boundary stones set up. When, however, Gracchus returned from Africa to Rome, he found that his demonstration had completely missed fire. The most absurd rumors had been put about by his opponents. A legend had cropped up that Scipio had solemnly cursed the site of Carthage when he captured it in B.C. 146, and that nothing could prosper on such unlucky ground. 
it was said that a gale had torn down the standard which gracchus had erected a fact quite possible in itself but rendered less likely by the additional garnishment of the story which said that the boundary stones of the new colony had been dug up at night by wolves if wolves there were they must clearly have been two-legged roman wolves of the optimate breed nevertheless these silly tales seem to have had their effect and to have loosened the hold of gaius on the comitia when the tribunitial elections came on and he stood for the third time he failed to be chosen it is said that he had really a majority of votes but that drusus or some other tribune who presided at the poll made a fraudulent and unjust return that such a thing should have been possible shows that at least the suffrages of the people must have been much divided for if gaius had possessed his former ascendancy no one would have dared juggle with the votes gracchus was appalled with this misadventure he bore the disappointment with great impatience and when he saw his adversaries laughing told them with an air of insolence that they should soon be laughing on the wrong side of their mouths meanwhile he had only a short time left in which the invaluable tribunitial position was still his own on the tenth of december b c one twenty two he would become a private person again and would not only lose his power of legislation but become liable to prosecution for any illegal acts which his enemies might choose to allege against him the last months of his office seem to have been spent in a bitter personal struggle with drusus each produced strings of popular laws to tempt the appetite of the people and gaius had the disappointment of seeing himself outbid by a rival whose main advantage was that he was prepared to bring forward projects possible or impossible with no thought of the consequences as a good greek scholar gracchus must have recognized that he had fallen into the unenviable position of cleon and the knights of aristophanes his stewardship was about to be taken from him and he would soon be obliged to give an account of all his doings at last the fatal day came round and gaius ceased to be the sacrosanct representative of the roman people and became once more a private citizen it is probable that even if he had kept quiet his adversaries would now have found some excuse for falling upon him like his brother tiberius twelve years before he had made too many enemies but he did not give them the opportunity of leaving him alone within a few days of the coming of the new year b c one twenty one he was engaged in bitter civil strife with them for he had still plenty of partisans at his back the better men of the democratic party still believed in him and among the multitude there were many whose profound hatred of the senate and all its works had led them to distrust the gifts of drusus most important of all there was a lively agitation outside rome the latins were bitterly vexed that the citizenship which had been dangled before them for the second time had now been again withdrawn from their reach their old friend fulvius flaccus got into communication with them and assured them that he had not forgotten them and still hoped to defend their cause but organization was needed to bring their forces to bear and of organizing power there seems to have been little or none on the democratic side the moment that the new magistrates of b c one twenty one were installed in office an effort was made by the optimates to rescind as much as they dared of the gracchan legislation the equites were too strong to be lightly meddled with and the laws passed in their favour were left alone it was still necessary to keep the urban multitude divided so no attempt was made to touch the corn dole any hint of such a design would have thrown the whole mass back into the arms of gracchus it was accordingly against the colonial scheme that the optimates opened their batteries formal representations were made to the augurs that the omens at the foundation of junonia had been unfavourable and all the stories about the gale the broken flagstaff and the uprooted boundary stones were brought forward the augurs made the reply that was required the auspices of junonia had been most unfavourable and clearly showed the anger of the gods at the unhallowed attempt to build upon the cursed soil accordingly the consul opimius who assumed the lead in all the proceedings against gracchus 
took the opinion of the senate on the question whether it would not be right to annul the rubrian law and disestablish the new colony the fathers fell in with his design and granted him an auctoritas for the introduction of an act of repeal it was accordingly brought before the people by the tribune marcus minucius this brought gaius to the front the scheme for transmarine colonization was very dear to him in it as he believed lay the true remedy for the economic distress of the roman people when gracchus and fulvius flaccus says appian discerned that their great project was to be thwarted they became like madmen and ran about declaring that all the stories about the evil omens were lies invented by the senate they announced their intention of opposing the act of repeal by every means in their power and began when it was too late to organize their partisans for the fray this was precisely what their enemies had hoped if they could be goaded into any act of violence they could be accused of treason and doomed to suffer the same lot that had fallen on tiberius gracchus and his followers twelve years before neither party made any attempt to disguise their intention of using force if it should become necessary the optimates secretly armed their clients and slaves on the other hand flaccus sent the word round rural italy that strong arms were needed at rome it is said that hundreds of his partisans disguised as laborers came up to the city on the day when the bill was to be brought forward and that there were more allies than citizens among these able-bodied visitors gaius appears to have disliked this open appeal to violence he felt that the democrats would be putting themselves in the wrong if they began the fray and seems to have discouraged his followers by his fervid appeals to them not to take the offensive but the die was cast the more enthusiastic democrats were determined to fight and came down to the assembly armed with daggers and staves as if a conflict was absolutely certain they were so far right and their leader was so far wrong that in the present strained situation of affairs there was no hope of a peaceful issue on the day of voting the optimates and the democrats faced each other more like two armies than two orderly political factions on each side the lethal weapons were barely disguised beneath the broad folds of the togas the only doubt was whether the enemies or the partisans of gracchus would strike the first blow as a matter of fact the democrats put themselves in the wrong by opening the battle by a wanton murder the consul opimius had opened the proceedings by the usual sacrifice in the porch of the capitoline temple when he had done one of his servants a certain quintus antullius who was carrying away the entrails of the victim rudely pushed through the front rank of the democrats crying stand off ye bad citizens and make way for honest men it is said that he emphasized his insulting words by making a gesture of contempt in the very face of gracchus at this gaius gave him a fierce look whereupon an overzealous follower stepped forward and stabbed the man through and through with a dagger antullius fell dead between the two parties with the sacred entrails still in his hand prepared for strife as all those present had been they were yet shocked by this sacrilegious murder no malay followed but the enemies stood gazing upon each other and no one dared to strike a second blow at this moment a sudden thunderstorm burst over the capital and awed by the manifest wrath of jupiter the whole armed multitude melted homeward in the drenching rain the day ended without the expected battle but blood had been shed and the optimates were able to cast the responsibility for the commencement of civil strife upon their adversaries it is certain that if antullius had been left alone the contest would merely have broken out a few minutes later for both crowds were bent on mischief and the most trivial incident would have sufficed to set them by the ears morally speaking the guilt may be equally divided between them for each had come down prepared to fight and if the democrats had not struck the first blow the optimates would have done so a little later both the consul opimius and the headstrong fulvius flaccus had deliberately got ready for battle and whatever may have been the private feelings of gaius 
it is certain that he came down armed to support his friends. His admirers have alleged that he was precipitated into civil war against his will. His detractors have quite as much to say, for their view, when they assert that he lost his opportunity for carrying out a coup d'etat because a reckless fool struck too soon and placed his whole party at a moral disadvantage. There can be no doubt that the dagger thrust dealt by this overzealous Democrat ruined his party. It was to little purpose that Gaius went down to the Forum the same afternoon and tried to explain away what had happened as a deplorable accident for which he was not responsible. Many who might otherwise have supported him had been profoundly shocked, and it is impossible for the man who has placed himself at the head of an armed mob to disavow any connection with its atrocities. Just as Robert Emmett was responsible for the murder of Lord Kilwarden, though he may not himself have thrust a pike into the old judge, so was Gaius Gracchus responsible for the murder of Antullius. It is useless in such cases to plead blameless character and patriotic intentions. Moreover, the friends of Gaius did not even take the trouble to excuse themselves. Fulvius Flaccus, when the assembly had broken up, called together a mob of his supporters, harangued them, and armed them with a store of weapons which lay in his house, for he possessed a complete arsenal of Gallic broadswords and lances, the trophies of his successful campaign of B.C. 125. He and his reckless satellites passed the night in noise, riot, and carousing. The ex-consul himself, it is said, was the first man drunk, and in his cups uttered many obiter dicta, most unbecoming in one who was about to plunge the city into war next morning. The behavior of Gaius was very different. He burst into tears on leaving the forum and shut himself up in his room, gloomily pondering over the end to which two years of civic power had brought him. But though he did not commit himself to any overt course of action, a great mob of his partisans gathered round his house, and encamped about it all night. Another mass collected in the capital before dawn to occupy the points of vantage for the struggle, which was expected to break out in the morning. Meanwhile, Opimius and the other foes of the Democratic Party had been making much more practical preparations. The consul had ordered every senator and every knight of the Optimate Party to provide two fully armed men, he had taken command of a body of Cretan mercenaries who chanced to be passing through the city, and had ordered a general muster of the clients and retainers of his friends. They were a formidable band, and with the magistrates at their head, they had the inestimable advantage of appearing to represent law and order. Protected by this mass of special constables, the Senate met next morning, the consul began to lay before them the desperate state of affairs and the necessity for outlawing the democratic leaders. At this moment, by a preconcerted arrangement, the beer of Antullius, followed by his mourning friends, was borne past the doors of the Senate House. The fathers rushed out and burst forth into exaggerated demonstrations of horror and sympathy. Then, flocking back to their seats, they passed the Senatus Consultum Ultimum, which empowered the consuls in the usual terms to take care that the Republic might receive no harm. Rome was thus put under martial law, and as a last formality, messengers were sent to Gracchus and to Fulvius Flaccus, bidding them repair in person to the Curia in order to give an account of their doings. Frightened at the great armed force around the Senate House, the Democrats had begun to concentrate on the Aventine. They were almost destitute of guidance, for Gaius was sunk in a melancholy apathy, and Flaccus was barely recovered from the effects of last night's debauch. It was with difficulty that he could be roused at all that morning. The only intention displayed was to stand at bay on the old plebeian stronghold. No offensive action seems even to have been contemplated. But the temple of Diana and the neighboring streets were barricaded, and emissaries ran round the city calling the multitude to arms, and even promising freedom to any slaves who should join them. 
this last anarchic proposal must have disposed of any chance that Gaius might gain support among his old allies of the equestrian order. The very name of a slave rising was enough to make an optimate of every man of independent means. It was probably the perception of the fact that the number of their partisans on the Aventine was much smaller than they had expected, which led the democratic leaders to negotiate before opening hostilities. When they received the message from the Senate which bade them come down and justify their actions, Gaius, it is said, seriously proposed to take his life in his hands and obey the summons. But Flaccus objected to put himself in the power of the enemy. He would only consent to send his son Quintus with a reply, in which the garrison of the Aventine offered to lay down its arms and disperse if a complete amnesty was offered to every citizen, small or great. It is said that many of the senators were not indisposed to accept these terms. Except to fanatics, anything is better than civil war. But Opimius carried a majority with him when he declared that traitors could not send ambassadors, but should come in person to surrender themselves to justice before they sued for mercy. The young Flaccus was sent back to his father and told not to come again unless he brought with him an offer of unconditional surrender. After some futile debating between the leaders of the Democrats, the proposal to capitulate without terms was negatived, and the son of Flaccus was once more dispatched to the Senate with a second set of offers. Opimius told him that he had been warned not to return, and that he had forfeited any claims to be considered an ambassador. He cast the young man into prison and ordered his armed bands to converge upon the Aventine. Then he published a notice that any one who laid down his arms before fighting began should be granted an amnesty, but that Gracchus and Fulvius were public enemies, and that whoever brought their heads to the consuls should be paid for them their actual weight in gold. The rumor of this proclamation and the sight of the optimate bands working upwards among the streets that led to the summit of the Aventine was too much for the resolution of most of the Democrats a great many slunk off to their houses while yet it was time. But enough remained to defend the barricades, and for some little space there was sharp fighting between the two parties. But the Cretan archers so galled the Democrats that ere long they gave back from their position, and the assailants stormed the hilltop and burst in among them. Then followed a massacre. No less than three thousand persons are said to have been slain and their bodies cast into the Tiber. Fulvius Flaccus and his elder son Marcus hid themselves in the house of a client, but when their pursuers threatened to burn down the whole street unless they were given up, an informer was promptly forthcoming. They were beheaded on the spot without form of trial. Gaius Gracchus was not found upon the Aventine. No one had seen him during the fighting. He had shut himself up in the temple of Diana and proposed to commit suicide when the barricades were forced. But two of his friends, the knights Pomponius and Litorius took his dagger from him and persuaded him to fly before it was yet too late. There was still a way of escape by the Porta Trigemina and the Sublician Bridge. Before leaving the temple, Gaius is said to have fallen upon his knees and with upraised hands to have prayed to the goddess that the people of Rome for their ingratitude and base desertion of their friend might be slaves forever. If the story is true, it well explains the mood of sullen despair which had lain heavy on his heart for the last twenty-four hours. He had pushed things to extremity, and then his party had melted away from him. All his plans, as he now saw, had been futile from the first, because he had mistaken the urban rabble of today for the ancient citizens of Rome. Gaius and his two friends were sighted by some of the victorious optimates as they fled down toward the Tiber, they made what speed they could, but the reformer presently stumbled and fell, spraining his ankle so that he could no longer move with ease. By the river gate the pursuers were nearing them. Thereupon Pomponius bravely turned to bay and held the back for a moment at the cost of his life. Litorius did as much on the Sublician bridge, and by their sacrifice Gaius, now accompanied only by a single slave, reached the suburb under the geniculum beyond the water. As he hobbled on, supported by his retainer, the streets were full of idle spectators who shouted to him to run his best as if he were a competitor in the circus. 
but no one gave him the least assistance though he kept calling for a horse as he went before the optimates came up he had got beyond the last houses and reached the grove of farina just outside the city he was seen to enter it but when the pursuers burst in after him they found both him and his companion lying dead at his master's orders the slave had stabbed him to the heart and had then turned his weapon against himself the head of the reformer was cut off and carried to the consul his body was cast into the tiber opimius carried out his promise and gave the bearer of the head its weight in gold seventeen pounds eight ounces as tradition recorded thus miserably ended the career of the younger gracchus a man who both as a politician and as an individual was strangely compacted of strength and weakness clearly he was no single-minded enthusiast like his brother he had studied statecraft and had learnt not to be over-scrupulous in his methods if indeed he was set on regenerating the people of rome he chose the strangest allies and employed the most doubtful means he must have been perfectly well aware of what he was doing when he purchased the support of the urban rabble by the gift of the corn dole and that of the greedy equites by surrendering to them the unhappy province of asia when the means are so obviously immoral one is driven into doubting the purity of the end which they are intended to subserve was gracchus really set on saving rome from the economic and constitutional perils which were sapping her strength or was he rather an ambitious politician yearning for power at all costs and eager to revenge on the senate his brother's death it is easy to read his career in either light yet each reading must be full of contradictions if we hold with Momsen that gaius was deliberately trying to make himself tyrant of rome we can easily understand all the less worthy episodes of his career the man with such an idea in his head would not have shrunk from using unworthy tools or practising any sort of political charlatanry to purchase the aid of the rabble or the knights by bribes to flatter the hopes of the italians who desired the franchise would be appropriate moves for one who aimed at repeating the career of cypselus or pisistratus but this theory leaves unexplained the reluctance which gaius manifested at the end to engage in actual civil war the want of energy which he displayed in organizing his party for the final conflict and the melancholy apathy which he showed during the last twenty-four hours of his life if he had really aimed at supreme power such conduct could be explained by physical cowardice alone and of that not even his enemies dared to accuse him a would-be tyrant would have armed and organized bravos have attacked the senate instead of assuming the defensive and have thrown himself into the battle with frantic energy all the doings of gaius on the other hand are those of a man forced into violence against his will and obviously doubting whether death was not preferable to the guilt of stirring up civil war they are not the acts of one who wishes to grasp at supreme power and cares not how it is attained on the other hand as we have already seen it is still more impossible to explain his career by representing him as a single-hearted friend of the people who thought nothing of himself and only aimed at regenerating the roman state ambition revenge the reckless use of unworthy methods are too easily discernible in many of his actions probably the true way of reconciling the contradictions of the life of gaius is to realize that though he possessed many of the instincts of the tyrant and the demagogue there was also latent in him much of the ancient roman civic virtue he loved to rule he was unscrupulous in his methods he hated fiercely the optimates and all their works but at the same time he had a genuine wish to serve the state he showed it by persisting in his schemes for transmarine colonization and the enfranchisement of the italians long after they had become unpopular a mere self-seeker would have dropped them the moment that he was certain that they failed to please the rabble of the comitia when at last he found himself borne on irresistibly toward civil war gaius was deeply grieved he faced it with reluctance and finally had it thrust upon him against his will by the reckless folly of his subordinates the responsibility no doubt must ultimately rest upon his shoulders he might have retired to bide his time instead of fighting but to do so was almost impossible 
he was surrounded by excited partisans whom he could not control and if he had gone back he would have seemed to be betraying them to his and their enemies the outburst of actual war and the reformers dreadful end were melancholy but inevitable end of section five Section 6 of Seven Roman Statesmen of the Later Republic by Charles Oman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 4 From the Gracchi to Sulla, BC 121 to 88. Part 1. Gaius Gracchus was a striking example of the truth of the melancholy adage that the evil that men do lives after them, the good is oft interred with their bones for among all the many measures that he brought before the roman people precisely those which were evil in their tendencies survived him while those wherein lay the seeds of good were thrust aside and ignored for another generation the corn dole which he had invented proved so popular that the victorious optimates dared not meddle with it it remained as a permanent curse pauperizing and demoralizing the city multitude and ruining what was left of italian agriculture the new equestrian jury courts sold justice so shamelessly for the next thirty years that men began at last to talk of the period when the senators had been judges as the good old times the asiatic tithe farming went on and gradually ruined that fine province besides provoking therein such a virulent hatred of rome that as we have already pointed out when the asiatics got their first chance of revolt in the days of king mithridates they rose like one man and massacred eighty thousand roman citizens in a single day but the two really valuable remedies for the ills of the state which gracchus had advocated were thrust aside if not forgotten transmarine colonization was stopped and the new settlement at carthage was destroyed the Italians were commanded to give up all idea of obtaining the franchise. Indeed, special care was taken to close the various avenues by which individuals had hitherto found it possible to slip into the citizen body. As to the agrarian law which Tiberius had framed and Gaius had reenacted, the Senate did not formally repeal it, nor did they give back the confiscated land to the possessores. They simply removed, one by one, the Gracchan checks on the economic tendency of the times and allow the new farmers to die out by slow extinction livius drusus it will be remembered had made the Gracchan allotments alienable and abolished the ground rent due from them even before gaius fell in b c one nineteen a law was passed which dissolved the land commission so that no further distribution could be made it also provided that such domain land as still remained in the hands of the original possessores should be secured to them on condition of their paying a small rent which was to be employed in subsidizing the ever-growing needs of the corn dole lastly in b c one eleven a third law was passed which removed this rent and made the land into the freehold private property of the occupiers the moment that they got the opportunity of alienating their farms under the law of drusus the gracchan holders began to dispose of them agriculture did not and could not pay political economy exerted its iron law and the allotments were sold for what they would fetch to the nearest capitalist the latifundia once more commenced to grow and the decrease in the number of small landowners is marked from b c one eighteen onward by the regular shrinkage of the census returns by the end of the century it is probable that the whole effect of the gracchan redistribution of land had passed away only a few years later it was said doubtless with gross exaggeration that the larger part of the land of roman italy was in the hands of no more than two thousand proprietors meanwhile it must be remembered that the senate never thoroughly recovered that undisputed control of all the machinery of the state which it had possessed in the old days before the appearance of the gracchi it never dared to strike at the equestrian order which remained as a permanent check on its omnipotence even when the abuse of the law courts by the knights had grown into a perfect scandal 
the senate refused to commit itself to an attack upon such a powerful body of enemies apparently the leading optimates lived in a state of constant apprehension that a new gracchus might at any moment arise to dispute their authority and wished to do no more than to avoid friction and hang on to the emoluments of power they managed by a policy of short-sighted opportunism to maintain their ascendancy from year to year till at last after a considerable interval the democratic party again found leaders and a programme and civic strife recommenced from the death of gaius gracchus in b c one twenty one down to the appearance of marius on the political stage in b c one o six the democratic programme lay dormant the history of the time turns mainly on questions of foreign policy and it was by their incompetent management of those questions that the optimates finally gave their adversaries a chance of raising their heads it was not an age of peace all through these years the people were muttering and murmuring occasionally there were riots or an unpopular magistrate was impeached or a law backed by the senate was rejected by the comitia but there was no continuous agitation for any definite political end nor did any leader succeed in rallying the democratic faction for a new attack on the senate as the constitution then stood a single omnipotent leader provided with the tribunate or some other important magistracy was needed to galvanize the sovereign people into activity it could only put forth its strength if guided by an autocratic chief using the one-man power which a democracy really loves and the chief was long in coming meanwhile the main thread of the annals of rome consists of the history of two long foreign wars both grossly mismanaged by the senate at home and by the incapable oligarchs who were sent out to bear rule in the provinces these were the lingering jugurthine troubles b c one seventeen to one o five and the dangerous cimbrian war b c one thirteen to one o one it is unfortunate that while we possess an elaborate if not altogether trustworthy narrative of the african affair in sallust's jugurtha the story of the far more important cimbrian campaigns has to be gathered from imperfect notes in plutarch appian and the epitome of livy it was in consequence of the jugurthine war that the democrats first began to raise their heads again the facts of the senate's maladministration were sufficiently disgraceful the king of a not very powerful subject state had broken all his treaties slain off the cousins whom the senate had made his colleagues and done whatever he pleased in africa without paying the least attention to the commands of the suzerain power when embassies of remonstrance were sent him he had merely quieted the envoys by judicious bribes combined with lavish promises of submission he carried on this shameless policy for five years from 117 b c to 112 and might have persisted even longer in it if he had not let the savage break out in him at an inauspicious moment when he crushed his last surviving cousin by the capture of Cirta in b c 112 he massacred not only the numidian garrison but a great number of roman and italian residents in the place this atrocity so much aroused the anger of the roman people that the senate was forced to declare war on jugurtha it was abominably mismanaged of the two imbecile generals to whom the subjection of numidia was first entrusted one granted the king terms of peace which the indignant people refused to ratify the second so misconducted himself that his army was scattered beaten and sent under the yoke these disasters roused a tempest of wrath at rome public opinion was so strongly excited that under a temporary leader one mamilius limitanus the people created a court of high commission which raged against the prominent members of the optimate ring sent into exile the two incompetent generals bestia and albinus and revenged an old grudge by packing off after them opimius the consul who in b c one twenty one had put down gracchus and his friends with such cruel zeal but in spite of this outburst the senate was not yet deprived of the control of foreign affairs and was allowed to send forth against jugurtha its best fighting man quintus caecilius metullus b c one o nine the new general was fairly successful 
but he did not work quickly enough to please the angry critics of the forum he took most of jugurtha's fortresses but the king fled into the atlas and the sahara and maintained a desperate guerrilla warfare which seemed likely to linger on for ever the people were perhaps unjustly dissatisfied they did not understand as we understand only too well in this year of grace nineteen o two the difficulties of hunting down elusive bands of marauding light horse it was at this moment that there at last appeared a serious candidate for the headship of the democratic party gaius marius was a man of a very different type from his predecessors in that post he was a rude soldier who had risen from the ranks by his hard head and undaunted courage he had none of the literary polish and philosophic training or the lofty eloquence of the two gracchi as a politician he can only be described as a blatant demagogue he had not the brains or the imagination to sketch out a political programme he was no more than a discontented and ambitious veteran with a personal grievance his simple method of achieving notoriety was to declaim to the multitude concerning the very real abuses of the senatorial government and to promise to set all to rights if he were made consul he most unjustly blamed metullus for the protraction of the war and promised to end everything in a year if only he were placed in office he had been provoked by the aristocratic hauteur and quiet insolence of the proconsul and was thinking quite as much of revenging personal slights to himself as of giving the democratic party an opportunity of seizing the reins of power the vulgar self-assertion and coarse invective of marius did not disgust the multitude he was duly elected and straightway went over to africa to supersede metullus the province was not assigned to him by the senate in spite of their opposition he had a bill passed in the assembly which gave him charge of the numidian war but though he took large reinforcements with him legions raised on a new system by volunteers from the lower orders of the city he was not at first much more successful than his predecessor he scoured the whole countryside with movable columns but he could not catch the evasive jugurtha his reputation might have been wrecked if chance had not come to his aid his quaestor lucius cornelius sulla at last succeeded in capturing the numidian king not by force of arms but by treachery he bribed jugurtha's moorish allies to seize and surrender their guest the king was kidnapped and made over to marius and then the war came suddenly to an end b c 105 marius had redeemed his promise to put an end to the numidian struggle though the method in which it closed was neither glorious nor dignified but he had saved his reputation and was able to celebrate a triumph and to pose before his supporters as a successful general at the moment of his return he had the state at his mercy for the senate was cowed and the people would have been ready to grant anything he asked moreover he had legions at his back the democracy for the first time was armed with sword and shield and did not depend on the stones and staves of riotous mobs if external troubles had not intervened there must have been a political explosion of some sort in b c one o five one o four it might very possibly have ended in the installation of marius as temporary ruler of rome but neither he nor the senate had the leisure to turn their attention to domestic politics for the first time since the fall of hannibal a serious danger from without was impending over italy the year b c one o five witnessed the most dreadful disaster to the roman arms with the possible exception of cannae that ever occurred in the days of the republic for the last eight years there had been unrest along the northern frontier of the empire both in the balkan peninsula and in the alpine lands all the unknown barbarism of central europe was on the move tribe was thrusting upon tribe and the outer waves of the seething whirlpool of nations were washing against the borders of the provinces of macedonia and narbonese gaul at first the troubles were not serious the attention of rome was distracted to the jugurthine war and little attention was paid to the raids of the celts or germans but things gradually grew worse 
several small roman armies were cut to pieces there were mishaps of some importance in 113 109 and 107 at last the situation grew so threatening that the senate dispatched two large armies a dozen legions of raw recruits to defend the frontiers of gaul for the originators of all the stress and turmoil the great mass of migratory bands whom we vaguely know under the name of cimbri and teutons had thrust aside the lesser tribes and were marching against italy itself an awful disaster ensued the two incapable quarrelsome generals malleus and caepio found the invaders on the lower rhone and attacked them with foolhardy confidence they did not even combine their forces though their camps were less than a day's march apart caepio in disobedience to the orders of his superior attacked the enemy's camp in the morning he was defeated and his legions annihilated in the afternoon the germans threw themselves upon malleus slew him and cut to pieces the whole of the second roman army eighty thousand men fell in the two battles of arausio october sixth one o five not a cohort remained to guard the passes of the alps the only hope of rome was in the army which marius was bringing from africa if the barbarians had marched at once for turin or genoa it is hard to say what they might not have accomplished but they lingered long in the valley of the rhone and then to the surprise of all men drifted away toward the pyrenees instead of crossing the alps thus rome was given the chance of reorganizing the defence of her frontiers and marius instead of practising demagogy in the forum hurried northward with his troops to interpose between the barbarians and the gates of italy the cimbrian war contrary to all expectation was protracted for five summers from b c 105 to 101 and marius re-elected year after year to the consulship was kept perpetually in the field watching for the moment when the enemy should at last make up their minds to deliver their great stroke it was not till they had wandered far and wide in spain and gaul spreading devastation around them that the barbarians turned back at last to the true objective and marched in two vast columns against italy the teutons by the nearer route through provence the cimbri by the longer sweep that leads through southern germany by the brenner pass and the line of the adige down to verona marius now showed that at least his reputation as a soldier had not been exaggerated we must not linger over the details of his two great victories in 102 he warred down the teutons in a long running fight among the hills of provence which ended with their complete destruction at the battle of aquae sextii in the following spring he crossed the alps into italy to meet the cimbri who had at last completed their long circular march and had descended into the plains of the po at vercellae he annihilated them with a slaughter as great as that of his teutonic victory in the preceding year the disaster of malleus and caepio was revenged and rome was safe from the northern invader for another five hundred years end of section six Section 7 of Seven Roman Statesmen of the Later Republic by Charles Ullman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 4. From the Gracchi to Sulla, B.C. 121 to 88, Part 2. The man who had put an end to the long nightmare of fear, which had hung over the city from the day of Arausio to that of Vercelli, might have asked and obtained from the people any reward that he might choose they offered libations to him as if he were a god and hailed him as the third founder of rome he might have been her eighth king had he known the right way in which to sue for the sceptre and the diadem but the great general was the most bungling and incompetent of politicians his naive vanity and clumsy ostentation made him ere long ridiculous a grave fault in a pretender to supreme power. The optimate sneered at his solecisms in grammar and in dress. These might have been imperceptible to the multitude, but even they were forced to laugh at a consul who was always trying to make great political harangues and breaking down hopelessly in the middle. 
the firmness which he displayed in battle did not accompany him into the assembly and the least interruption or distraction disconcerted him so that he promptly became incoherent moreover even the rabble would have preferred a leader who did not mix vulgar familiarity with vainglorious ostentation in such a curious measure and who could have concealed more successfully his growing addiction to the wine-cup but in spite of all his obvious defects marius was firmly convinced that he was to be not only the preserver of rome from the barbarians but also the destined saviour of society who was to take up the task of the gracchi and to tear the administration of the empire from the incapable hands of the senate a little experience convinced him that he was not really suited for the work of a mob orator nor for the drawing up of an elaborate political programme of reforms but the only result of this discovery was to make him resolve to take into his pay useful persons capable of writing his speeches and drafting his bills for him he must find tools and mouthpieces who would act as his agents in the work of revolution unskilful in every political action marius enlisted as his managing partners two able and reckless scoundrels whose disreputability was to be the ruin both of himself and of the democratic cause these two choice spirits lucius apuleius saturninus and c servilius glaucia were the roman counterparts of the cleophons and hyperbole of athens the former was a contentious obstinate man who as quaestor in 104 had a quarrel with the senate in which he considered that he was ill-treated since then he had devoted himself to the career of malcontent and exposer of abuses in b c 103 he had obtained the tribunate and had used its power by bringing perpetual charges of bribery or misconduct against unpopular optimates by raising mobs and by sweeping the streets whenever the spirit seized him he was now anxious to take another turn of tribunicial power his colleague glaucia seems to have been a shade less violent but even more insolent and disreputable his special talent lay in the direction of vulgar and indecent stump oratory with which he could always keep the multitude on the roar having enlisted the support of this precious pair marius started on his career as a democratic reformer he allowed saturninus to draw up the program for him he for his part was to support it with the majesty of his military reputation and if necessary by calling in the aid of his disbanded veterans who were loafing about the city by thousands living on the great donatives which they had received at the end of the cimbric war the platform of the revived democratic party consisted of a reproduction with some slight variations of the schemes of gaius gracchus the permanent support of the urban mob was to be bought by a grotesque exaggeration of that statesman's detestable corn law the dole had been issued to the citizens since b c one twenty two at the rate of six and a half asses promodius saturninus proposed to sell the corn for the ridiculous price of five-sixths of an ass he might as well have given it away for nothing less objectionable by far was the revival of gracchus's great scheme for transmarine colonization saturninus had already proposed to revive the gracchan scheme of colonizing africa for the benefit of the veterans of the jugurthine war now he produced a grandiose scheme for transmarine colonization on the largest scale it included a law for the planting of colonies in achaia macedonia and sicily and another for the distribution of great regions both in gaul and in africa among the victorious soldiery of the cimbric war marius was to be entrusted with the execution of the whole vast scheme the italians were also to be pacified by this measure for they were to be included in the gallic distribution and each settler was to receive full burgess rights saturninus had grasped the fact that the city rabble on whose votes he had to subsist objected to the enfranchised italians at home who might cram the forum and scramble for doles 
but had no objection to the enfranchised Italian who had been packed off to Africa or Central Gaul. Out of sight would be out of mind. His colonization scheme, therefore, was contrived to play a double part in satisfying the veterans and in pacifying the allies. In strict accordance with Gracchan precedents, bills were added to strengthen the already overgreat power of the equites in the law courts. But there was a most original novelty included in the Apulean law. The reckless tribune subjoined to it a clause compelling every senator to swear obedience to the whole code within five days of its passing the comitia, on pain of losing his seat. For intolerant suppression of adverse opinion, no more stringent device had ever been invented. The Senate, as a power in the state, would have been annihilated if it had been forced to submit to such ordinances. But it was not so much the contents of the Apulean laws which proved fatal to their framer and his patron as the way in which the laws were carried. Saturninus's whole career was a carnival of violence and outrage. He habitually went about attended by turbulent mobs who beat or slew any one who dared to differ from their idol. His followers were capable of anything. In the tribunicial elections for B.C. 100, it seemed probable that he would fail to be chosen. Thereupon, a band of his satellites fell upon and stoned to death Quintus Nonius, one of the successful candidates. Saturninus was elected to fill the vacant place. It was just possible to look upon this sinister coincidence as the work of chance, but no one could mistake its meaning when precisely the same thing happened at the consular elections for the succeeding year. Glaucia was a candidate under the protection of Saturninus and Marius. It seemed likely that he might be beaten by Gaius Memmius, a man who, though now a moderate member of the Optimate party, had been a very popular tribune of the plebs eleven years before, and had headed the agitation against the mismanagement of the Jugurthine War. The moment that his candidature was seen to be dangerous, Memmius was set upon by a gang of ruffians and beaten to death. These were perhaps the most shocking of the deeds of Marius's enterprising lieutenant, but his general behavior was quite in keeping with them. When the law dealing with the corn dole in the Gallic colonies was before the Comitia, some optimate tribunes tried to interpose their veto. Saturninus did not take the trouble to deal with them as Tiberius Gracchus had dealt with Octavius. He simply had them thrown off the rostra and went on with the proceedings. The evicted magistrates, though much knocked about, struggled to the front and began crying that they heard thunder on the left, which should have brought the meeting to an end. But Saturninus pointing with a menacing gesture to the stones which his followers were gathering up, told them that they had better beware, or it would not only rain but hail. The tribunes discreetly fled, but a hot-headed young optimate, the quaestor Quintus Caipio, collected a band of his clients and supporters, girt up his toga, and stormed the rostra, upsetting Saturninus and those about him. The assailants were but a handful, and the demagogue, rallying his forces and putting Marian veterans in his front rank, charged back, drove off Caipio and his gang, and completed the formalities of passing the bill among desperate noise, confusion, and tumult. It was farcical to call such a mere riot a legal meeting of the Comitia, or to hold that bills which had been vetoed by half a dozen tribunes had any binding force, but it was for refusing to swear obedience to them that Quintus Metellus, the haughty but honest and capable predecessor of Marius in Numidia, was driven into exile. There seemed to be no length to which Saturninus and Glaucia would not go, but their triumphant violence defeated their own ends. Marius was prepared to wink at a good deal of ruffianism on the part of his supporters, but he drew the line at the systematic murder of respectable opponents and would have preferred to see the opposite party in the assembly overawed by threats rather than driven out with sticks and stones. Clearly he began to fear his own lieutenants and to doubt whether they might not turn against him instead of merely carrying out his plans. He suddenly dropped his support of them, secretly informed the optimates that he would not be responsible for their acts, and passed the word round among his veterans that they were to remain neutral. 
exasperated at being disavowed by their employer saturninus and glaucia tried to continue their wild career on their own behalf and in december b c one hundred brought matters to a head by seizing the capital with the object of carrying through a regular coup d'etat what exactly they intended to accomplish we cannot guess certainly it can hardly have been as their enemies asserted to proclaim saturninus king or even dictator but deprived of the aid of the veterans of marius they proved no more able to defend themselves than gaius gracchus and fulvius had been in b c one twenty one the optimates easily shut them in and held them beleaguered while the senate proclaimed martial law marius much against his will was forced to lend his sanction as consul to their proceedings when the besiegers had succeeded in cutting off the supply of water from the capital saturninus and his crew were forced to surrender they were placed under a guard in the senate house by the orders of marius but the optimate mob tore off the roof and pelted the prisoners to death with tiles before the consul could interfere thus ended the third attempt of the democratic party to seize the conduct of affairs and to make an end of the senate as a governing body it failed mainly from the incapacity of marius either to conduct a political campaign himself or to select agents who would be competent to do so in his behalf if he had known how to secure men of tact and discretion instead of reckless incendiaries he might have done what he pleased for the strength of his reputation would have carried everything before it in b c one o one and the arms of his veterans were at his disposal but saturninus in spite of a certain ability and energy was frankly impossible either as leader or lieutenant he would have wrecked any cause by his insolence and recklessness marius much disappointed by the failure of his schemes and more or less conscious of the ridiculous figure which he had cut retired from rome when his consulship was over and went for a long tour in asia under the pretext of fulfilling a vow which he had made during the cimbrian war to the gods of the east when he returned he found that he had been half forgotten and that the senate was more powerful than it had been at any time since the fall of the gracchi there was a gap of more than eight years before any serious political strife again arose at rome but the unsatisfactory economic and constitutional position of the republic once more produced its inevitable result and a new reformer arose marcus livius drusus differed from his predecessors in that he was in no sense a legitimate descendant of the gracchi he was what in modern phraseology we should call a tory democrat he believed that the senate was far more fitted than the assembly to administer the empire he had taken part against saturninus in b c one hundred and his views as to what were the main dangers of the state and how these dangers should be met differed from those which were held by the democratic party in personal character he was as unlike saturninus and glaucia as can well be imagined being a man of very staid and even haughty carriage extremely strict in his morals and self-conscious beyond the limits of priggishness he was so well aware of his own virtues that his dying words are recorded to have been that he wondered how many years would elapse before the state would get another citizen as good as himself after having studied for several years the unsatisfactory condition of the republic drusus had come to the conclusion that its main dangers were the ever-growing power and insolence of the equestrian order the corporation of financiers to whom gaius gracchus had sacrificed the state and the discontent of the italian allies he also thought that something might still be done to re-establish the yeoman class by providing new colonies at capua an old idea of gaius gracchus's and in sicily there was nothing in these views which might not be held by a sincere optimate and drusus found that he might look for support from all the more enlightened members of the senate for the first time a reformer was backed by a large proportion of the most important men in the state the better sort of senators had long been chafing at the corruption of the equestrian law courts and of late the condemnation of the virtuous rutilius rufus for his blameless government in asia had provoked them beyond endurance as to the question of giving the franchise to the allies any sensible optimate could see that the existing constituency in the comitia was as bad from his point of view as any other body that could be created 
it could do no harm if the urban multitude were deluded or even swamped by the sturdy farmers of those parts of central italy to which agricultural depression had not yet penetrated the agrarian law too which drusus proposed had not the confiscatory character of that of tiberius gracchus the campanian state domains and the other small remnants of public land in italy were being held on lease they had not practically passed into private possession as had the estates which had been resumed by the gracchan law of b c one thirty three and to colonies in sicily no one could have any rational objection the fertile island had been so wasted by the slave war of b c one o four to one o one that it could afford to take in a very large body of new settlers it is impossible to deny that the reforms of drusus were less objectionable and had a more respectable and influential set of supporters than any other of the programmes which were laid before the roman people during the last century of the republic unfortunately their author did not introduce them in the best or wisest fashion the bills had to pass the comitia and that corrupt constituency had to be conciliated thinking that the agrarian law would not suffice to buy it over drusus linked to his other proposals one of a most openly immoral sort he offered to increase the pernicious corn dole by adding to the amount of state grain which each citizen was allowed to purchase every month it was represented to him that the treasury could not stand the expense wherefore he enacted that the coinage should be debased in order to find the extra money of every eight denarii issued by the mint one was to be of copper plated with silver and to refuse the base coin was to be a high offence evidently drusus was no economist but even though the ancient world had not discovered gresham's law that the bad money drives out the good he must have known that his bill would cause grave financial troubles it was clearly a case of doing evil that good might come drusus found himself at the head of a very heterogeneous body of partisans his proposals had caused a cleavage in both of the old factions he was backed by the better half of the senate by the italians and at first by that blind and greedy majority in the assembly which would vote anything that was sweetened by a corn dole against him were the equites and that section of the senate which was simply reactionary and opposed to all manner of change merely because it was change he had also to reckon with that part of the urban multitude which regarded the extension of the franchise to the italians with such distaste that they feared and shunned any one who might propose it quite conscious of the existence of this latter body drusus with more willingness than honesty brought forward together his laws for depriving the equites of the control of the courts for planting the colonies in italy and sicily and for increasing the corn dole to do so directly contravened the lex caecilia didia passed in b c ninety eight which forbade the introduction of clauses dealing with several distinct subjects under a single preamble nevertheless the proposals were carried in face of a bitter opposition headed by the consul marcius philippus the meeting at which they passed was much disturbed and the adversaries were so vehement that at last drusus had philippus dragged off the rostrum by his apparitors an outburst of temper which unhappily recalled the doings of saturninus his bill passed but its legality was very doubtful in face of his opponent's contention that subjects so different could not legally be linked together in one enactment End of section seven section eight of seven roman statesmen of the later republic by charles oman this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami chapter four from the gracchi to sulla part three victorious thus far drusus then began an agitation to prepare the people for the second part of his program the great law which was in his idea to regenerate the roman people by introducing into the citizen body the great mass of italian allies aware of the difficulties of the task he got into communication with the chief men in each state throughout the peninsula they visited his house and formed an association for the purpose of pushing their claims 
It is said that in every country town there was a branch started whose members swore to live and die with Drusus, to spend life and fortune in behalf of him and of all other brethren who had taken the oath, and to enlist in the bond every possible helper. To institute such a society was to go perilously near the edge of conspiracy and of high treason, and its framer can hardly have supposed that he had made the oath harmless and constitutional by adding a clause in which the members bound themselves when they had received the franchise to regard Rome as their fatherland and Drusus as their patron. The association was soon well rooted in every corner of the land and provided the Italians with the bond of organization and the common executive whose want had hitherto been their weakness. Drusus had not been wrong in thinking that the proposal to enfranchise the Allies would shake the allegiance of many of his followers and gain him bitter enemies. Both in the Senate and in the urban multitude there were many who began to fall away from him when he insisted on the necessity of this great measure. After a time he lost control of the Senate, and a majority in it voted that his first set of laws had been invalid owing to the informal way in which they had been passed en bloc under a single preamble. But the resolution of the haughty tribune was not in the least shaken. He announced his intention of persisting with his schemes in spite of all opposition. He made no attempt to dispute the legality of the Senate's decision as to his laws, but determined to bring forward the question of the Italians. How far he would have carried the matter we cannot tell, for one evening as he was returning to his own house, after making a harangue in the forum, he was murdered. A multitude was pressing around him, when he was seen to stumble and fall, he had been stabbed in the groin with a cobbler's knife, which was found sticking in the wound. Within a few hours he was dead, and all his plans perished with him. His enemies of the equestrian order succeeded in getting a bill passed by the Comitia, to the effect that the association which he had formed had been treasonable, and that both his friends in the Senate and his chief agents among the Allies should be prosecuted for conspiracy. The news that Drusus had been murdered and that a special commission had been appointed to try his supporters was the signal for the outbreak of rebellion all over Italy. The chief men of all the allied cities had learnt to know each other in the reformer's house and had ascertained that they all had the same grievances and the same desires. The desperate meaning to the Italians of the present crisis was that they had now ascertained that neither party in the Roman state would ever help them. They had long supposed that they might count on the aid of the Democrats, for both the Gracchi and Saturninus had promised them relief. The Optimates, as they had supposed, were their enemies, but now the best of the Optimates had taken up their cause. Drusus had been supported by men such as Crassus the orator, Aurelius Cotta, and the aged Marcus Aemilius Scaurus, the princep senatus. It was the main body of the democratic party and its allies, the Equites, who had foiled the plans of Drusus. The urban multitude, in its narrow jealousy, had deserted him, lest it might lose some portion of its shows and its corn doles. The tribune Varius, who had proposed the bill, against the friends of Drusus, was a well-known democrat, and his chief supporters were Equites. Realizing that the democracy was really as hostile to them as the most bigoted conservative in the optimate party, the Italians saw that they could only hope to gain their rights by unsheathing the sword. Within three months of the death of Drusus, the whole peninsula from Picinum southward was in arms, Few states, save the Latin colonies, continued faithful to the Roman cause. With the details of the fierce but confused campaign which raged all over Italy during the years B.C. 90 to 89, it is not necessary to deal. The odds were against Rome. The sturdy yeomen of the Apennine valleys were individually better men than the town-bred legions whom the consuls Lucius Caesar and Rutilius Lupus sent against them. It must be confessed, however, that the Romans fought far better than might have been expected. Even the urban multitude displayed a savage determination worthy of their ancestors, and offered to give up even their cherished corn dole 
in the day of necessity. But the citizens were opposed by superior numbers, their officers were for the most part incapable, the campaign presented a thousand difficulties because of the necessity of endeavouring to relieve the many outlying garrisons, Latin colonies for the most part, in remote corners of Italy. If Rome was not crushed in the first year of the war, it was because she still retained many advantages. She had the undisputed command of the sea, and by means of it could send succors round the peninsula even when the central lines of communication were held by the enemy. The provinces, fortunately for her, did not choose this moment to revolt. From them she drew not only numerous auxiliary troops, but also the ample supply of money and food by which alone the war could be maintained. The revolted Italians were terribly handicapped by their poverty. Rome had also a considerable number of officers, headed by Marius himself, who were accustomed to commanding and moving large bodies of men. None of the Italian generals had ever headed any force larger than a cohort, and they had to learn the art of handling armies numbered by tens of thousands without any previous experience. But the most important factor of all in the struggle was that Rome represented unity of action and organization, as opposed to a heterogeneous mass of tribes of very different races, divided by local interests and old grudges. The Italians did not succeed in setting up a vigorous federal government. The constitution which they devised for themselves was a slavish and stupid imitation of that of Rome, which failed to give them either a vigorous executive or a capable administrative council. Yet in spite of all these advantages, the experiences of the first year of war so tried the strength of Rome and broke down her haughty spirit that she practically consented to grant the Allies the franchise which they had demanded. The Lex Julia, passed in the winter of B.C. 90, gave the citizenship to all the Italian communities who had remained faithful, including the whole of the populous Latin colonies. Having once surrendered the principle for which they had entered on the war, the Romans did not hesitate to go farther. Only two or three months after the Lex Julia had been enacted, there followed the still more important Lex Plautia Papiria, which granted the franchise to every individual Italian who should lay down his arms and appear before a magistrate to crave enrollment as a Roman citizen. This law saved the existence of Rome, at the sacrifice of her old claim to dominate Italy as a mistress, the rebels flocked in by tens of thousands to give in their names and to take up the long-coveted status of citizen. The power of the insurrection was so much thinned that the second campaign of the war, that of B.C. 89, went almost entirely in favor of the Romans. District after district was subdued, and at the end of the year only the obstinate Samnites and the less important tribes of Lucania remained in arms. It was clear that the fate of the war had been decided, and that the crushing of the last desperate rebels could only be a matter of time. The Romans once more breathed freely, and contented to have saved the existence of the city and the empire, contemplated with comparative equanimity the crowd of new citizens with whom for the future they had to share the dominion of the world. At this moment, the most inappropriate one that could have been chosen, for Samnium had still to be subdued, and a great foreign war with King Mithridates was just breaking out, civil strife recommenced at Rome. The conduct of the two parties was absolutely insane. There is no parallel for it in history save one, the state of France in 1793-4, when foreign invasion, domestic insurrection, and bloody proscriptions in the capital were all in progress at once, bears much similarity to the state of Italy in B.C. 88-87. to That civil war should arise when every man and every sesterce was still wanted to preserve the state from dangerous external troubles is all the more astonishing because in B.C. 88 both the optimate and democratic parties were in a deep state of discredit. No one could say that the rule of the Senate during the last thirty years had been anything but feeble and incompetent, on the other hand, all the main items of the democratic program had been tried and found wanting. The agrarian and colonial schemes of the Gracchi had failed to regenerate the state. Farming was as unprofitable as ever. 
the corn dole of gaius gracchus had been in working order for a whole generation and had been carried to its logical extreme by saturninus and drusus yet the urban population was as miserable and as discontented as ever the franchise had now been granted to the italians who had obtained possession of every personal immunity and political privilege that they could wish save indeed that they had been enrolled in eight tribes only so that their voting power in the comitia was not fully equivalent to their numbers but it had always been the practical advantages of citizenship rather than the right to register their suffrages that they had desired but a party does not necessarily cease to exist because its programme is played out more especially a party of criticism and discontent such as that of the roman populares they were if anything more violent than they had ever been before and though all the constructive items in their political creed had been tried and had proved futile so that nothing really remained of it save the single destructive cry of down with the senate but if no longer a party with measures they were now a party with men the great civil war that was approaching was to show that the personal ambitions of a marius a sulpicius or a cinna supplied enough of a war cry to unite the turbulent elements in rome and that the populares could continue to exist even without a popular programme hitherto all the really important constitutional and economic quarrels between optimates and democrats had been fought out by mere rioting and chance medley but now a fierce and prolonged civil war which was to put scores of legions in the field was to follow on a mere personal rivalry for a military command a tribune named sulpicius rufus to whom the mantle of saturninus had descended was busy in formulating some new reforms of second-rate importance the most prominent of them was a bill for distributing the freedmen who had hitherto been confined to the four city tribes and the new italian citizens who had in a similar way been told off to eight tribes only among the whole of the old constituencies there was no great point in the bill so far as the italians were concerned for they would rarely if ever come up to vote on account of the mere difficulties of distance as to the freedmen they were the worst element in the state and to propose to give them more power in the comitia than they already enjoyed was the act of the most unscrupulous demagogy sulpicius as it would seem was a man from whom such legislation might be expected we have no unbiased account of his character and his plans but the records which his enemies have left behind paint him in the most lurid colours he was inferior to none in desperate attempts writes plutarch inspired by some optimate authority he was a compound of cruelty insolence and avarice and could commit the most infamous crimes in cold blood he openly sold the citizenship of rome to persons who had been slaves and received their money told out on a table in the forum he always went about with a band of three hundred armed satellites and had a council of young equites whom he called his anti-senate though he got a law passed that every man who owed more than two thousand denarii should be expelled from the senate he had debts himself to the amount of three millions there seems no doubt that he could vie in ruffianly violence with saturninus and glaucia several times he cleared his adversaries out of the comitia with staves and daggers on one occasion it is said he tried to murder the consuls pompeius and sulla during the actual session of the assembly the son of the former was killed in this desperate riot however exaggerated may be the language of plutarch it is at least clear that sulpicius was a man of violent and unscrupulous character but for the moment he had control of the streets and the assembly and it was to him that those who had something to gain addressed themselves accordingly it does not surprise us to find him adding to the many laws which he passed one intended for the private and personal benefit of one of his friends it was a decree appointing gaius marius to the command of the army which was to be sent to the east to repel king mithridates the old general had recovered from the shock of his political humiliation in b c ninety nine he had been entrusted with a considerable body of legions during the italian war and had fought with success against the rebels though he had not gained any very striking victories 
he felt that he was only half rehabilitated in the eyes of his fellow-citizens and was anxious to close his career with a series of brilliant campaigns which should cause them to forget the names of saturninus and glaucia the king of pontus was he thought the kind of enemy who would provide a roman general with the opportunity of winning a sensational triumph annexing whole provinces and accumulating untold stores of plunder and trophies if he returned to rome laden with the spoils of the east he would once more occupy the commanding position in the state which he had enjoyed at the end of the cimbric war the army which was destined for the asiatic campaign was at present lying under the walls of nola the last fortress in the lowlands which was still in the hands of the rebellious samnites but it was believed that the place would soon fall and then the six legions which formed the besieging force would be disposable for service overseas they were at present under the command of the consul lucius cornelius sulla to whom the charge of the mithridatic war had been duly assigned by the senate he was a prominent member of the optimate party and an old enemy of marius in displacing him the aged general would not merely secure the command of the best roman army then existing but would also disappoint and humiliate a personal foe accordingly marius allied himself to sulpicius rufus and paid his enormous debts while in return the tribune passed the decree which deprived sulla of his army they little knew the manner of man they were provoking their bill was to cost one of them his life and to cause the other to be hunted out of italy and driven into a miserable exile they had stirred up into action the most capable and the most relentless enemy that democracy was ever to know. End of section 8 Section 9 of Seven Roman Statesmen of the Later Republic by Charles Oman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami chapter five sulla part one lucius cornelius sulla the man whom sulpicius and marius had so recklessly challenged to mortal combat is one of the most striking figures in roman history for mere psychological interest there is no one who can be compared with him save caesar alone he combined in the most extraordinary degree the old roman political virtues with the personal vices that the new rome had borrowed from the hellenized east to his credit it must be granted that throughout his career he displayed the main qualities which had distinguished those generations of men who had built up the roman domination in italy during the fourth and third centuries before christ he had an enormous sense of the dignity and importance of the roman name the welfare of the state as he conceived it stood before any private or party interest he was entirely lacking in personal as opposed to national ambition the crown and the purple robe had no attraction for him in this respect he must be reckoned superior even to caesar who was not insensible to such things nor was he affected by the more insidious craving for power he was one of those rare spirits who after they have achieved the highest things and risen to practical sovereignty in the state are content to step down from the throne and to retire into private life moreover he had the solid military ability the steadfast level-headed perseverance the freedom from vain theory which had distinguished the best men of the elder days of the republic mixed with these old roman characteristics were all the vices of the decadent half hellenized generation into which he had been born sulla had learnt to be regardless of human life not merely of the lives of aliens or barbarians most romans were that but of the lives of citizens also if a man great or small stood in way of his schemes or his reforms he doomed that man to perish with entire nonchalance he had the most profound belief in the all-importance of the roman state but the sacrosanctity of the individual citizen seemed to him a farce the old shibboleth kiwis romanus sum had no protective power against his ruthless hand 
another modern trait of his character which could only have come from the habitual study of destructive and doubting greek philosophy was a frank disregard for the law of the constitution a thing for which the old roman had as slavish a reverence as had his contemporary the pharisee for the letter of the law of moses while other men still wrangled over forms and ceremonies vetoes and auspices sulla quietly marched an army against rome and showed that neither religious sanctions nor tribunitial mandates had any power to stop a commander with loyal troops at his back sulla had a supreme contempt for forms that had grown meaningless though the majority of the men of his generation were still in bondage to them very un-roman again was another of sulla's characteristics a smooth plausible utterly hollow urbanity the deceptive courtesy of the diplomat the roman of the elder republic had been brutally straightforward his notion of diplomacy was summed up in the two handfuls of peace and war which fabius offered to the carthaginian senate or in the line which popilius linus drew around the astonished antiochus epiphanes sulla on the other hand took an artistic pleasure in circumventing and cajoling those with whom he had to deal to outmaneuver jugurtha at bocchus's court to talk round the parthian ambassador whom his master afterwards executed for being so outwitted were great delights to him to outdo the wily barbarian in his own field of lies had an intrinsic pleasure in the execution another and most unamiable side of sulla's disposition may be summed up in saying that he was an epicurean both in the best and the worst sense of the word he had a keen enjoyment of artistic and intellectual pleasures he loved beautiful things for their own sake was an enlightened student of literature and appreciated and collected hellenic works of art he liked to converse with philosophers and authors with actors and artists and willingly sharpened his brains and increased his knowledge of every side of life by mixing with all sorts and conditions of men but at the same time he had the bad side of the artistic temperament he was frankly vicious in his private life as evil a liver as any greek tyrant of old he was perfectly destitute of any sense of chastity or shame and moreover habitually indulged to excess in the banquet and the wine cup this it was that ruined his splendid constitution and turned his handsome face into the mulberry spotted with meal to which it was compared in his middle age to complete this strange and repulsive character we must add a curious strain of wild superstition of the simple and stolid religiosity of the old roman there was no trace in him but like napoleon he believed in his star though as far as deeds went he was a scoffer yet he professed a belief that he was the chosen tool of the gods venus he said was his special patroness and gave him good fortune he sometimes called himself in gratitude epaphroditus he claimed to have dreams omens and premonitions he took as surnames the adjectives felix and faustus the lucky his most hazardous steps were made as he said under direct inspiration from above he wrote in his autobiography that his resolutions taken on the spur of the moment and his enterprises begun without any proper preparation always succeeded far better than those on which he had bestowed the most time and forethought we might perhaps have imagined that he assumed this role of the favourite of fortune merely to encourage his followers had it not been that he carried it into private life when no end was to be gained by proceeding with the farce there seems to have been a genuine fantastic vein of superstition in this otherwise practical and cynical mind we know for example that on battle days he wore under his corslet a small golden image of apollo which he had got at delphi but the strangest development of his beliefs was yet to be told on his deathbed when one would have expected that his mind should have been filled with the memory of all the horrors that he had committed he was visited with comforting visions he told his friends that he faced the other world with equanimity for his dead wife and son had appeared to him and had bidden him hasten to join them in a life of perfect rest and happiness beyond the grave truly this was a strange ending 
for the blood-stained author of the proscriptions of b c eighty one sulla had spent his youth in dire poverty his family was ancient but impoverished no man of this branch of the cornelii had held curule office for six generations he had not even a paternal mansion or a hearth of his own but lived as we learn from plutarch in a set of lodgings one story removed from the garret and hired at the meagre rent of three thousand sesterces about twenty-six pounds per annum he was a man who yearned after all the comforts and elegacies of life who loved good dinners good wine and other less reputable luxuries and who in his youth could not get them it is this poverty of his early years that accounts for his insatiable addiction to pleasure in middle age when most men have lost their taste for frivolity he was making up for the enjoyments of which he had been defrauded in his young days men of the type of sulla able impecunious and destitute of any family influence were generally the stuff from which demagogues were made there are a dozen instances in roman history of young and penniless aristocrats who started on the career of mob leader and champion of the rabble it was the easiest trade on which to embark if one loved notoriety had no scruples and lacked wealthy relatives to push one forward but sulla was above all things an aristocrat he loathed the urban multitude and all its works and when he put himself forward as a candidate for the quaestorship in b c one o seven it was as a strict optimate how such a poor and unknown young man ever succeeded in obtaining a magistracy we do not know that he was able and eloquent is clear enough but a full purse or a programme of confiscation and corn doles was a much better commendation to the electors than mere ability how one who was an optimate and yet had not the money to buy his way to power got his foot on the first rung of the ladder that led to the consulship it is hard to conceive but the feat was accomplished sulla became quaestor and served under marius in numidia during the last year of the jugurthine war one o six to one o five it was here that he won his first distinction and earned the undying enmity of his superior in command while the struggle with the evasive numidian seemed likely to drag on for ever sulla suddenly brought it to an end by his clever and unscrupulous diplomacy by a combination of bribes and cajolery he induced bacchus the moor jugurtha's chief ally to kidnap his guest and relative and to hand him over in chains to the romans the war came to an end and marius took the credit to himself but he was well aware that sulla had really brought it to a finish the quaestor made no attempt to disguise the fact he took as the device of his signet ring a picture of jugurtha surrendered by bacchus himself and he persuaded the moor to dedicate on the roman capital a group of statues reproducing the same composition marius was bitterly vexed it was probably for this reason that sulla took a particular pride in the statues they were placed long after as the device on cornelian coins we may still see sulla in his chair the captive numidian king in chains before him and the moor in front waving the olive branch with which he sued for peace with rome once launched on an official career sulla came steadily to the front his only drawback was his want of funds the first time that he stood for the praetorship he was rejected because the people had expected from him and had not received a great show of african wild beasts but finding money necessary he finally succeeded in scraping it together partly as spoils of war partly in less obvious and reputable ways his public services however were distinguished in the highest degree nothing that he took in hand failed to come to a good end already the luck on which he was so fond of insisting made itself felt he won golden opinions in the cimbric war while serving under the consul catullus in b c ninety three he at last obtained the praetorship and in the following year held as pro praetor the turbulent and newly formed province of cilicia he had been sent there without an army or a proper supply of money yet he made his name feared all around he frightened away mithridates who was trying to annex cappadocia he restored the rightful king of that country and protected him against an armenian invasion 
first of all romans he came in touch with the formidable parthian power which was just advancing to the line of the upper euphrates he met the ambassador of king arsaces the ninth and not only conjoled him into a friendly agreement but induced him to allow the roman to have the place of honour over the parthian name in their negotiations the great king executed his envoy when he returned for permitting this humiliation of his majesty but the peace between the two powers stood firm in short sulla had pacified southeastern asia minor and strengthened the boundaries of his province with no other resources than his ready wit his capacity for bluffing orientals and a handful of untrustworthy native auxiliaries his self-confidence never weak is said to have been confirmed by the prophecies of eastern wizards the chief soothsayer of the parthian ambassador was struck by his invariable good fortune cast his horoscope and told him that he was destined to be the greatest of men and that it was strange that he could endure to be anything less at the present moment when sulla returned to rome it was natural that he should take a high place among the optimate party he was the only man among them who had built up a reputation for unvarying success hence he was naturally entrusted with high command in the italian war he fully justified his promotion won battles over the samnites and the lucanians which far surpassed the successes of any other roman general in these campaigns marius not excepted and gained such a reputation that he was elected as consul for b c eighty eight it was natural that when the italian war died down he should be chosen to march against mithridates for he was the only living general who knew the east and had already made a name in that quarter of the world sulla was quite satisfied with the commission he believed that he was competent to save asia and he had been deeply grieved by the humiliations which the roman arms had been suffering in the mithridatic war hence it was that he was moved to ungovernable wrath when he was informed that sulpicius had passed a law to remove him from command and to make over his army to marius he had already been in violent collision with the demagogue who as it is said had tried to get him assassinated in broad daylight during the meeting of the comitia but there is no reason to suppose that he would have interfered with the sword in domestic politics if he had not been deprived of his eastern commission he believed that the turning back of mithridates was a far more important duty than the quelling of demagogues sulpicius had had many predecessors who had all come to a bad end if sufficient rope was given to a turbulent tribune he was certain to end by hanging himself but it was a different matter when he intervened between sulla and his cherished project of reconquering asia and greece from the pontic king when the news reached the consul he behaved in the most unexpected fashion he began by drawing off the greater part of the army from the siege of nola and bringing it up to capua there he harangued the soldiers told them that he was the victim of the intrigues of bad citizens and asked them whether they were prepared to follow him the men were devoted to the general who had led them so well during the italian war they cared little for the difference between optimate and democrat but they remembered that sulla had always been the most indulgent and good-humoured of chiefs that he had kept their stomachs full and their pockets well lined they believed like himself in his luck and they had been looking forward to easy victory and endless plunder in asia the legions shouted that they would follow him anywhere even if he marched against rome itself which was precisely what he was intending to do when the praetors brutus and servilius met him forbidding him to advance further the soldiers fell upon them tore their robes broke their fasces and stoned them out of the camp glad to escape with their lives this violence frightened many of sulla's chief officers who slunk away from him lest they should find themselves involved in high treason but the rank and file stuck firmly to him and with thirty thousand men at his back he began a rapid march on rome to those who were appalled at his project he merely said that all the omens were favourable the asiatic moon goddess who had been so friendly to him in cappadocia had appeared to him in a dream and had promised him victory placing a thunderbolt in his hand and bade him use it to annihilate his enemies when this wholly unexpected news reached rome 
marius and sulpicius sent out several embassies one after another to endeavour to stop sulla but he deceived them by fair words inviting them to induce the senate and the democratic leaders to meet him in a conference while he continued to advance at full speed toward the city as he was approaching it he was joined by his colleague pompeius rufus a very determined optimate whose presence was invaluable to him for when the two consuls acted together it gave a false air of legality to their proceedings marius and sulpicius had barely time to barricade the streets and to arm their followers from the state arsenal when the arrival of the sullen army in the suburbs was reported without the least hesitation the legions crossed the sacred pomerium and pushed into the city the democrats surprised as they were made a desperate resistance but though swords and pikes had been served out to them they were but untrained rioters contending with disciplined soldiery there was fierce fighting around the esquiline market and the temple of tellus but it did not last for long when sulla brought forth torches and told his men to burn out the enemy if they could not expel them in any other fashion the democrats gave way and fled the victors bivouacked that night in the squares and along the streets ready to fight again next morning if necessary but they soon discovered that the leaders of the enemy had left the city and that the mob had dispersed sulla had broken up the dearest traditions of ancient rome he had brought armed legions into the forum to lovers of the constitution whether optimates or democrats it seemed that the abomination of desolation was in the holy place but no thunderbolt descended from heaven to annihilate the impious consul his luck was still with him and he faced the situation which would have appalled any one less cheerful and unscrupulous than himself with perfect equanimity the senate was assembled by the consuls and informed that the tyrants had been expelled from the city it voted that the sulpician laws had been passed without the proper formalities and were null and void it also passed a decree of outlawry by which sulpicius marius and his son and ten other persons were declared public enemies and a price was set on their heads the tribune was caught lurking in a villa at laurentum he was beheaded and his head was set upon the rostra from which he had so often declaimed a ghastly innovation in the etiquette of massacre which was to be regularly followed hereafter but most of the other democratic leaders escaped from italy marius after a long series of adventures culminating in his celebrated mud-bath in the marshes of minternai made his way to africa where he was ultimately joined by his son and several others of the outlaws it would now have been in sulla's power to assume the permanent control of the state he might have proclaimed himself dictator or have renewed his consular authority and have settled down to rule as an autocrat with the swords of his legions propping up his throne but he had no personal ambition he was a roman and an optimate who desired the triumph of his country and his party and was determined to do his best for both but there was nothing of the tyrant in him his present duty as he supposed was to restore his party to power at rome and then to sally forth to save the eastern provinces from mithridates these two ends he proceeded to carry out with no concern for his own private profit the executions as he supposed had crushed the democrats marius he despised and considered a negligible quantity there was no other surviving chief of any note to resuscitate the vanquished faction and the senate ought to be able to take care of itself for the present accordingly he contented himself with making some comparatively unobtrusive changes in the constitution before his departure the chief of these was a law providing that the approval of the senate senatus auctoritas had for the future to be granted to any bill brought forward by tribunes or other magistrates before it could be laid before the assembly another law restored the old order of things in the comitia centuriata where the wealthier classes were replaced in the preponderant position which they had enjoyed under the early republic but it was not really by these slight alterations of existing custom that he imagined that the senate could defend itself he left behind for their protection two armies under optimates of assured fidelity and ability his late colleague in the consulship pompeius rufus and quintus metullus pius the son of the conqueror of numidia for the mithridatic war he withdrew from italy only five of his own veteran legions 
which had served with him throughout the campaigns of B.C. 90-88, to and had won so many successes over the Samnites. With this force he thought that he could master all the Asiatic hordes of Mithridates, nor, as the event showed, was he wrong. The moment, however, that he set out for the east, all went wrong in Italy. He had, as it seemed, taken his good fortune away with him. The Senate proved far too weak to maintain the position to which he had restored it, and the Democratic faction found a new leader in the council for B.C. 87, Lucius Cornelius Cinna, a vain, heady man, who seems to have been carried away by a sudden lust for establishing a personal domination in the style of Gaius Gracchus, rather than by any true zeal for the popular cause. As an optimate, no statesman could hope to be more than a member of the governing ring. As a democrat, it was possible to exercise a quasi-monarchical power. Hence came the temptation to men of vulgar and unscrupulous ambition to enlist on the democratic side. Even before Sulla left Italy, his colleague Pompeius Rufus, on whose ability to keep order he most relied, had been murdered in a military riot in Picanum. Gnaeus Octavius, who was consul for B.C. 87 along with Cinna, proved too weak for the task of controlling his exuberant partner when the latter openly took arms on behalf of the Democrats. A sporadic civil war began to spread all over Italy, which became really formidable when Cinna made an alliance with the Samnites and called back Marius and the rest of the exiles. The Optimates lost ground, at last Octavius and his army were actually besieged in Rome, and weakened by desertion and famine, the Senate capitulated. Cinna and Marius entered Rome in triumph and celebrated their victory by a wholesale massacre. Not a mere attack on a dozen leaders such as Sulla had carried out in B.C. 88, Marius went about at the head of a band of slaves, slaying every man with whom he had ever had a personal quarrel, whether he was a prominent politician or not. Indeed, the old general acted more like a lunatic afflicted with homicidal mania than a responsible party leader. Every prominent man in Rome who had not taken sides with the exiles was doomed to death. Not only was Octavius put to death, but a number of respectable ex-consuls were murdered, among them Lucius Caesar, who had enfranchised the Italians in B.C. 90, Catullus, the colleague of Marius in his Cimbrian victory, Antonius the orator, and Publius Crassus the father of the triumvir. The optimate wing of the Senate was almost exterminated. None escaped save a handful of fugitives and the officers whom Sulla had taken with him to the east. Marius caused the head of every senator who had been slain to be hung up in the forum, so that for many weeks it resembled the precinct of the king of Daomi after the great customs rather than the meeting place of a civilized people. The atrocities only ceased when Marius died on January 13th, B.C. 86, just after he had caused himself to be elected consul for the seventh time. Cinna, glutted with blood, now turned from the work of massacre to the more practical task of taking measures for the suppression of Sulla, who had sailed for the east in the previous year, to take up the war against Mithridates. End of section 9. Section 10 of Seven Roman Statesmen of the Later Republic by Charles Omine. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 5. Sulla, Part 2. When Sulla had started from Brundisium for Greece in the spring of B.C. 87, he had taken with him no more than five of his own veteran legions, some 30,000 men at most, and a moderate supply of money. He had supposed that he might look for a regular supply of recruits and subsidies from the optimate government which he had left behind him at Rome. He found the eastern provinces in a desperate condition, not only had the whole of Asia been lost, but the Pontic armies had crossed into Europe and had overrun the greater part of Thrace and Macedon. The fleet of Mithridates had subdued the whole of the Cyclades and had sacked the great central emporium at Delos, where 20,000 Italians are said to have been massacred. 
Athens had fallen into the hands of the tyrant Aristion, a humble imitator and admirer of the Pontic king. Nearly all the smaller states of Greece had hastened to do homage to the invaders. Sentius, the governor of Macedonia and his legate, Brutius Sura, with a handful of Roman troops, were holding out in Thessaly, but would certainly have been overwhelmed had not Sulla come to their aid. The great proconsul had marched south from Epirus and recovered part of the western regions of Greece as far as Delphi and the borders of Boeotia, when he received the appalling tidings of the outbreak of the new democratic rising in Italy and of the treason of Cinna. Many men would have turned back to crush the rebels at home before grappling with the external enemies of the state but sulla thought even more of the danger to the roman empire than of the danger of the optimate party instead of returning to italy he pressed with all vigour the campaign against the generals of mithridates without his help octavius and the senate were lost and at midwinter in b c eighty seven to eighty six he learnt that rome was in the hands of the democrats that his friends had been massacred and that he himself and his chief officers had been declared public enemies and outlawed. Decrees passed at Rome to that effect did not much injure him, for his army was thoroughly loyal and not a man left him. But the dreadful part of the situation was that he had for the future to depend entirely on his own resources. He had no money and no fleet. The bulk of Greece was in the hands of the king's generals, and one hundred thousand Pontic troops occupied its chief fortresses. But Sulla showed no sign of discouragement. He paid his legions by the desperate expedient of seizing the temple treasures of Delphi and Olympia. To raise a fleet, he sent forth his legate Lucius Lucullus, bidding him appeal to all the smaller powers of the East who were frightened by the conquering career of Mithridates but the oriental states were cowed and lucullus at first met with many refusals he could only procure a few galleys from the rhodians and the phoenicians with which he could not make any head against the large pontic fleet the armies and supplies of mithridates continued to pass and repass the aegean without hindrance during the first two years of the war but on land where sulla was at work himself things looked better the generals of Mithridates were beaten at Mount Tilphosium in Boeotia and pressed back towards Athens. Then the greater part of the Greek states sent to ask for terms. They had not liked their experiences of the last year while they were under the Pontic yoke. Sulla let them buy safety at a price. He wanted money above all things and consented to overlook their treason in consideration of huge fines having secured his rear he proceeded to lay siege to the strongholds of the enemy the city of athens and its port the piraeus they were two fortresses and no longer one for the long walls which had connected them in the days of pericles had disappeared so that their defence was carried out on separate lines the first great episode therefore in sulla's greek campaign of b c eighty seven to eighty six was the double leaguer of Athens and the Piraeus. He had, with a very small army, for many of his troops were detached in the direction of Thessaly, to besiege superior numbers in two strong places, of which one was perpetually receiving succor from the sea. The Pontic garrison and the Athenians held out with great resolution, knowing the massacre that awaited them if they gave way. The walls were too strong for Roman siege craft, and the city had to be starved out, while at the same time several attempts to relieve it, both from the inland and from the side of Piraeus, had to be beaten back. But Sulla never despaired, and after many months the garrison of Athens grew so weak from famine that they failed to guard the circuit of the walls with sufficient care. The Romans entered by escalade at a point near the Dipylon gate, and met with little resistance in the streets. Sulla allowed his men to plunder the place as a reward for their long endurance in the trenches, and to put to the sword many of the citizens. When at last he ordered the sack to cease, he observed that he spared the living for the sake of the dead, 
that is, the degenerate Athenians of his own day, obtained mercy in memory of Pericles and Plato. March 1st, B.C. 86. Hardly was Athens won when a great army of succor over 100,000 strong came down from Macedonia, driving before it the Roman corps which had been detached on the side of Thessaly. Sulla hastened up from Athens with reinforcements, whereupon Archelaus, the governor of Piraeus, came round by sea with his garrison and joined his colleague Taxiles. The armies met at Chaeronea, one of the inevitable battle-spots of Greece, where an invader advancing from the north can be brought to action in the narrow space between Lake Copaius and the Phocian foothills. Sulla had only 15,000 foot and less than 2,000 horse, but he never doubted for a moment of success. He had seen Asiatic armies before in their own land and had the greatest contempt for them. But at first he had some difficulty in bringing over his own men to his opinion. They feared the masses of cavalry and the many regiments of mercenaries equipped in the Macedonian fashion with the brazen shield and the long sarissa. To quiet their minds, Sulla had to cover his flanks with entrenchments and stockades, but presently the men grew tired of the spade and asked to be allowed to fight. Sulla told them that they should have their will, though it seemed that it was not so much courage as dislike for digging that made them so eager. The event showed that an Oriental army, when manfully faced even by very inferior numbers, would never stand firm beside a resolute attack of European troops. There was much confused fighting, but the story of the battle reads like that of the early British victories in India. The odds seemed hopeless, but the balance of courage compensated for them. The scythe chariots of the Asiatic turned out as great a fraud as they had been at Kunaxa or Arbella. The legionaries soon learnt their futility. They clapped their hands and asked for more, as if they had been looking at the races in the circus. The unwieldy phalanxes of infantry got into disorder, and when the line of pikes was broken, fell an unresisting sacrifice to the Roman sword. Only the cavalry of Archelaus gave some trouble. It pierced the Roman line at one point and had to be driven off by hard fighting. But seeing his infantry cut to pieces, the Pontic general rode off the field and escaped. We can hardly believe Sulla's allegation that he slew 100,000 men in this battle, more especially when he couples it with the astounding statement that he himself lost but 14 legionaries, of whom two were only missing and turned up next morning. Even Asiatic armies cannot be routed with such a light butcher's bill, and the wild lie must have been put about merely to cheer the spirits of the army and inspire them with contempt for the miserable enemy. March, B.C. 86. But just when the subjection of Greece seemed complete, a new danger fell upon Sulla. The Democrats at Rome had just landed an army in Epirus under the consul Flaccus, in order to attack him in the rear. For Cinna and his friends had not the magnanimity of Sulla, and would not reserve their swords for the foreigner, or defer civil strife till the state was free from external enemies. Fortunately for the victor of Chaeronea, Flaccus proved a feeble foe, as was to be expected from a hero of the Forum, one whose only achievement had been to pass a disgraceful law which allowed debtors to pay off their liabilities by tendering one-fourth of what they owed to their unfortunate creditors. The consul marched into Thessaly, spreading proclamations which invited the legionaries of Sulla to desert the standard of an outlaw and to join the legitimate representative of the Roman people, but when the two armies faced each other near Melitia, Flaccus's raw levies showed no eagerness to fight. They began to pass over to Sulla, whose reputation as a general and notorious liberality impressed their minds. The optimate, on the other hand, could thoroughly rely on his men, though he had bought their loyalty by methods of very doubtful morality, not only by paying them well, but by allowing them to live at free quarters, to pillage every place that offered resistance, and to maltreat the inhabitants to their heart's content. Flaccus found his own army much more likely to melt away than that of his rival, and hastily sheered off toward Macedonia, 
giving out that he would march against Mithridates instead of against the Optimates. This he actually did, to the great relief of Sulla, who not only was relieved of an enemy, but saw that enemy doing good work for him by making a diversion in Asia. For Flaccus crossed the Hellespont, and though he was soon after murdered in a mutiny, his successor, the demagogue Fimbria, continued his policy, left the Optimates alone, and began harrying Mesia and Bithynia. But long ere Flaccus reached Asia, Sulla was compelled to fight one more great battle in Greece. While he had been marching into Thessaly to face the Democrats, Mithridates had sent reinforcements to join Archelaus, who after his defeat at Chaeronea had taken refuge at Chalcis in Euboea. To watch this great army, Sulla had fallen back to Athens, where he spent the winter of B.C. 86 to 85, waiting for the enemy to move on to the mainland. For as long as the Pontic troops were protected by the channel of the Euripus, they were unassailable. Sulla had no fleet to ferry him over the strait, and the sea belonged to his adversaries. The Pontic ships wandered far and wide, even as far west as Akinthus, and there was no Roman squadron to keep them in check. But in the spring of B.C. 85, Archelaus had been strengthened by new levies till he had 80,000 men in hand and he had been sent a colleague named Dorylaeus, who was eager to take the offensive. Accordingly, the Pontic army crossed the straits into Boeotia, and gave Sulla the opportunity for which he had been longing. His second great battle was fought in the marshy plain near Orchomenus, only ten miles away from the point where he had won his first victory in the preceding year. The decisive engagement was brought about by the Romans commencing to run lines across the plain, so as to hem in the enemy with their backs to the morasses of Lake Copaius. As Sulla had expected, this maneuver compelled his adversaries to attack him. The Pontic cavalry came suddenly charging down on the half-completed entrenchments and drove back for a moment the cohorts which were covering the work. Seeing them give way, Sulla sprang from his horse, seized a standard, and ran to the front. If anyone asks you where you deserted your general, he shouted to the recoiling battalions, say that it was at Orchomenus. The taunt recalled them to their duty, the line was reformed, the reinforcements brought up, and in the pitched battle which followed, the whole Pontic army was hurled into the lake and annihilated. Even two hundred years after that day, writes Plutarch, bows, helms, broken mail, and swords are still continually discovered in the mud, where the fen was once choked with the bodies of the barbarians. The whole horde perished, only their general Archelaus escaped, as he had done in the previous year at Chaeronea. Mithridates was now much cowed in spirit. All his chosen mercenaries had been destroyed. His foothold in Europe was lost, and he saw the war about to be transferred to Asia, for Lucullus had at last collected a fleet which gave Sulla that power of crossing the Aegean which he had not hitherto possessed. Moreover, Fimbria was already across the Hellespont, and though his army was small and raw compared with that of Sulla, it was already giving the king much trouble. Accordingly, he sent to ask for peace, offering to abandon all that he had conquered in Europe if he was allowed to retain the province of Asia. He promised in addition to lend the Optimates a fleet, a great sum of money, and an auxiliary army for use against the Democrats in Italy. But Sulla was far too good a Roman to allow the empire to be shorn of its wealthiest province, and scorned to march against Cinna at the head of a barbarian force. He rejected the terms proposed to him, and offered the king merely the restoration of the boundaries that had existed before the war. He might keep his ancestral kingdom, but he must evacuate Asia, surrender his fleet, and pay a heavy war indemnity. The Pontic monarch at first thought that these terms were harder than his adversaries had any right to ask. He declared that he would continue the war rather than accept them. Sulla then began to make active preparations for crossing the Aegean, at the same moment, a great number of the states of Ionia, Lydia, and Caria revolted against Mithridates, whose rule had been rapidly becoming unbearable, 
as his temper grew worse and his financial demands more pressing. Moreover, Fimbria's army had pushed south and occupied Pergamus after defeating the king's son in a pitched battle. With a sudden descent from swollen pride to abject servility, very characteristic of an oriental prince in his day of trouble, Mithridates sent to tender acceptance of the original terms that had been offered him. He evacuated as much of the Asiatic province as was still in his hands, gave up seventy war galleys, and paid a fine of three thousand talents. He had a formal conference with Sulla at Dardanus in the Troad, where he promised everything that was asked of him, and bore with humility the haughty and trenchant harangue of his conqueror, who told him that he was fortunate to escape so easily as he was now doing after his unprovoked attack on Rome in the day of her necessity, and his wanton massacre of the Italian residents in Asia during the first year of the war. The honor of the Roman name being now fully vindicated and the boundaries of the empire restored, Sulla was at last able to turn against the Democrats. He had first to deal with Fimbria, whose army had pushed southward and was now lying at Thyatea in Lydia. But when he drew near, the soldiers of his adversary refused to bear arms against the savior and champion of the Roman cause in the east. Their general, seeing his men melting away from him, made an attempt to get Sulla murdered at a conference, and when this miserable plot failed, fell upon his own sword. The submission of Fimbria's legions was a godsend to the Optimates, for Sulla was able to leave them behind to garrison Asia, so that the whole of his own veterans could be utilized for the approaching invasion of Italy. Having completely pacified the East, and carried out in its entirety the program which he had set before himself when he left Rome in B.C. 87, Sulla now turned to face homeward. He was aware that he had no light task before him. His military chest was full, for he had levied an enormous fine of 20,000 talents on the Asiatic cities, which had joined in the massacre of B.C. 88. But his army was very small. He had no more than his original five legions, kept up with difficulty to their full strength, for Roman recruits were hard to find in the east. Even counting a few mercenary troops which he had levied, he had no more than 30,000 men, about the same number with which Hannibal had invaded Italy a hundred and thirty-five years before. They seemed but a handful, when it was borne in mind that Cinna could dispose of the resources of the whole peninsula, not to speak of those of the provinces of Gaul, Spain, and Africa. But Sulla had three causes for confidence. His own generalship, or as he preferred to call it his luck, the absolute fidelity of his legions, and the knowledge that comparatively few of those who were to be opposed to him were particularly zealous to fight for the democratic cause. In military efficiency, each of his men was worth two or three of the raw recruits with whom they would have to deal, and what soldier was likely to desert the general who had been giving him of late no less than sixteen denarii a day just thirty-two times the normal pay of the Roman legionary. Sulla gave his enemies fair warning of his intentions. Before he set sail, he sent a dispatch to Rome, in which he laid before the Senate a detailed account of his four successful years of campaigning in Greece and Asia. He then announced that he was approaching to chastise those who had been guilty of the massacres of the winter of B.C. 87-86, to not to harm the Roman people, he should not meddle with the rights of the newly enfranchised Italian citizens, nor should he do any willful damage to Italy. He was the enemy, not of the many, but of the few, and only those who had blood on their hands need fear him. Such a declaration was well suited to frighten the democratic government at Rome, for Cinna and his friends knew that they were no longer popular with the country at large, their three years of rule had been a disastrous failure. It started with a bloody massacre which alienated every citizen of moderate mind. Then, when constructive measures were necessary, the famous democratic program had ended in a fiasco. Cinna had no genius in him, and the code of laws which he produced 
turned out to be no more than a rechauffe of the out-of-date expedients of Sulpicius and the Gracchi, which had already been tried and found wanting. The one startling novelty had been the dishonest debt law of Valerius Flaccus, which, as we have already mentioned, permitted those who owed money to demand a receipt in full from their creditors when they had paid one-fourth of what they had borrowed. It may be guessed what was the effect of this law on the money-lending equites, who had hitherto been staunch supporters of the democratic cause. Cinna and his friends, in short, had staked their success on their power to satisfy all Italy and to provide a purer and more efficient government than that of the old senatorial oligarchy. In this they had notoriously failed so far from being a return to the golden age the three years domination of the democratic party had been a time of massacre bankruptcy and discontent the chiefs of the dominant faction had proved windbags and dishonest windbags too of all the men who emerged as leaders in these troublous years none showed the least sign of genius save the praetor quintus sertorius the rest were noisy rather than energetic and bloodthirsty rather than resolute. Indeed, the only men who fought with zeal against Sulla were those who had compromised themselves in the massacre and knew that they were beyond the hope of pardon. Sulla's great advantage, then, was that he and his followers meant business, while the majority of those arrayed against him were lukewarm. But still the odds seemed so desperate, in point of mere numbers, that it was thought that his little army would be overwhelmed. Cinna had 100,000 men enrolled in B.C. 84, and in the next year it is said that his successors hurried double that number into the field. But few were eager for the fray. It seemed that they were to be sacrificed to save the necks of their leaders, not to defend Italy, for Sulla kept asserting that he came as a friend to everyone but the fanatics who had murdered his friends, raised his house to the ground, and declared him a public enemy. Noting the slackness of the people in the army, the majority in the Senate, who felt themselves less compromised than their leaders, voted that an embassy should be sent to Sulla to see if he could not be reconciled and brought home without a war. But when, amid many protestations of his moderation and good intentions, the proconsul answered that he must bring his army at his back to give him security, and that the guilty must be punished it was evident that there was no way of avoiding the struggle. Cinna, meanwhile, had been seized with the idea that the best way to keep Sulla out of Italy would be to attack him in Greece. He collected an army at Ancona with the intention of crossing over into Epirus. The first cohort sailed, but when the main body was ordered to embark in very stormy weather, the men mutinied. Cinna came hurrying down to appease them, but was received by a volley of stones and beaten to death. The control of his party fell into the hands of men even less capable than himself, the chief of whom were his colleague the consul Papirius Carbo, Marius the son of the great general, and Lucius Junius Brutus Damasippus. The democratic party had no longer a single autocratic leader. Cinna's three consulships had been styled a dominatio and almost a tyranny but was ruled by a council of war destitute of any commanding personality. End of section 10. Section 11 of Seven Roman Statesmen of the Later Republic by Charles Oman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 5. Sulla. Part 3. In the spring of B.C. 83, Sulla landed in safety at Brundisium, which opened its gates without opposition, an event of evil augury for the Democrats. It was his object to show from the first that he came as the friend of Italy and the enemy only of those who had proscribed him. All through his first campaign he was fighting with his brains as much as with his sword, by proclamations no less than by battles. He began by granting the Brundisians immunity from all taxation as a reward for their surrender. 
as he marched through apulia he kept his army in such order that neither man nor beast cottage nor cornfield was harmed yet it must have been hard to hold in veterans accustomed to the plunder of the east wherever he came he announced that there was full amnesty and pardon for every one who did not actually appear in arms against him this conduct had the most marked effect on the hostile army from the very first the democratic legions showed great lukewarmness in the cause of their commanders the two consuls for the new year gaius norbanus and lucius cornelius scipio were entrusted with the opening of the campaign against the invader they were both very incompetent officers and foolishly separated their armies by such a wide gap that sulla was able to deal with them in detail norbanus was defeated near canusium in apulia he hastily fell back across the apennines but received a second beating at mount tifada after which he shut himself up in capua his colleague scipio marched to his aid but his army was dispersed more by intrigue than by fighting for sulla proposed an armistice and took advantage of it to tamper with the consul's men who when the resumption of hostilities was proclaimed refused to fight part of them dispersed part went over to sulla and scipio fell into the hands of his enemy still maintaining his ostentatious affectation of magnanimity the latter sent him away unharmed giving him an escort as far as the nearest democratic camp he then returned to blockade the army of norbanus the democrats complained as plutarch tells us that in contending with sulla they had to fight at once with a lion and a fox and the fox gave the more trouble of the two sulla's first successes emboldened the surviving members of the optimate party who had escaped the sword of marius and had been lurking ever since in obscure hiding places to take up arms the senior in rank was the proconsul quintus metellus pius but by far the most able were two young men gnaeus pompeius and marcus crassus each of whom had to avenge a father slain in the civil war the one in a mutiny the other in the great massacre of b c eighty seven both were active enterprising and fortunate pompeius gathered in picanum where his family was popular a tumultuary force that gradually swelled to three legions crassus levied a small army in the martian territory these insurrections distracted the attention of the democrats who were forced to turn against them a considerable portion of their new levies and had in consequence less men to oppose to sulla it thus came to pass that the proconsul found himself strong enough to march on rome when the spring of b c eighty two came round he planned a diversion on the east side of italy where metellus and pompey made such a bold advance that carbo with the main army of the democrats went off to hold them in check leaving the younger marius with forty thousand men to guard latium in the appian way when sulla started for a sudden rush on rome he found only this latter army in his path at sacra portus near signia he inflicted a crushing defeat on the young general who was a brave soldier but no tactician the optimates were much outnumbered but the slackness of the rank and file among their enemies gave them every advantage in the thick of the fight five cohorts threw down their standards and went over to sulla this broke the line the enemy fled and marius only succeeded in saving a fraction of his host within the walls of the fortress of praeneste the road to rome was open and sulla marched hastily on the city he occupied it without having to strike a blow but found to his disgust that he was too late to prevent a fresh massacre on getting news of the defeat at sacra portus the praetor lucius brutus damasippus had laid violent hands on every person in the city who was suspected of sympathizing with the optimates mucius scywola the pontifex maximus and many other respectable men perished in this disgraceful slaughter after the fall of rome sulla's star was manifestly in the ascendant and he possessed the obvious advantage of appearing to be the legal representative of the people since he could compel the senate and the comitia to vote whatever he pleased 
the war assumed a very confused and chaotic aspect for fighting was now going on all over italy and each side had dispersed its main force in the endeavour to seize or to hold as many important districts as was possible but the whole business came to a head on november first b c eighty two while sulla was facing carbo in etruria and young marius was still being besieged in praeneste the enemy made a vigorous attempt to seize rome a division detached by carbo made a junction behind sulla's back with the national levy of the samnites who were helping the democrats more in the character of independent allies than in that of roman citizens gaius pontius of telesia a namesake of the ancient hero of the caudine forks led his countrymen to join damasippus and carinus the whole mass came rushing down from the apennines upon the city which the samnites intended to sack rather than to save sulla received news of this concentration in his rear so late that he almost despaired of arriving in time rome was within an ace of destruction for the vanguard of the optimate cavalry arrived when the enemy was only two miles from the gates if their generals had pushed forward a little farther on the preceding night october thirty first instead of encamping close to the city they would have found no one to oppose them as it was sulla's legions had to be placed in line directly they arrived after a fatiguing night march and without being granted time to take a proper meal the battle that followed was far the fiercest of the whole civil war for sulla had to deal not with the lukewarm levies of carbo but with the sturdy samnites pontius rode round his army crying as wellius tells us that rome's last day had come that the tyrant city must be destroyed to her foundations that the roman wolves the bane of italian liberty would never be got rid of until their lair was laid waste the armies met outside the colline gate on the northern side of the city the optimate legions being ranged with their back to the walls and only a few hundred yards from them sulla had the left wing his lieutenant marcus crassus the right for some hours the fortune of the day was hardly contested crassus gained ground but sulla's own division was pressed backward till some of the cohorts were crushed against the walls and others vainly tried to re-enter the gates which were closed against them by the citizens the general himself was in imminent danger of death those who were near him saw him draw from his breast the little golden figure of apollo which he always wore kiss it and mutter to the god that it would be a scurvy trick if he allowed sulla the lucky to fall at last on his own threshold by the hands of traitors apollo was not unpropitious the wreck of sulla's wing held out at the foot of the walls till the night fell soon after the news came that crassus had completely routed the forces opposed to him which seems to have been mainly composed of the democratic levies of damasippus and carinus not of samnites this caused the enemy to draw off from sulla their general pontius had been mortally wounded and it seems that there was no capable man to take his place at dawn the two optimate divisions joined and swept away the dislocated forces of their opponents one democratic legion came over to sulla's side the rest dispersed but not so quickly but that eight thousand of them were captured in their flight the generals damasippus martius and carinus suffered the same fate on the next day sulla cut off their heads and sent them to praeneste to be exhibited to young marius and his famishing garrison the dreadful sight had its effect marius committed suicide and praeneste surrendered the victors sorted out the romans from among the prisoners beheaded those of senatorial rank but let the rest go free the italians were all put to death to the number of several thousands the same fate had already befallen the captives taken at the colline gate eight thousand of them all save the roman rank and file were slain in the circus maximus which had been utilized as their prison the senate sitting hard by in the temple of bologna heard the shrieks and groans of the victims and showed signs of terror but sulla bid them stick to their business and not allow themselves to be distracted 
it was only some malefactors who were suffering the reward of their crimes. There was still much fighting to be done in Italy. Carbo deserted his army in Etruria and fled overseas, but his partisans held out for some time in isolated bands. Norba and Nola stood long sieges, and Volaterrae held out for the incredible length of two years. But the main war in Italy practically came to an end with the victory of the Colleen Gate and the fall of Praeneste. The struggle after that date mainly consisted of the savage harrying of Samnium and Etruria, the two districts where the Democratic Party had made itself most strong. Leaving the completion of this guerrilla warfare to his lieutenants, Sulla had set himself to the great work of his latter years, the remodeling of the Roman constitution on an oligarchical basis. With this object he had himself appointed dictator in November 82, but a dreadful preliminary to his political work was his great proscription, the formal revenge for what Marius and Cinna had done in B.C. 87 to 86. Down to the moment of his victory, it was said, he showed himself a far more moderate and humane man than could have been expected. After it was won, he was more cruel than could have been believed possible. He spared indeed the rank and file of the Roman Democrats, but he systematically cut off every man of note in their party. It seemed that he was determined that not one leader should survive to rally the partisans of the lost cause. He started his operations by issuing three long lists of persons on whose heads a price was set. The first contained eighty names, the second and third two hundred and twenty each. He then coolly gave notice that he had condemned every one whom he could remember, but that those whom he had forgotten should be put into supplementary catalogues. These dreadful appendices kept coming out for many weeks, and not till they ceased could any Roman who had not taken the optimate side feel himself secure. Many comparatively obscure names crept into the lists, for the generals and favorites of Sulla often got him to insert their personal enemies among the executed. He himself seems to have been as impervious to corruption as to pity, but those about him were not, and all sorts of old grudges were paid off under a pretense of political vengeance. In all, some fifty senators, sixteen hundred equites, and at least two thousand private persons were executed in the sullen proscriptions. The heads of the fallen were exhibited in the forum, according to the disgusting custom which had begun at the death of Sulpicius. Their property was confiscated, and their children and grandchildren were declared of tainted blood and incapable of holding any public office. The sons of the proscribed formed a well-known group of malcontents during the next generation on account of this disability which was now laid upon them. But the proscription was only, in Sulla's estimation, a necessary preliminary to the great work of reconstruction which she had taken in hand. He had resolved to rearrange the whole constitution with the definite object of transferring the sovereignty of the state from the people to the senate. We have already pointed out that in the Roman politics of the last fifty years the main difficulty that lay at the bottom of all disputes was the quarrel for sovereignty. Should the Senate, according to recent usage, or the tribes, according to ancient constitutional theory, be the body that really ruled the city and the empire? Senatus populusque Romanus was a sounding phrase, but neither optimates nor democrats had any love for the mutual interdependence which the words postulated. Now Sulla thought that all the troubles of the time came from the fact that neither Senate nor people had full sovereignty, and as a consistent oligarch and a conscientious party man, he was determined to put the balance of power to an end by conferring complete autocratic authority on his own senatorial order. The optimates had, during the last fifty years, suffered from three different sorts of foes. From unruly tribunes, galvanizing into spasmodic life, the cumbrous but all-powerful machinery of the comitia. From over-great magistrates like Marius or Cinna, who renewed their power from year to year and kept an army at their backs. And 
from the newly created equestrian order the body of financiers fighting for their own interests by the power of the purse however sordid and anti-national these interests might be sulla's laws so far as they dealt with things political resolved themselves into an ingenious and systematic attempt to break down the power of all these three enemies of the state the comitia tributa and its tribunes the great magistrates and the equites if all three were politically annihilated there would be for the future no check on the omnipotence of the senate the dictator's object was to combine the maximum of real with the minimum of formal change, for though he was himself completely emancipated from that slavish respect for the letter of the Constitution which swayed the average Roman, he knew that this was the case neither with his friends nor with his enemies. The hardest blows were aimed at the most powerful enemies, the tribunes and the comitia tributa whose power of issuing and repealing any laws that they pleased had been the greatest danger to the senate as long as any democratic tribune could bring forward whatever laws he chose and as long as such laws when passed by the plebeian assembly became binding on the state there was no security against a reaction which might annul the whole of the cornelian laws the moment that their author should have passed away sulla's action against the comitia was very ingenious he made no pretense of abolishing it or of abrogating the omnipotence of such bills as it might pass he only determined that no dangerous bill should ever come before it this was accomplished by reviving and making indisputably valid the old claim of the senate that every law should of right be laid before them and receive their auctoritas or certificate of legality before the tribune introduced it to the assembly now obviously such bills as the senate would pass on as harmless and useful would be measures that did not cut short their own authority or clash with their ideas of expediency sulla therefore compelled the comitia to pass a law which made the grant of a senatus auctoritas a necessary preliminary for the production of a law before the people henceforth as he hoped there would be no chance of tiresome and dangerous bills for land redistribution or corn doles or grants of abnormal powers to magistrates being passed by the assembly all such schemes if broached in the senate would be stifled there and go no farther no measure of a democratic complexion would ever reach the comitia all that the people would be able to do would be to reject bills sent down to them with the senatorial sanction if they had the pluck to contradict the governing power in the state their power of initiation would be gone thus reduced to impotence the assembly was no longer an object of dread to sulla and for that reason he did not think it worth while to abolish it or even to turn out from it the hordes of italians whom cinna had thrust into the midst of the old citizens he made no attempt either to confine them to a few tribes or to suspend their franchise thus he kept to the letter of the promise which he had made to the new citizens when he landed at brundisium personally as an old aristocrat sulla probably felt much less contempt for the italians than for the original plebs urbana what he thought of the freedmen who were so prominent a feature in that body may be guessed from the fact that he not only put them all back into the four city tribes but actually foisted in among them in a single day no less than ten thousand voters of the lowest class enfranchised slaves of those who had fallen in his own proscription they all took him as their patron and adopted his name of cornelius which was henceforth one of the commonest appellations in the slums to destroy completely the powers of the plebeian assembly as an element in the constitution it was necessary not merely to subordinate its legislative functions to those of the senate but to cut short the dangerous and anarchical privileges of its presiding magistrates the tribunes some legislators would have abolished the tribunate altogether and considering the way in which tiberius gracchus and saturninus had used it there would have been a fair excuse for doing so sulla however merely resolved that he would invent rules which should for the future keep tribunes out of mischief 
it was not enough that a senatus auctoritas should be required for any bill that they might bring forward he determined that they should for the future be non-entities men unlikely to disturb the state by their personal ascendancy or ambition this end was secured by the ingenious law which provided that for the future the acceptance of the tribunate should be a complete bar to the holding of any subsequent magistracy in the state the man who chose to be a tribune would put himself out of the running for any further political promotion but in spite of this disability it was conceivable that an ambitious man might become tribune with the intention not of sacrificing any external career but of being perpetually re-elected to this office like gaius gracchus of old sulla provided against this possibility by repealing the law of b c one twenty nine which had made it legal for a man to hold the tribunate in successive years he enacted that tribunes and as we shall see other magistrates also should not be chosen again without an interval of ten years between their two tenures of the post thus it was secured that for the future no man of more than fifth-rate ambition would become a tribune since by putting in for a nomination he cut himself off from all hope of a brilliant and continuous public career but even the nobodies who would now hold the office were not to be left shackled only by their own nothingness sulla gave the senate a power of fining the tribunes for any conduct that it might consider illegal or unbecoming so that they had to live in awe of the governing body all their days if they held too many noisy public meetings or dared to use their veto freely they might find themselves saddled with a crushing penalty and reduced to poverty the only power in short which remained untouched among the tribune's privileges was that which he had been given when the office was first invented in the days of the early republic the use auxilii ferendi or right to intervene in behalf of the individual roman citizen who might be suffering oppression having dealt thus with the tribunes and the assembly sulla had next to take in hand the second power in the state which was dangerous to the sovereignty of the senate that of the individual magistrates according to the theory of the roman constitution the consul or praetor deriving his authority directly from the people because he had been elected by them in the comitia centuriata had a very independent position in face of the senate that body indeed had in early days been nothing more than the band of advisers chosen by the consul whose monitions he was equally free to accept or reject even in these latter times a headstrong consul could practically disregard the voice of the senate for his whole term of office and if he was chosen for several years in succession he could go on administering things much as he pleased without being restrained to any appreciable extent such had been the position of marius during the years of the cimbric war and of cinna in b c eighty six to eighty four sulla therefore had to guard against the ambition of the magistrates of the future his main weapon for this end was his lex annalis this law provided that all the offices of the state must be taken in strict rotation first the quaestorship then the praetorship and lastly the consulate no one was to hold two offices in successive years and the different limits of age prescribed for each secured that a considerable time must elapse between the tenure of them otherwise of course an ambitious politician might by taking aedileship praetorship and consulate in successive years get a long spell of continuous power and make himself permanently disagreeable to the senate much less was it to be permitted that any magistrate should hold the same office continuously one of sulla's ordinances was to the effect that there must be a gap of no less than ten years before a man could be re-elected to the same post we have already come across this provision when dealing with the tribunate there would therefore no longer be any place in the constitution for a marius or a cinna but in the true oligarchic style each man would get his turn and no man more than his turn every politician would be able to calculate with precision when he ought to hold each office without the danger arising that some interloper of genius might swoop down and monopolize the series of praetorships or consulships that ought to have been divided among half a dozen minor persons 
End of section 11. Section 12 of Seven Roman Statesmen of the Later Republic by Charles Oman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 5 Sulla, Part 4. It is curious to note that Sulla, with all his astuteness, overlooked one fact that an ambitious proconsul in a province at the head of an army might be quite as troublesome to the Senate as an ambitious consul at Rome proposing laws to the people. Yet his own career ought to have taught him that a governor in Greece or Gaul with half a dozen faithful legions was the greatest danger of all. He did realize the peril, as it would seem, but merely provided against it by enacting that any imperator who crossed the frontier of his province at the head of an army or refused to quit it within a month of his successor's arrival should become ipso facto a public enemy. This no doubt clearly defined high treason, but it gave no sufficient security against it. The Republic was ultimately to be overthrown by an adventurer of this kind, by a provincial governor who dared to cross the Rubicon, whatever might be the legal consequence, because he was well aware that his allegiance would follow him against any enemy whom he might choose to indicate to them. The real remedy against this peril would have been to separate the military from the civil command in each province, to have a governor who was merely an administrator, and a commander-in-chief who reported directly to the Senate, but this plan does not seem to have entered into the dictator's mind. Sulla made a large increase in the number of the annual magistrates, raising the praetors to eight and the quaestors to twenty, but it is improbable that he intended, as some have supposed, to decrease the importance of each office by multiplying the numbers of those who held it. Incidentally, this result might follow, but it is probable that the dictator was merely studying the convenience of the state, for till his day the administration was decidedly undermanned. Nor again does it seem to be true that he deliberately deprived the consuls of their military power for their year of office by arranging that they should stay in Rome, where no legions would be at their disposal, and only utilize their imperium when they went out as proconsuls to their provinces in the succeeding year. The usage that the consul should remain at home unless urgent military matters drew him out of Italy had already begun to grow up before Sulla's time. And on the other hand, there are a few cases after his death in which the consul left the city and assumed command of an army before his year had expired, for example, this was certainly done by Cotta and Lucullus in the first year of the Third Mithridatic War. It would seem that Sulla made the quaestorship qualify its holder for a seat in the Senate, so that the governing body of the state was no longer filled up by the censors, but recruited automatically from the influx of young magistrates. In this way he abolished the necessity for a censorship, and made the Senate independent of the likes and dislikes of individual holders of that office. Having thus muzzled the tribunes and curbed the consuls, Sulla had next to deal with the third enemy of the Senate, the equestrian order. It will be remembered that a disproportionate share of the massacre of the fourth proscription had fallen upon them. No less than 1,600 had been put to death, so that the democratic wing of the knighthood had been almost exterminated. At the other end of the line, Sulla had promoted a very large number of equites of optimate views to a seat in the Senate, so that in legislating against the body, he was not striking at his own friends. His object was to loosen the bonds which held together the rather heterogeneous classes which formed the equestrian order. These bonds were firstly their honorary privileges, the Augusti Clawe Toga, the Gold Ring, and the rows of reserved seats in circus and theatre. Secondly, their monopoly of the control of the jury courts, which they had used so unscrupulously as a weapon against the Senate and the provincial magistrates. Thirdly, their tax-farming privileges, especially the most profitable enactment of Gaius Gracchus, which handed over the collecting of the tithes of Asia to the Societates. 
Sulla, therefore, launched a whole series of measures against the equestrian order. One bill took away the entire control of the law courts from them and restored it to the senators. Once more the latter became the only persons eligible as jurymen, as in the days before Gaius Gracchus. They could look forward to being tried by a friendly instead of a hostile court if they incurred prosecution and were able to audit their own accounts inside the family. The equites suffered, but not the empire, for the previous state of things had been so bad that any change must have profited the provincials. A second bill put an end to the system of tax farming in Asia, and imposed on each of its cities a fixed tribute instead of the tithes. This was an enormous boon to the Asiatics, but probably the way in which the measure commended itself to Sulla's mind had nothing to do with their point of view. He made the change because it would be unpalatable to the knights, who lost an unparalleled source of money-making when the tax-farming disappeared. We may compare him to the Puritans of old, who abolished bear-baiting, not because it was cruel to the bear, but because it gave so much pleasure to the audience. Yet another bill of which the details have unfortunately perished would seem to have deprived the equites of many of their honorary privileges, especially of their seats in the circus. These they did not recover to the law of Roscius Otto restored them in B.C. 67. There were many other Cornelian laws outside the three great groups with which we have been dealing. One abolished the corn dole, a most admirable measure, for which we should admire the dictator more if we could only suppose that he was acting on economic reasons and not merely doing his best to disoblige the urban multitude. Others systematized the organization of the law courts, which had hitherto been arranged in a very haphazard fashion. Very prominent among his innovations was the law which added new courts for the trial of criminal offenses, quaestiones perpetuae, to those already existing, so that every form of offence had for the future its proper venue. But of these legal matters we have no leisure to speak. Nor need we say much concerning his colonial schemes. He settled many of his veterans in Etruria and Samnium, on the lands of the cities which he had destroyed, for obstinate adherence to the democratic cause, but he can hardly have expected his colonies to prove economic successes considering the character of the settlers who had long been estranged from the soil and the indisputable fact that farming had long ceased to pay in central italy they were no doubt merely intended to last out sulla's own day and to supply him for a time with a compact block of adherents accustomed to arms and cantoned in the close vicinity of rome it is a curious commentary on the wisdom of the step that ruined sullen veterans formed sixteen years later an appreciable element in the army of Catiline. Sulla, as everyone knows, laid down his dictatorship in January B.C. 79, after holding it for two years, when he had passed all his long code of constitutional enactments and had seen the last embers of civil war die down, he laid aside the trappings of power and retired into private life. He had no personal ambition, and when his work was finished and the new constitution had been set going, he resolved to let it have the chance of a fair start without the danger of overbalance caused by the perpetual presence of his own mighty personality. For the sullen regime had in it no place for Sulla's. The whole scheme of laws had been framed to keep down over great men, and he was well aware that he was himself over great. As a conscientious oligarch, it was his duty to remove himself from power and to resign the abnormal office that he had held throughout B.C. 81 and 80. His function for the future was to stand by, outside the machine, to watch it work, and to step in to lend his aid if ever it showed signs of getting out of gear. His notion of how the new constitution could best be maintained may be gathered from the curious story of the death of Lucretius Ophella. That distinguished officer, the captor of Prineste, so far presumed on his late services that he boldly proposed to break Sulla's lex analis by standing for the consulate before he had held the praetorship. 
Sulla gave him fair warning that he would not be allowed to take the office, but he refused to listen and made a formal canvass in the form after the usual style. While Ofella was going his rounds with his white toga in the crowded marketplace, his chief quietly told two centurions to cut him down. They did so, and when an uproar began, Sulla stepped forward to take all the blame and responsibility and to offer to stand his trial for murder. No one dared to come forward as a prosecutor, and so he got off scot-free. The story has several morals. Clearly, the Constitution was still so weak that an ambitious man could venture to attack it ere it was but two years old. Only Sulla himself could defend it, but as long as he survived it was safe. If he could have looked forward to twenty years of life, he might have dragooned the Roman people into an acceptance of it, but he was already elderly and ailing. Innovators should start young and live long, like the Emperor Augustus. What would have happened to the imperial system if Augustus had died at the age of forty, instead of living on till he was seventy-six? No doubt Sulla's constitution was doomed from the first to failure but at any rate the experiment of restoring the oligarchy was worth trying. The opposite political device of the Democrats, that of endeavouring to transact all the business of the city and the empire in the Comitia, had proved utterly impracticable. Under Sinna's domination such a regime had been working for nearly four years with the most deplorable results. The popular programme had been tried and found wanting. It had run to nothing more than corn largesses and the repudiation of debts. At the touch of the sword, the democratic government had fallen to pieces merely because it commanded neither respect nor affection from any quarter. Sulla's scheme, to set up a senate unhampered by any other power in the state, and possessing full and complete sovereignty, was at least equally worth a trial— it failed no doubt mainly from the want of men able and willing to work the system when the old dictator had passed away, for he left behind him a senate most unfitted to carry on his great plan, not a number of men of good average ability, each ready to take his turn of duty and power, and not desirous of grasping it more, but quite the opposite sort of assembly, a multitude of non-entities and incapables mixed with a few ambitious young generals. The heart and core of the old optimate party had perished in the Marian massacres. In spite of all its faults, the Senate, down to the days of the Civil War, had always contained a certain number of men of mark and respectability, persons such as Antonius the orator, Catullus the victor over the Cimbri, Crassus the father of the triumvir, the consuls Octavius and Merula. All these had been slain by Marius and Cinna. Of the optimate senators, none survived, save those who had been protected by their own insignificance, and the few who had been absent with Sulla in Greece when the civil war broke out. The reconstructed Senate of B.C. 81, therefore, was mainly composed of a mass of trivial and unimportant persons whose nothingness had caused them to escape Sinna's eye. But seated among them were the military men, who had come to the front during the fighting, such as Ophella, Crassus, and Pompey. These young generals, as was but natural, were not content to take their single turn of power and office in company with the herd of nobodies. They were ambitious and yearned for the carrière ouverte au talon, in which the able man could not only reach the front but stay there. The slow oligarchic rotation which Sulla had invented was odious to them, and they were in the end driven to overthrow the new constitution in order that they might be able to assert themselves over the mediocrities. There was no resisting power among the majority, no true heir of Sulla's breed survived to bind them together and to rally them to fight in behalf of the oligarchic system, so the great dictator's constitution fell almost undefended only ten years after it had been created. This, at any rate, was not Sulla's fault. He did his best with the material set before him, he constructed the first logical and well-planned constitution that Rome had ever known, a triumph of ingenuity because it changed the essentials while leaving the external features still in existence. It was a thoroughly practical scheme for the governance of city and empire by a pure oligarchy. If it failed, 
it was because the machine was cleverly built but its mainspring was not strong enough to keep the wheels moving that is it demanded that the average senator should attain a certain moderate level of courage capacity and patriotism but the fathers as a body were lacking in all these three essentials in the hands of the senators of the third century before christ the sullen constitution could have been worked but in b c eighty the motive power was too weak through no fault of sulla's and the machine was bound to run down as long as he stood beside it to give the pendulum an occasional swing the clock continued to go when he died it ticked feebly for a short time and then stopped it was ruinous to the oligarchy that sulla should have survived only a little more than a year after he laid down the dictatorship for himself his early death was probably not so unfortunate it saved him from many disappointments even before he died he had suffered one at least in seeing marcus lepidus elected to the consulship contrary to his expressed desire but on the whole his last year was one of prosperity for the first time for many a long day he was free from the cares of office and could live as he pleased his powers of enjoyment do not seem to have been the least impaired by advancing years he had still to make up for that youth spent in involuntary frugality just before he laid down the dictatorship he had married a young wife the story of their first meeting as told by plutarch gives an amazing picture of the light-heartedness of the man who had just waded through all the blood of the proscriptions the dictator was one day presenting the people with a show of gladiators and it chanced that a lady of great beauty and good family sat close behind sulla her name was valeria the daughter of Massala and the sister of hortensius the orator she had lately divorced her first husband this lady coming gently behind sulla pinched off a thread from the edge of his toga and then passed back to her seat but he much amazed at the familiarity looked round at her whereupon she said do not wonder sir at what i have done i had only a mind to get a shred of your good luck sulla was far from being displeased on the contrary it appeared that he was agreeably flattered for he sent to ask her name and to inquire into her family then followed all through the games the exchange of side looks and smiles which ended ultimately in a contract of marriage now it seems to me that sulla though he got a wife of great beauty and accomplishments came into the match on wrong principles for like a boy he was caught with soft looks and languishing airs sulla's last year was spent in his villa in campania near putioli whither he retired and dwelt amid a court of clever and dissolute companions who kept him amused he devoted his time partly to writing his memoirs he finished the twenty-second book of them two days before he died partly to pleasures reputable and disreputable of all sorts the tale that his last months were vexed with a loathsome disease which rendered life insupportable is probably an invention of his enemies it has been attributed to half a dozen well-hated tyrants the last of whom was philip the second of spain but it is certain that sulla died from breaking a blood vessel rather than from any lingering ailment in the leisure of his last year he found time for business he kept a keen eye on roman affairs and drafted a constitution for the neighbouring town of putioli at the request of its inhabitants his last recorded act was a strange and violent interference in politics which much recalls the story of Ophella. the quaestor granius was making himself notorious by embezzlements and openly said that he should escape punishment because the ex-dictator was dying sulla lured him to his bedside by a polite message and then had him seized and strangled in his very presence by his slaves the excitement of the scene caused him to rupture a blood vessel and he died of exhaustion next day his party being still in power he received the most magnificent funeral that rome had ever seen his monument was erected in the most conspicuous part of the campus martius and two centuries later was still visible plutarch says that it bore a curious and characteristic epitaph composed by the dictator himself in which he said that no friend ever did him so much good or enemy so much harm but that he had repaid him with full interest end of section twelve
Section 13 of Seven Roman Statesmen of the Later Republic by Charles Oman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 6 Crassus, Part 1. Napoleon, in one of his cynical moods, once asked his courtiers how the world would take the news of his sudden death, supposing that some chance bullet cut him off before his time. They hastened to give him all sorts of flattering versions of the dismay and regret that would fill all Europe. No, said the emperor, that is not the sort of thing that would happen. All that would occur would be that every one would draw a long breath and say with a sigh of relief, well, that's all over. And so, it may be surmised, did things go at Sulla's death. When men knew that his iron hand would never interfere again in politics, they felt as if a long nightmare were over, and abandoning the assumed characters that they had enacted during his lifetime, dropped back into their real selves. Instead of the majestic and united optimate party which seemed to stand so firm under his protection, there was now only a mass of slack senators who wished to take life quietly with the maximum of enjoyment, and a few ambitious men who felt at last that they could display their ambition without risking their necks. The Senate still contained some men of real ability who were loyal to the oligarchic constitution, such as the Epicurean general Lucullus, Quintus Metellus, who had made a good military reputation, the orator Hortensius, and Catullus, the son of that Catullus who had fought so well against the Cimbri, a somewhat duller reflection of his father's virtues but the great majority were apathetic nobodies, while the two persons who were most important and influential among Sulla's lieutenants were men who disliked the sullen constitution simply because it gave them no scope for the display of the considerable abilities which they possessed and for the satisfaction of their ambition. It is mainly on the doings of these two, Marcus Licinius Crassus and Gnaeus Pompeius, that the politics of the next twenty years were to turn. No two men could have been more unlike in character, but fate was always hurling them together, first as young soldiers in Sulla's camp with fathers to avenge, then later as consuls in the same year, lastly as members of the famous first triumvirate. Of the idiosyncrasies of each of them we must endeavor to gain a firm grasp. At first, however, there were circumstances which kept the ambition and the rivalry of Crassus and Pompey from assuming the importance which they afterwards attained. In 78 BC, men's attention was mainly occupied by certain evils, which as long as Sulla lived had given the government little concern, because they knew that if things grew serious, one nod of Sulla's head would suffice to set them right. When he was removed, these problems suddenly began to cause alarm. First, there was suppressed unrest in Italy. The children of the proscribed, deprived of all political rights, the citizens of the Etruscan towns, who had escaped massacre but had not escaped confiscation, the numerous population in the valley of the Po, who had obtained Latin rights from Pompeius Strabo but wanted to become full citizens, were all discontented. The wrecks of the bands of Carbo and the younger Marius were not entirely dispersed. Some were pirates on the high seas, others freebooters in Mauritania. In Spain, their strongest man, the ex-praetor Sertorius, had raised a really dangerous insurrection, a peril to the state, not so much because it was a lingering remnant of the civil war between Roman and Roman, as because Sertorius was gradually de-Romanizing himself and becoming a Spanish national leader rather than a representative of the old party of the populares. Of him we shall have more to say when we deal with the life of Pompey. As long as Sulla lived, the optimates talked of him as a tiresome survivor of a long-lost cause, much as we talk of Bota or De Vet. After the dictator's death, it became clear that his insurrection far from dying down, was distinctly spreading over a wider area and threatening to tear away the whole of Spain from the Roman Empire. It had already been the death of several incapable optimate generals, 
and the ruin of several small armies the outlook in the west was gloomy but in the year that follows sulla's decease it was not sertorius who seemed the most dangerous foe of the senatorial government their main trouble was caused at home by the vain and heady consul marcus aemilius lepidus who tried in the most reckless fashion to pull down the whole of the new constitution almost before its founder's ashes were cold lepidus was a rash intruding fool whose motive was nothing more than the ill-regulated ambition of a man who does not know his own mediocrity and thirsts to be something great he draped himself in the torn and soiled mantle of saturninus and cinna and appeared in the character of a democratic saviour of society now the large majority of the people of rome and of italy disliked the senatorial regime but disliked still more the idea of the recommencement of the civil war and all its horrors the council found little support but contrived to gather in etruria an army of political refugees discontented politicians liberated slaves and even bankrupt sullen veterans the whole of this rising bears an astonishing resemblance to the doings of catiline in the same district fifteen years later it failed in much the same way when lepidus led his horde against the city the senate hastily fitted out an army against him under catullus these raw levies were just ready when the ex-consul reached the tiber and actually crossed it at the mulvian bridge and entered the compass martius here among the monuments and polling booths catullus and his legions met him and gave him a severe defeat he retreated into etruria took ship to escape his pursuers and died immediately after in sardinia whither he had fled the strongest body of his followers that held together was defeated by pompey in cisalpine gaul and its leader marcus brutus was captured and executed at mutina only a small part of lepidus's insurrectionary host headed by the praetor perpenna escaped by sea and went to join sertorius in spain there the insurgents were making marked progress they carried all before them and were not even checked when pompey in the next year led a considerable army of reinforcements from italy against them while the revolt of sertorius was taxing all the energies of rome there were two other important struggles in progress the first was the renewed war with mithridates an ill-managed and interminable struggle in which the king of pontus whom sulla had beaten with such ease and rapidity baffled all the roman generals for ten years so that even the very capable lucius lucullus the best general of really loyal mind whom the senate possessed could not entirely subdue him though he beat him in battle often enough the third and the most difficult and disgraceful of the three military problems with which the oligarchy had to deal in these troublous years was the great slave rising in italy under the thracian spartacus who beat ten roman armies and equipped forty thousand men with their spoils though he had started as the leader of no more than seventy-eight runaway gladiators scandalous as it appeared the senate could not prevent the untrained hordes of spartacus from ranging over the whole of italy from the po to the straits of regium for several years he marched and countermarched among the apennines like a second hannibal and won battles over the incapable optimate generals that were in their way hardly less notable than trebia or trasimene the government whose weakness provoked and whose incapacity protracted the three disastrous wars with sertorius mithridates and spartacus deserved to fall it only needed some one more able than the vain lepidus to lead the attack on the sullen state system and it was bound to crumble down but the blow was to be given not by one man but by two pompey was returning from spain on the one side on the other crassus was about to come to the front of him we have now to speak in detail hitherto we have barely mentioned his name marcus licinius crassus had been born in or about the year b c 107 we have already had occasion to tell how his father crassus the ex-consul and his elder brother publius fell in the great massacre of b c 87 hunted down by the gangs of marius 
but marcus the younger son escaped through untold perils to spain where he lay hid for many months in a cave by the seashore when he emerged from his lurking place it was to become a freebooter on the high seas at last he heard that sulla had returned to italy and sailed to join him at the head of his band of outlaws he applied to the proconsul for a military command and a detachment of troops i can only said sulla give you as helpers the ghosts of your murdered father and brother crassus quite understood his chief's meaning the optimate army was so small that there was not a man to spare the spur of revenge must serve him instead of regular resources with no more than his original band of outlaws he made a dash into marcian territory and there succeeded in raising a considerable body of troops when sulla advanced into central italy crassus guarded his flank after rome fell he was sent up into etruria where he did good service against carbo and his crew but his most striking exploit was that he saved the fortune of the day at the battle of the colline gate his wing it will be remembered was successful while that of sulla was broken and pushed back to the walls it was only delivered in the end by the help of crassus who used his own victorious legions to save his leader from destruction at the end of the civil war then crassus had achieved a brilliant military reputation of all the optimate generals there were none who were more esteemed save pompey and the ambitious and ill-fated lucretius ofella the latter was soon cut off but with the former crassus had already started that rivalry which was to endure throughout both their lives as the elder man he bitterly resented the fact that sulla always gave the high place to pompey and honoured him with a distinction and a confidence that he accorded to no other of his subordinates nevertheless crassus might have gone far and have been reckoned among the leading lights of his party if he had not managed to offend the dictator and to get himself marked down as a man who was not to be trusted hitherto his career reads like that of an adventurous soldier but in his last campaign he was beginning to show the traits which were to be so prominent in his later life that unscrupulous greed for money and that indifference as to the means by which it was to be got which were to be alike his strength and his weakness during the rest of his life sulla's anger with crassus arose from two sinister incidents at the siege of tudor in umbria crassus had captured the military chest of the democratic consuls instead of handing over its contents to the treasury he embezzled the whole for his private profit later in the war being in command in lucania and brudium he committed the unpardonable offence of slaying some local magnates whose names had never appeared in the proscription list and seized their wealth for himself now sulla though he was ruthless in bloodshedding had a system in all that he did and objected to seeing his plans for weakening the democratic party turn to the use of private greed he was deeply incensed at crassus for slaying men uncondemned by himself and when his command ran out sent him into private life with a bad mark against his name he did not prosecute him or drive him out of the senate but simply noted him down as a man not to be trusted or employed having lost his military career and being barred out of political advancement crassus turned his energies into money-making and laid the foundation of the vast fortune which he was to accumulate by lucky speculations in the property of the proscribed the italian money market was glutted with lands houses and investments belonging to the fallen democrats the man who had a little spare money to invest could at this moment buy up great masses of property which would recover their value in a few years when the glut and the panic was over and italy had settled down into quiet crassus had not very great paternal wealth his own moderate fortune reached the competent but not startling total of three hundred talents some seventy-five thousand of our money but he had amassed great sums by plunder during the war and he boldly sank every sesterce that he could scrape together in buying up depreciated lands and houses in and about rome he had his reward within a short time 
when public confidence had been restored and prices had risen to their old level, he found himself a millionaire. What his wealth was at this period we cannot say, but at a later time it amounted, after a year of exceptional expense and all sorts of political corruption, to no less than 7,100 talents, 1,770,000 pounds of our money. While Sulla still lived and while the oligarchy still held together after his death, Crassus, excluded from public life, went on conquering and to conquer in the world of finance. Plutarch gives us most extraordinary details as to his ingenious and often undignified methods of money-making. Not only did he lend money at high rates of interest, both to Roman senators and to provincial municipalities, but he invented strange devices of his own. One of them was his school for the education of slaves. He used to buy the raw material and have them trained as readers, bookkeepers, stewards, and cooks. It is said that he not only supervised the school, but often gave lectures himself in the cooking of accounts rather than of entrees, it is to be presumed. The slaves who had been through his academy sold at much enhanced prices. Still more astonishing was his amateur fire brigade in the way in which he used it. He got together a body of five hundred workmen, carpenters, masons, and the like, provided them with ropes, buckets, ladders, and tools, Whenever there was a fire, and fires were common as they were dangerous in the crowded city, he went down at the head of his gang and called on householders whose property was in the immediate neighborhood of the conflagration. He then offered to buy their houses as they stood at a very low figure. If the terrified owner consented, the fire brigade was turned on and the mansion generally preserved. If he refused, Crassus went away with his men and let the fire do its worst. Hence, in time, says Plutarch, he became master of a very appreciable part of the house property of Rome. Historians have often written of this bold speculator as if money-making was his main purpose in life and politics no more than a diversion to him. But he was no mere money-bag, no gatherer of wealth for its own sake without any further end. Crassus was even more ambitious than greedy, and his large accumulations of money were made for the definite end of raising himself to a high place in the state. They err who represent him merely as an ingenious and shameless financier. Crassus had felt bitterly the ostracism from public affairs to which Sulla had condemned him, and he was determined to win his way back to a prominent part in politics. Since the oligarchy had banished him from their ranks as a corrupt and untrustworthy member, he would get back to power by taking up the cause against which he had fought so strenuously in his youth. Crassus had, in reality, nothing of the Democrat in him. The only point on which he touched the sympathies of the Democratic Party was that, by his enormous money-making and the place to which he had risen in the world of finance, he had made himself the king and lord of the whole tribe of the Publicani, who, as members of the equestrian order, had been so badly maltreated by Sulla, and who were therefore constrained to fall back on their old alliance with the populares. Except in the fact that his interests were bound up with this class, he had no further connection in feeling or sympathy with the Democrats. The basis of the influence which Crassus wielded was no doubt his importance as the leader of the equestrian order and the publicani, one by the fact that he was concerned in all their financial ventures. But it was not only in commercial circles that he had extended his influence. It was his object to make himself a power by having as many persons as possible of all classes interested in his success and bound to him by obligations of one sort or another. Two of his methods are especially dwelt on by Plutarch. The first was his willingness to act as patron to anyone who applied to him, and his constant appearance in the law courts to defend all manner of clients. He was not a first-rate speaker, tending to be dull and prolix, but he always got up his brief, and often beat better men because he came prepared with facts, while they relied merely on eloquent declamation or personal abuse. Often when Hortensius or Cicero had refused to take up a case, he would undertake it, 
for he considered few persons too unimportant to be worth serving an obliging even an unctuous manner and a real capacity for taking pains in small things gained him many dependents he never neglected to return a salutation and could address an almost incredible number of citizens by their proper names in this respect he was just the opposite of his opponent pompey who was gauche and ungracious his other method of winning influence was the more practical one of getting into his net any man who seemed likely to be useful by offering to lend him money pushing young men who took to politics he was most eager to oblige not charging too heavy interest nor sometimes any interest at all he lost enormous sums of money in this way for of course he was frequently repaid neither the capital nor the interest but he got instead what he cared for even more than money a personal influence over all kinds of people in the most various walks of life so that he could pull the wires in all manner of political circles without his hand appearing for of course his debtors would do anything to keep him quiet it is this personal consideration which explains the indulgence which the senate showed him there were so many individuals in it who owed him money that their collective influence prevented him from suffering at the hands of the whole oligarchic party still these supporters were purely interested and venal and not to be relied upon like richard the third as described by moore with large gifts he gat him unsteadfast friendship the reappearance of crassus in politics came about owing to the disasters which the senate suffered in the war with spartacus several considerable armies commanded by oligarchic nonentities had been destroyed by the brigand and his horde who ranged all over southern italy at their will resolved at last to look for a competent soldier of approved capacity the senate was almost forced to use crassus who as we have already seen had gained a reputation in the civil war second only to that of pompey the other two possible men were unavailable pompey was in spain fighting sertorius lucullus in the east fighting mithridates when appointed general crassus set to work at once to discipline the beaten and demoralized legions which were handed over to him by his predecessor in command he tried all methods with them both those of persuasion and those of punishment on one occasion he is said to have used to a legion which had disbanded in the face of the enemy the terrible old punishment of decimation if we may use the word for he took by lot one man in every fifty not in every ten and put him to death whether by fear or by the good and regular pay and provisions which he secured for his men crassus got them into a better fighting mood than they had shown of late and gave spartacus the first check that he had received at last he blocked him up by a circumvallation near regium in the tip of the brutian peninsula the rebel burst out losing many men in the attempt but was chased north by crassus who at last caught him and his main body in the open field and slew them all in a battle in lucania only scattered bands got away to the north the war was practically settled when pompey suddenly appeared upon the scene the young general who was to be crassus's rival and yet his ally had just put an end to the spanish war favoured as we shall see by the lucky chance that sertorius had been murdered by his own jealous lieutenants returning with his army he caught the last bands of the defeated rebels as they tried to escape across northern italy and cut them up for this pompey took over great credit remarking that crassus had beat spartacus indeed but that he himself had torn up the war by the roots End of section thirteen. Section 14 of Seven Roman Statesmen of the Later Republic by Charles Ullman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 6 Crassus, Part 2. Two generals with two victorious armies were now approaching Rome from the north and the south, respectively. Both were able and ambitious, and both detested the constitution of Sulla and the senatorial oligarchy which stood in the way of their holding continued power 
but they also hated each other as much as they hated the senate and were inspired with the bitterest jealousy the all-important question was whether they would fight or whether they would prefer to join their forces against the optimates it was the latter alternative that they chose pompey was too irresolute and conscientious in his own way to strike hard to win a tyranny crassus had the smaller army and dreaded the military abilities of his rival hence it came to pass that they agreed to join in a campaign against the senate and the sullen constitution they stood for the consulship for b c seventy keeping their legions outside the gates as a threat to the people and senate the populace indeed did not need the threat and was ready to do anything which would annoy the fathers so pompey and crassus were duly elected consuls under the eyes as it were of their respective armies it was a mere compromise which satisfied neither of them for each thought the other's presence very unnecessary but since they were not prepared to fight and neither of them had a real conception of a policy nor a definite idea of what he himself really wanted pompey nor crassus could not ask or receive any more so these two ambitious men masquerading as democrats undid the constitution of sulla at their leisure meeting no opposition from the demoralized senate without a man of genius to lead them or an army to oppose to the two great hosts of pompey and crassus the optimates could do absolutely nothing their one great fighting man lucullus was still in the east and could not be called from thence to play the part of sulla firstly because he had no wish to do so being as careless as he was able and secondly because he could not have trusted his army to follow him in spite of all his victories he was most unpopular with his soldiery when pompey and crassus had been installed in office they proceeded to introduce a series of laws which destroyed all the main features of the sullen constitution but as we shall see they put nothing in the place of that which they were destroying and the only result of their so-called reforms was to restore the constitutional chaos and the conflict of sovereignties which had prevailed in rome from the rise of the gracchi down to sulla's legislation of b c eighty one the fact is that they were bent not on supplying rome with a workable state system nor even on harking back to the old democratic projects of saturninus and cinna but merely on smashing up those sections of the cornelian laws which stood in the way of their own ambitions if they added some other measures to their legislative output it was partly to achieve a little cheap popularity partly to make a show of having a real constructive program of their own a thing which was in fact non-existent as a first measure the various securities which sulla had provided to protect the senate against disturbance were now done away with once more as in old times the tribunes were to be permitted to propose laws to the public assembly without having first obtained the senate's leave the other disability which had been imposed on them by sulla that of never being allowed to stand for any other office if once they had chosen to take the tribunate seems already to have been removed by a law passed in b c seventy five by gaius cotta but this relief was a mere nothing to the boon now granted by pompey and crassus the right to deal with the people without any senatus auctoritas was the real strength of the tribunate in all ages secondly and in this point crassus was particularly interested the equestrian order of which he was the patron and lord was restored to its old position in the state the knights were given back the privilege of farming the taxes of asia which sulla had taken from them moreover the lex aurelia restored to them once more a predominant share in the law courts they did not obtain as in the days of gaius gracchus a monopoly of judicial power for in future juries were to be made up of three classes of citizens one-third were to be senators one-third equites one-third tribuni irarii but the knights seem to have secured something like their old control because the third order the tribuni irarii were from their fortune and tendencies much more akin to them than to the senators indeed they were in a sense members of the equester ordo 
This elaborate subdivision of classes in the courts does not seem, if we may trust Cicero and other witnesses, to have made any sensible improvement in the justice which Roman juries dispensed. It was almost inevitable that Pompey and Crassus, seeking to ingratiate themselves with the Roman multitude, should hearken back to the most popular and the most pernicious item of the old democratic program by developing again the corn dole, whose abolition had been by far the best of Sulla's measures. But to buy support from any class by lavish expenditure, whether from his own or from the public purse, was a regular part of Crassus's system. A moderate and limited amount of distribution had been restored as early as B.C. 78, but the consuls of B.C. 70 presented every citizen with corn for three months without exacting any payment. Crassus is also said to have given an enormous public dinner to the populace at the Feast of Hercules, at which all comers were entertained at 10,000 tables laid down the streets. Another political move of the consuls was the restoration of the censorship, which had been practically in abeyance since Sulla's time. The first new censors, Cornelius Clodianus and Gellius Poplicola, celebrated their advent by a wholesale eviction of sullen partisans from the Senate, which they could do all the more plausibly because many of the sufferers were men of blemished reputation. It will be remembered that the ex-consul Lentulus, the associate of Catiline, was one of the victims of this purging. He was expelled for what the censors called luxury, that is, notorious evil living. It is most noteworthy that Pompey and Crassus did not include in their legislation two measures which any genuine Democrat would have been certain to insert in his program. The first was the cancelling of the effect of the sullen proscription, it would have been natural to secure the return of the exiles and to restore their status as citizens to the sons of the proscribed, whom the dictator had deprived of so many rights. The second obvious measure would have been the institution of an inquiry into the awful deeds of murder and robbery which had been perpetrated without any shadow of legality during and previous to the dictatorship. The reason why these subjects were left untouched was that Crassus himself had been deeply implicated in the worst part of the proscription. He had put men to death illegally, he had seized on lands without any good title, and had bought up wholesale the property of the proscribed. Pompey, too, had some acts to his account which would not have looked well when investigated in a court of law, such as the executions of Carbo and Marcus Brutus, they had no doubt been declared outlaws by the Senate, but the officer who had put them to death would have felt some qualms in the days of a real democratic reaction. It was therefore impossible for the consuls of B.C. 70 to raise either of these questions as it would have entailed inquiry into their own conduct, and in the case of Crassus the surrender of masses of ill-gotten property. It was not till a real democratic program was being brought forward somewhat later by Julius Caesar that the idea of the punishment of the people's enemies was mooted by the celebrated trial of Rabirius for the murder of Saturninus. As to the rank and file of Sulla's assassins, the only person who ever took arms against them was one of their own party, the stern and rigid Cato, who, when he was quaestor, insisted on recovering from them the blood money which the dictator had issued to them without legal warrant. Though allied to overthrow the supremacy of the Senate, Pompey and Crassus did not learn to love each other any the better during their year of joint office. Their quarrels were unending. They differed about every measure that came before them, and these disputes and altercations prevented each of them from doing many things on which he was set. It was this notorious enmity which led to a curious scene at the end of their year. When it came to be time for them to make their final orations to the people on quitting office, there stood forward a certain knight named Gaius Aurelius, a person of no note, who said that Jupiter had appeared to him in a vision and commanded him to tell the Romans that it would not be lucky for them if they allowed their consuls to remain unreconciled wherefore he suggested that they should embrace in public. At this unpalatable proposal the two magistrates were much disturbed, 
each stood lowering at his own corner of the rostra but when the people continued shouting for a long space of time that the consuls must be reconciled crassus at least constrained himself for he was far the better hypocrite of the two went up to pompey and offered him his hand with a well-turned compliment they embraced and parted and hated each other rather more than before the humorous aurelius must have extracted huge enjoyment from the little comedy the two years that followed the resignation of the consuls on december thirty first b c seventy are most difficult to understand we should have expected that the enmity of pompey and crassus would have led them into some open outbreak against each other the moment that they had ceased to be colleagues but nothing of the kind happened it seemed as if each had destroyed his rival's power of initiative they remained watching each other and did nothing more the senate which had thought that its last day had been at hand was able to breathe again and to seek feebly to reassert itself it had been generally expected that pompey would choose some important province and would provide himself with another army to replace that which he had disbanded after his spanish triumph but this was far from his thoughts before his consulate expired he expressly disclaimed any such idea and for the whole of sixty nine to sixty eight he remained quietly in rome living the life of a private citizen probably the sight of his rival in retirement soothed down the anger of crassus who had half expected him to aim at a tyranny for he too kept quiet and relapsed into his normal round of money-making and wire-pulling on the back stairs side of politics so things remained the two great men keeping each other under close observation but making no offensive move till pompey was at last called away by the gabinian law b c sixty seven which gave him the command against the pirates in consequence of this commission and of the subsequent manilian law which transferred to him the command against mithridates he was absent from rome for nearly seven years crassus had at first intrigued against the assignation of such important charges to his rival yet when he was gone was glad to see the political stage left clear for his own action while pompey was away he would have a better chance of convincing the roman people that he was their true friend and of carrying out his plans for his own personal aggrandizement but as we shall see all the political intrigues of crassus failed while pompey in the distant east was adding laurels to laurels in a way that kept his name perpetually before the citizens and made it probable that when he should return with his army at his back he might ask for anything that he chose with a perfect certainty of receiving it we seem to trace in the doings of crassus during pompey's absence in the east a progressive series of measures by which he hoped to commend himself to the democratic party and to establish himself as their leader so firmly that his position should be unassailable on his rival's return he had now bought himself a most able managing partner in the person of julius caesar whose first prominent appearance in politics belongs to these years the young man possessed the two gifts of eloquence and geniality in which both crassus and pompey were so hopelessly lacking but at this period of his career he was impecunious and a trifle disreputable no one foresaw in him the future dictator and the founder of the monarchy at this time he was absorbing crassus's money at a preposterous rate and flinging it about with both hands men looked upon him much as they looked upon clodius ten years later and never suspected that the lieutenant of crassus was more than a splendid mob orator and a skilled manager of corner boys the chief landmarks of this period of crassus's political career are a series of bids for popularity which failed to produce the desired effect as kensor in b c sixty five he tried to enroll as full citizens the entire population of cisalpine gaul but his colleague catullus refused to recognize the grant and the optimates continued to deny it right down to the civil war another and more ambitious scheme was the bill to annex egypt in the same year 
the chief object of which seems to have been to find an excuse for giving caesar an army which might serve as a counterpoise to that of pompey but the senate succeeded in stopping the design a little later it would seem that the democrats were growing more desperate caesar's attack on Riberius was a warning to the optimates that extreme measures might be tried against them if they stood in the way of his employer's road to power but the bill of servilius rulus was far more startling it styled itself an agrarian law but was much more like a measure for suspending the constitution with the ostensible object of relieving economic distress at rome it proposed to create a body of decemvirs with far greater powers than the triumviri agris dandis assignandis of tiberius gracchus had ever held these land commissioners, of whom Crassus and Caesar were to be the chiefs, were to be granted the military imperium and the right to levy troops. They were to be permitted to select two hundred subaltern officers from among the equites, to have power to sell the public lands in Italy and in the provinces, to plant colonies, to take out of the treasury whatever they wished, and to sit in judgment in all lawsuits which might arise from their own proceedings considering that the law was mainly levelled against pompey for it was of him rather than of the senate that crassus was in fear it was adding insult to injury to place the public lands and revenues of syria and the other newly annexed eastern provinces at the disposition of the land commissioners the immense machinery provided by rulus was so disproportionate to the task which had had to serve and the power given to the decemvirs so inordinate their very name recalled the old tyrannical ten of b c four fifty one to four fifty and the misdoings of appius claudius that the bill failed to pass cicero headed against it a combination of the optimates and the friends of pompey who when allied proved able to triumph over the democrats in spite of all the bribes of crassus and all the eloquence of caesar but the agrarian law of rulus was not the strangest project that was attributed to the two democratic leaders there were many who accused them of being implicated also in the reckless plots of lucius sergius catalina it is impossible to arrive at any certain conclusion concerning the character and scope of the so-called catalinarian conspiracies if we were to accept in its entirety the official narrative which was composed by cicero and practically embodied wholesale in sallust and most other historians we should regard the participation of crassus in the designs of catiline as most improbable we are told that the leader of the plot was a monster of depravity a sort of malignant demon in human form who after spending his early years in murdering his relatives and debauching all the youth of rome wished in his middle age to inaugurate a reign of caides and incendium to massacre the senate burn the city and rule as a tyrant among the corpses and the smoking ruins if there were any truth in all this we should conclude that crassus as the largest householder in rome was not likely to be privy to a plan for wholesale incendiarism and as the greatest creditor in the city would hardly wish to massacre a senate in which a vast number of the members owed him large sums of money but cicero himself furnishes us with much evidence for doubting his own narrative if catiline was such a notorious villain it is odd that the orator should have proposed to run with him as a joint candidate for the consulship and have offered to defend him when he was going to be indicted for extortion in his late province of africa still stranger are cicero's statements in the Procylio, where defending a friend of the conspirator he remarks that he was always meeting catiline in the best society i thought him a good citizen and esteemed him for the many eminent virtues which he seemed to possess if it was possible for cicero to make such allegations with any show of good faith it is clear that catiline cannot have been the social pariah who was described in the orator's speeches of b c sixty three evidently the fluent consul thinking his own neck in danger had painted his foe and all concerned with him in very lurid colours end of section fourteen
Section 15 of Seven Roman Statesmen of the Later Republic by Charles Oman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 6 Crassus, Part 3. It is impossible, on the other hand, to believe with Professor Beasley that Catiline was a respectable politician and the avowed head of the Democratic Party at Rome during the years 65 to 63 BC if he had been beyond reproach sallust and other historians of the caesarian faction would have taken the opportunity to represent him as a martyr to the jealousy of the optimates and a victim of cicero's spiteful tongue since they did not dare to take this line and reproduce the orator's account of him almost verbatim we are driven to conclude that the insurgent chief was really a man of doubtful character and reckless designs but at the same time we are forced to believe from Cicero's own evidence already quoted that he had not such a notoriously bad reputation as to make it impossible to use him as an associate or a tool in political schemes. If we look upon him as no more than an unscrupulous demagogue of the same type as Saturninus or Clodius, that is, as a desperate brawler and mob leader rather than an anarchist, it does not seem so unlikely that Crassus and Caesar may have had relations with him during the years of his activity. If their plan was to have a bold and reckless democratic consul, a man who would not shrink from using violence when the crisis came, in power when Pompey should return from the east, we can well understand that they may have taken Catiline into their pay. He and they, in short, may well have been aiming at a coup d'etat, though it is most improbable that they intended either to massacre the whole senate or to set the city on fire these accusations are the embroidery with which cicero adorned his orations when he wished to enlist all the men of material interests on the side of the optimates not only did he succeed at the moment for even the equites were seen with swords in their hands offering to kill caesar but he has left for all ages a stain on the name of catiline which is probably one or two shades deeper than that very unscrupulous politician really deserved. The story of the Catalinarian plots, as we now have it, is too fragmentary and too obscure to bear complete unraveling. The version of the first plot, in which Caesar and Catiline are said to have assembled a mob of assassins in order to murder the consuls of B.C. 65, Torquatus and Cotta, and then to have failed to give the signal for the onset is most unconvincing. Concerning the conspiracy of B.C. 63, we have more details, but they are very contradictory. On the one hand, we know that there was a widespread rumor that Catiline was acting under the orders of Crassus. Sallust, no unfriendly witness, allows that a great part of the Senate suspected the great millionaire of being implicated in the plot. On the other hand, it is certain that Crassus volunteered some information to Cicero concerning the designs of the insurgents, though that information was tardy and practically useless. He is said to have come in a melodramatic manner late at night and muffled in a cloak and to have placed in the hands of Cicero an anonymous letter which had been delivered to him, warning him to be out of Rome on the day of the preconcerted outbreak. If this midnight visit really occurred, it is probable that Crassus was merely hedging, that he told Cicero what he considered would be enough to protect him from a charge of complicity if the plot should fail, but not enough to do Catiline and his colleagues any harm if they were going to succeed. One thing is clear, that Cicero did not consider it prudent to assail Crassus and remain deaf to all the suggestions made to him with that object. Another public man, when incited to fall upon the millionaire, once answered with the proverb, Fainum habit in cornu, meaning that Crassus was too dangerous a sort of game for a hunter of his caliber to meddle with. Footnote. The Romans used to tie a wisp of straw to the horns of a dangerous bull to warn the passerby against him. End footnote. And so the consul of B.C. 63, with his usual prudence, refrained from accusing of high treason a man who could pull so many political strings and had at his disposal such a command of money and influence. When the informer Tarquinius, in his examination before the Senate, began to give evidence incriminating Crassus, 
a curious scene occurred. Dozens of senators who owed Crassus money began to shout false witness with all the power of their lungs. Then Cicero, after glancing round the house and pondering on the situation, took the easiest way out of the position by remanding Tarquinius to prison without permitting him to go on with his story. The charge was not allowed to be repeated, yet Salus tells us that Crassus was so far from being grateful to Cicero that he ever afterwards regarded him as an enemy. Apparently he thought that the orator had been feeling the pulse of the Senate by producing such evidence and had only drawn back from an open attack because he saw that he would not get the full support of his party if he persisted. However much or however little Crassus had been implicated in the Catalinarian plot, this much is certain, that many people thought that he had known more about the business than he should, and that an additional stain was added in consequence to his already not unsmirched reputation. We are told that in the end of B.C. 63 he seriously thought of leaving Rome to preserve his personal safety, and provided ships to carry himself and his family and his treasure out of Italy. The reason why he did not actually depart was the unforeseen delay in the return of Pompey from the east. The conqueror of Mithridates had finished his military work in B.C. 63 by the conquest of Syria. He was expected back early in 62, just when Cicero's consulship had expired, and while the embers of the Catalinarian conspiracy were still smoldering after the main conflagration had been quenched. If he had presented himself at this moment, he would have found the democratic leaders in the deepest discredit and dismay, and foiled in all their plans to raise up a power in Italy that should be able to oppose him. But Pompey chose to linger in the east for the whole summer of B.C. 62, pacifying and portioning out provinces, and conciliating allied princes and founding new cities. He showed no signs of coming home, and merely sent ahead his foolish and talkative partisan, Metellus Nepos, the man whose pranks gave Cicero so much trouble. It will be remembered that his demands were so unreasonable, and at the same time so vague, that Cicero and the Optimates ventured to oppose them, and Crassus had time to recover from his panic and to reconsider his situation. There can be no doubt that the follies of Metellus, who certainly exceeded the commission that had been given him, did his employer much harm and lessened his popularity. Yet when in the autumn of B.C. 62 Pompey at last announced that he was returning to Italy with his army at his back, both Democrats and Optimates were seriously alarmed. Externally his position was so much like that of Sulla in 82 that both parties had a suspicion that he would be tempted to repeat Sulla's role. Neither Crassus and Caesar on the one side, nor Catullus and Cato on the other, felt their heads quite safe upon their shoulders, for each party knew that they had been intriguing against the great general in his absence, and supposed that he might resent their action in a very drastic fashion. Nothing of the kind happened. With rare civic virtue, Pompey dismissed his army and returned as a private person to Rome, expecting to receive from his fellow citizens the praise and gratitude that he had so well earned. Instead, he found the Optimates captious and critical, and the Democrats far more concerned in the Catalinarian conspiracy and its results than in the newly accomplished conquest of the East. His simple and moderate requests the confirmation of his administrative work in Asia, and the provision of the rewards due to his victorious soldiery, were refused him. When he put forward his friend, the tribune Flavius, to pass a plebiscitum for the grant of lands to the army of the East, it was defeated by the unexpected and immoral combination of the Optimates and the Populares. The great object of Crassus at this time was to prevent at all costs, the conclusion of an alliance between Pompey and the Senate, lest the combination of the two should reduce himself and his party to entire impotence. How he did it we learn from Cicero's letters. When Pompey first returned to the city, it would have been quite natural that he and the orator should have agreed to work together. They had been old friends and allies in earlier days. Their political views were not dissimilar, and if Cicero was now the most moderate of optimates, 
Pompey was certainly the least democratic of Democrats. If the orator could have persuaded his friends to treat the great general with courtesy and ordinary consideration, and to grant his very reasonable demands, it is probable that matters would have settled down without any further trouble. But Cicero was still swelling over with pride at his successes in B.C. 63, and now thought of himself quite as great a man as Pompey. His idea was to meet the proconsul with the phrase, if you have saved the republic abroad, I have saved it at home. In his vanity, he imagined that the crushing of Catiline's handful of desperados was quite as great an achievement as the conquest of the East. He was ready to assume an almost patronizing attitude to his old chief. The wily Crassus resolved to estrange the two by tempting Cicero into a display of foolish pride which should disgust Pompey. He carried out his shameless plan at the first appearance of the great general to take his seat in the Senate. The occasion ought to have been utilized to welcome and compliment Pompey according to his deserts. But when the proceedings had been commenced, Crassus rose and began a fulsome and interminable harangue in praise of Cicero's consulship. Not only was the subject matter stale, for Catiline had been put down a whole year before, but Crassus was the last man who should have launched out on such topics. He was known to have resented bitterly all that the orator had done and to be his secret enemy. However, he began to declaim to the effect that the preservation of his own life and liberty, his name and his fatherland, his wife and children, had all been the work of Cicero, that Rome had been saved from fire and sword was due to this great man alone, and so forth. Cicero fell into the trap with the greatest simplicity. Instead of suspecting all compliments from this most doubtful source, he arose to continue the debate in his own self-laudation, the opportunity for conciliating Pompey by turning the discussion on his great deeds in the East and paying him his due meed of praise quite escaped him. Instead, he proceeded to sound his own trumpet in the most autolatrous fashion, Writing to Atticus in complete unconsciousness of his own folly, he says that now was the time for my well-turned periods, my flowers of rhetoric, my antithesis and figures. You know my wonted thunders. This day they were so loud that I think that you must have heard them, even where you are in Epirus. So having spoken at length of his own great doings, of the majesty of the Senate, the wickedness of the late conspiracy, and all his usual topics, he sat down, leaving Pompey unblessed. The general was not pleased. Intellexi hominem moeri, says Cicero, who had the best chance of knowing, for he was sitting next to him. He took the speech as a formal declaration that Cicero and his friends did not think much of his exertions in the East, and he was not far wrong. Thus it came to pass that the shameless harangue of Crassus and the idiotic vanity of Cicero, which made him gorge the bait so greedily, began to destroy the chance that Pompey might enter into an alliance with the Optimate party and become a defender of the Constitution. His anger came to a head when, at the instigation of his old enemy and rival Lucullus, the Senate passed a decree that an elaborate inquiry should be made into all his doings in Asia before they were ratified. If anything was wanting to complete his discontent, it was the way in which his army was treated. The excuse made for denying its reward was that the treasury was empty, a manifest lie, for the enormous sums which had been paid in from his Asiatic spoils were still unexpended. So the man who might, if he had been unscrupulous, have become tyrant of Rome, found himself flouted and said it not, merely because he had behaved like a good citizen, and refrained from taking by violence that which was his due. He might have asked for anything that he liked while his army was still undisbanded. When he had dispersed it, Cicero's stupid friends refused to listen to his pleas and left him shamed before the eyes of his veterans. While he stood involved in this bitter disappointment, Pompey received the offer which changed the whole face of affairs. Crassus and Caesar and the whole Democratic Party were still under a cloud, with a strong suspicion of complicity in the Catilinarian plot hanging about them. 
it would mean everything to them if pompey his respectability and his veterans were placed on their side accordingly they offered him their assistance to secure the ratification of his asiatic treaties and the grant of land for his legionaries if he would join them against the senate it must have been a bitter moment for him when he was told that his desires might be gained at the price of a second alliance with his old enemy crassus the man who had intrigued against him with such malevolent persistence all through the last ten years but rather than break his word to his soldiers whose interests he had promised to protect and rather than endure more bullying from the senate he accepted the offer the famous first triumvirate was formed pompey contributed his great name his respectability and the potential aid of forty thousand veterans crassus his inexhaustible money-bags and his power of intrigue caesar his unrivalled talent for mob management and his cool and level brain at the moment most men thought him little more than the agent and tool of the two elder triumvirs the revelation of his greatness was yet to come when the triumvirate had been formed and in spite of the opposition of cato and a few more irreconcilables had shown that it could sweep the streets and clear the forum it remained to be seen how the victorious three would use their power the first thing that strikes the observer is that while pompey got something out of his bargain and caesar a great deal we can hardly trace any positive and tangible gain received by crassus from his alliance with his old enemy pompey got his asiatic doings confirmed he was also enabled to give his veterans the land that he had promised them caesar obtained his consulship passed all the laws that he chose to bring forward and had the pleasure which to a man with his sense of humour might have been considerable of seeing his colleague bibulus shut up in his mansion and inspecting the heavens day by day without any effect moreover at the end of his year of office caesar received the all-important provinces of cisalpine and transalpine gaul the district from which legions could best overawe rome and all italy but crassus got neither consulship nor province neither land nor ratified treaties it is true that his position in politics was re-established the slur that had been left upon him after the catilinarian business was removed and he could feel that he had pulled the strings of the whole intrigue but of more definite profit we see nothing the only satisfactory explanation of this curious fact is to remember that crassus all through his career seems to have desired power as an end in itself rather than as a means to other objects he was to use a modern phrase a man without a program he wanted to pull the wires of politics rather than to carry out some definite policy when he had collected all the wires in his hand if we seek a modern parallel for him we may think of that wonderful old whig the duke of newcastle who allied himself with the elder pitt on the terms that the latter should manage the whole imperial policy of britain while he himself should be permitted to conduct the parliamentary jobbery and intrigue in short when the opportunity came to him crassus had no particular set of measures that he wished to advocate he was neither a true democrat nor a true oligarch he had become the leader of the populares not because he had popular sympathies but because he wanted at all costs to be the leader of some party so the weakness of his position was that having achieved his wish to obtain a share of supreme power he had little that was definite to ask for he merely wanted to be able to assert himself when he chose to have his share in portioning out consulships and praetorships to make money when and how he chose and to use it by keeping dozens of minor political persons in dependence on him hence it is that in the doings of the triumvirs during their day of power it is hard to point out very much that can be ascribed to the personal initiative of crassus his main aim was to keep in check his ally pompey whom he hated no less than of old that thereby he was helping a much more able man caesar on the road to supreme power he certainly did not realize we may make a shrewd guess also that it was crassus who really set upon cicero and drove him into exile clodius being merely his tool and not the originator of the orator's woes we know from sallust and plutarch how bitter was the enmity that crassus bore to the consul of b c sixty three despite the flattery which he lavished on him when he was set on estranging him from pompey 
it was probable that the banishment of cicero was his underhand revenge for seeing his old schemes frustrated for both in the rejection of the law of rulus and in the suppression of catiline the orator had been the main cause of his defeat on the other hand it is hard to see that clodius had really any adequate cause for the malignant persecution to which he subjected cicero the usual tale that he had been angered by the way in which his ingenious alibi had been disproved while he was being tried for the violation of the mysteries of the bonadia does not seem to give a sufficient reason for his vindictive attacks on cicero if we imagine that he was spurred on by crassus the causes of whose enmity are so much more obvious the matter becomes far more intelligible if the triumvir simply delivered the blow at second hand it is quite in keeping with what we read concerning his feelings at the time plutarch tells us that he had conceived such a mortal hatred for the orator that he would have shown it by some act of personal violence had he not been dissuaded by his son publius who chanced to be an old pupil and an admirer of cicero crassus was certainly closely connected with clodius whose acquittal at his trial for the violation of the mysteries he had secured by his lavish bribery he was the only one of the triumvirs who did not try to save cicero from the worst extreme of exile by pressing on him an honourable excuse for absence from rome in the shape of a legateship or a free commission to travel that the orator himself suspected him of being at the bottom of his troubles may be judged from the fact that when writing from thessalonica during his banishment and estimating his chances of return he speaks of pompey as certain to be favourable crassus tamen metuo he had a fear that crassus might not prove so accommodating however having learnt the lesson that it was not wise to cross the triumvirs cicero was ultimately allowed to return and soon after was formally reconciled to the millionaire by means of the young publius his faithful friend End of section fifteen section sixteen of seven roman statesmen of the later republic by charles oman this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami chapter six crassus part four we have on the whole extraordinarily little recorded of the doings of crassus between b c fifty nine and b c fifty six a time when he ought to have been able to ask and obtain whatever he chose from his colleagues he had his share no doubt in the management of affairs by the triumvirs in that rather chaotic time when to the outward eye clodius rather than any one else seemed to be the real ruler of rome but apparently he was as usual more set on checking pompey than on anything else it is only in b c fifty six that he again comes to the front by that time he had at last learnt from the study of caesar's doings in gaul that any man who aspired to take his share in dominating roman politics must have an army at his back hence it was that at the conference of lucca he claimed not only the consulship for b c fifty five but the command of the army of the east he too must raise his legions win his victories and be in a position to meet caesar and pompey on equal terms if troubles should ever again break out those superficial writers who think that he chose the rich eastern provinces out of mere greed and avarice are clearly wrong all through his life money-making was to him the means and not the end what he really wanted to secure was a loyal army not a few more millions to add to his hordes that military glory had turned his brain and that he desired to emulate alexander the great and to penetrate to the bactrians the indians and the erythrian sea so that in his hopes he swallowed up the whole east we cannot readily believe clearly he wished to win a strong military position such as could be secured by great conquests beyond the euphrates but it was needed mainly to help him sway the balance between caesar and pompey in the domestic affairs of rome nevertheless when he had once been granted his desire and placed in command of an army his spirit seemed to have risen 
his mind hark back to his old campaigns of eighty two and seventy one b c and he appears to have cast from him the memories of twenty years of finance and intrigue and to have tried to become once more the enterprising soldier that he had been in sulla's day he showed a buoyancy of spirit that surprised every one indulging in vain boasts most inconsistent with his wonted demeanour and most unsuitable to his age and disposition for in general he was far from being either self-assertive or conceited but now he said he would make the expedition of Lucullus against Tigranes and that of Pompey against Mithridates appear mere child's play. Yet he now counted sixty years and looked even older than he really was. The renewal of the triumvirate had so cowed the optimate party that even Cato had to give up his attempt to struggle against the omnipotent three. It is therefore all the more curious to find that one man set himself to oppose Crassus's designs, and that, from mere personal enmity this abnormal personage was the tribune gaius ateus capito one of those strange characters who move for an instant across the political stage and are then lost in obscurity he ventured to place a veto on the levying of legions for crassus it was quietly disregarded then he announced awful hindrances of portents and prodigies which were also met with derision rather than attention indeed he was fined by the censor appius for fabricating false omens but he reserved his great coup for the day on which crassus passed out of the gates to take command of his army after one final and futile attempt to interpose his tribunicial veto he took refuge in strange incantations he placed a censor at the gate we are told and threw incense upon it uttering the most horrid imprecations and invoking strange and dreadful deities the Romans say that these mysterious and ancient curses have such power that the man against whom they are directed never escapes ill luck. Nay, more, they add that the person who uses them is sure to bring misfortune on himself, too. Undaunted by these antiquated rites, and regardless of two or three other evil presages which Plutarch has carefully collected, Crassus set forth from Italy and arrived safely in Syria where he found himself at the head of an army of seven legions his first act on taking charge of his province was to plunder ruthlessly the temples of hierapolis emessa and jerusalem and to scrape together all the money that could be raised by taxation but he was no doubt set on filling his military chest for a war that was certain to prove long and costly rather than on gratifying the talent for extortion that was such a marked characteristic of all his life his first strategical move was to bridge the Euphrates and to establish a new base for himself in the Greek cities of Mesopotamia. This was easily accomplished, but his second advance was a much more serious matter. He had now to prove whether his old martial reputation, won in wars against Carbo and Pontius and Spartacus, had been fairly earned. Quite unconsciously, Crassus was going forth to solve a new and difficult military problem unlike caesar in gaul he had not to deal with an old enemy whose strength and tactics were well known the romans had met and defeated many an asiatic army during the last century but the parthians were not like the other inhabitants of the hellenized east whom scipio or sulla or pompey had so easily subdued their hosts did not consist of clumsy imitation of the macedonian phalanx but of masses of horse bowmen some were the lightest of light cavalry others bore helm and lance and breastplate as well as the national bow of infantry the parthians had none save levies raised among their subject races for operations in mountainous regions when the fight was to be in the plains they did not take a single foot soldier with them of all the regions of the border mesopotamia into which crassus was now advancing was most suitable for the tactics of the enemy the battles would be fought among rolling sandy downs destitute of trees and crossed by rivers at very unfrequent intervals confident in his seven legions and his four thousand horse the triumvir marched out from Cari and entered the desolate lands that lay between his base and the parthian capital 
he had resolved to take the shortest route to Seleucia, in spite of the advice of the Armenian allies, who had endeavoured to induce him to draw near to the Tigris and the Assyrian mountains, instead of plunging into the Mesopotamian sands, where the Parthians could use their horsemen to the best advantage. Tradition tells us that he had been influenced in his resolve by the treacherous advice of an Arab sheikh named Ariamnis, or Abgaris, who had told him that speed was the essential thing in his advance, for as he alleged, the Parthian king was not intending to fight so near the Roman frontier, and was sending his treasures eastward, and preparing to evacuate Seleucia, without any serious attempt to make a stand. If Crassus was gulled by these stories, he was soon undeceived, for on the second day of his march, his vedettes were driven in by the Parthian horse, and reported that the vizier Serena was close at hand with a mighty host. Eager to engage, the triumvir pressed on to meet the enemy, in full expectation of a victory that should eclipse all that Pompey had ever accomplished in the east. At first he drew up his men on a very long front, the legions deployed in line with the cavalry in equal halves at each end of the array but presently it struck him that this formation did not sufficiently cover his enormous baggage train, which was trailing along for many miles to the rear. Accordingly, he changed his order to a great hollow square, and placed all his impedimenta in the centre. This would have been an excellent battle formation had he been about to contend with an enemy who deployed shock tactics and intended to charge in upon the legions, but against horse archers it was a mistake. It gave them a target which it would be impossible to miss, and at the same time made it hard for the Romans to charge without breaking their order of battle. The square is an essentially defensive formation, and useless against a light and evasive foe that has no wish to close. When the Parthians appeared, at first in comparatively small numbers, but afterwards in huge hordes that seemed to cover the whole horizon. Crassus, in the usual Roman style, sent out his light troops to skirmish, but his slingers and archers were but a few thousand strong. After a short combat they were flung back upon the legions with heavy loss, absolutely overwhelmed by the concentric arrow shower which was poured in upon them. The pursuing enemy then began to ride close up to the great square, and to take easy shots into the mass. They kept at a discreet distance, some two hundred yards or so, and the legionnaires were helpless against them, for the pilum had but a short range, and could not reach the horsemen. Nor was it any use to advance, for the enemy slowly retired, keeping always at the same distance from the legions, and continuing to pour in his long, deadly shafts, which nailed the shield to the arm that bore it, and the helmet to the head. Crassus now began to see the difficulties of the situation. Since it was impossible to contend with missile weapons against the Parthians, it was necessary to close at all costs. Accordingly, he gave his son Publius charge of thirteen hundred cavalry, all Gallic veterans fresh from Caesar's wars, fifteen hundred archers, and eight picked cohorts of infantry, and bade him sally out from the square and charge desperately into the enclosing ring of bowmen. Before this sudden onset, the Parthians gave way, retiring at full speed, leaving a moment's respite to the harassed legions. Young Crassus pursued them fiercely, his infantry pushing forward so rapidly that it almost kept pace with the horsemen. Apparently the young commander allowed himself to be carried away by the ardor of the charge, and entertained a vain hope of catching up the enemy, for he chased them for five or six miles, till he had got quite out of touch with his father's legions. Then he suddenly found himself face to face with the solid supports of the elusive horse bowmen, heavy squadrons of mailed lancers, who met him in orderly array and offered battle. At the same moment the fugitives, whom he had been chasing, halted, and began to ply their bows from the flanks. Although his troops were much disordered by their long and reckless ride, Publius charged straight at the centre of the enemy. A furious melee followed, but the Romans were hopelessly outnumbered, and after a most gallant defence the whole detachment, horse and foot, was exterminated. 
the triumvir advancing slowly in his son's track was horrified to meet the parthians returning with shouts of triumph and displaying the heads of publius and the other fallen officers fixed on their pikes but with a resolution which shows that the old roman spirit was not dead in him he addressed his men crying that the loss of his son was his own private concern and that the main army was intact and might yet retrieve the day and avenge their fallen comrades no campaign could be carried to a successful end without some casualties it was not by her good fortune but by her perseverance and fortitude in adversity that rome had risen to be the mistress of the world these words were not enough to stir the weary soldiery who had thoroughly lost heart and were already cursing the general who had led them into this snare in the desert it was his ignorance and presumption they complained which were the causes of their present desperate condition they held out sullenly till dusk came but when the fall of night compelled the parthians to withdraw the whole army officers and soldiers alike demanded to be led back to the euphrates a deputation went to seek for the proconsul who was found stretched on the ground with his head wrapped in his cloak mourning for his son since he seemed sunk in a dull apathy and refused to issue any orders the quaestor for crassus took it upon himself to bid the army decamp under cover of the night and make a forced march for Cari the baggage and four thousand wounded were left to the mercy of the enemy a night retreat is always fatal to troops who have lost their nerve and the romans dropping with fatigue and wearied by twelve hours spent under arms had no longer the power to move rapidly or to keep their distances when day broke they were found straggling across the plains in half a dozen disjointed columns each of which had to shift for itself the parthians came up a few hours later and beset the retreating army some of the more belated corps and multitudes of the stragglers were cut up but the main body reached cari in the afternoon next night crassus again commenced to retreat for his troops were so demoralized that he felt sure that it was hopeless to make any stand east of the euphrates the second day of flight was as disastrous as the first the troops lost all touch with each other and the greater part of the horse leaving the infantry in the lurch never drew rein till they had saved themselves in the mountains crassus himself with only four cohorts in his company was worried all day by a swarm of horse bowmen who succeeded in intercepting his way to the hills and finally compelled him to halt and stand at bay on an isolated eminence just outside the limit of safety then followed a miserable scene of treachery the parthian vizier came up and seeing that it would be hard to storm the hill proposed a conference holding out prospects of granting a peace on condition that crassus should order the evacuation of the mesopotamian cities and retire beyond the euphrates the soldiery hailed with joy a proposal that promised a relief from their present desperate condition but the triumvir himself was not deluded and warned all those about him that the only safe course was to hold out till night and then make a dash for the hills through the lines of the enemy his exhortations produced little effect and seeing that his men were utterly demoralized and unwilling to fight any longer he consented to go down and treat it is said that he took his officers to witness that he went to his death with his eyes open but that for the credit of rome it would be better to say that the general was deceived by the enemy rather than that he had been abandoned by his own men the sequel was exactly like the scene at kabul in eighteen forty one when the unfortunate macnaughton went down to treat with akbar khan crassus and his escort were received at first with ostentatious respect and a conference was begun presently a feigned scuffle was got up and hands were laid upon the proconsul whereupon one of his legates drew his sword this acted as the necessary signal for open violence and serena's attendants fell upon the romans and dispatched them every one crassus's head was cut off and sent to seleucia to be laid before the great king every one has read of the scene that followed the arrival of the ghastly trophy a scene that illustrates accurately enough the curious admixture of savagery and civilization at the court of the arsacidae 
King Herodes was witnessing the Bacchae of Euripides, wherein King Pentheus is torn to pieces by the frantic Theban women. The actor who was playing Agave seized the head of Crassus and used it instead of the mask that represented the head of Pentheus in the wild dance at the end of the play. Herodes was charmed with the idea and presented the tragedian with a talent of silver. We must not blame Crassus too much for the disaster of Cari. Probably any other Roman general of the day, with the possible exception of Caesar, would have suffered a defeat under the same circumstances. For the Parthian method of war was utterly unknown to the Romans, and the legion, a splendid weapon against any other foe, was useless here. In later campaigns, profiting by Crassus's experience, the generals of the West never attempted to attack the Parthian in the open with an army of the old Roman type. They took into the field large bodies of cavalry and tens of thousands of foot archers. These last proved especially successful against the troops of the Arsacidae, for the Parthian bow, having to be used on horseback, was necessarily short and was outranged by that of the foot soldier. Hence the Orientals had the choice between being overmatched in archery and being forced to charge home. In both cases they usually fared ill when engaging with the Romans. There never was a second Cari, but it is hard to see how the first could have been avoided. It was a strange and inappropriate end to the life of Crassus that he should go down to history with his name attached to an error in military tactics rather than to some political or financial fiasco. But a certain inevitable futility attached to all that he undertook. He wanted power, and thrice in his life the power was placed within his hand. But when he had it, he could not use it, for he was equally destitute of an ideal and of a program. Even if Pompey had not always been at his side to check his ambition, we see that he would never have achieved anything great. The story of his career shows just how much and how little mere wealth, ambition, and industry without genius, an inspiring personality, or an honest enthusiasm could accomplish in Roman politics. End of section 16